section one of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg storm and shipwreck the count of monte cristo with the beautiful heyday clinging lovingly about his neck her head pillowed upon his shoulder stood on the deck of his superb yacht the alcyon gazing at the fast vanishing isle where he had left maximilian morel and valentine de villefort it was just daybreak but by the faint glimmering light he could plainly distinguish the figures of a man and a woman upon the distant beach they were walking arm in arm presently another figure a man's approached them and seemed to deliver something look said the count to heyday jacopo has given maximilian my letter and he reads it to valentine and now they know all jacopo points toward the yacht they see us and are waving their handkerchiefs in token of adieu heyday raised her head and glanced in the direction of the isle of monte cristo i see them my lord she replied in a joyous tone they are happy yes said the count they are happy but they deserve their happiness and all is well they owe their happiness to you my lord resumed heyday meekly they owe it to god answered monte cristo solemnly i was but his humble instrument and he has allowed me in this to make some slight atonement for the wrong i committed in taking vengeance into my own mortal hands heyday was silent she knew the sad history of edmond dantes and was aware of how remorselessly the count of monte cristo had avenged the wrongs of the humble sailor of marseilles this she had learned from her lord's own lips within the past few days the strict seclusion in which she had lived in paris had necessarily excluded her from all personal knowledge of the count's subtle war upon his enemies true she had emerged from her retirement to testify against morcerf at his trial before the house of peers but at that time she was ignorant of the fact that by causing the foe of her family to be convicted of felony treason and outrage she had simply promoted monte cristo's vengeance on fernand the catalan but though silent the beautiful greek girl with her thoroughly oriental ideas could not realize that the man who stood beside her the being she almost worshipped had been guilty of the least wrong in avenging himself besides she would never have admitted even in the most secret recesses of her own heart that monte cristo who to her mind symbolized all that was good pure and heroic in human nature could have been wrong in anything he did meanwhile the count also had been silent and a shade of the deepest sadness had settled upon his pallid but intellectual visage he gazed at the isle of monte cristo until it became a mere dot in the distance then putting his arm tenderly about his lovely companion's waist he drew her gently toward the cabin as they vanished down the companionway bertuccio and the captain of the alcyon followed by ali the nubian advanced to the prow of the yacht captain said bertuccio can you tell me whither we are bound i feel an irresistible desire to know yes answered the captain i can tell you the count ordered me to make with all possible speed for the island of crete bertuccio gave a sigh of relief i feared we were bound for italy he said but he added after an instant's thought why should we go to rome luigi vampa is amply able to care for all the count's interests there if indeed any remain now that the baron danglars has been attended to the captain who was an old italian smuggler placed his finger warningly upon his lips and glanced warily around when luigi vampa's name was mentioned but said nothing bertuccio took the hint and the conversation was dropped pressing onward under full sail the magnificent yacht shot over the blue waters of the mediterranean 
with the speed of an eagle on the wing it sped past corsica and sardinia and soon the arid uninviting shores of tunis were visible then it passed between sicily and malta steering directly toward the island of crete up to this time the weather had been of the most delightful description not a cloud had obscured the sky and during the entire voyage the unruffled surface of the mediterranean had resembled that of some peaceful lake it was now the tenth of october and just cool enough to be pleasant the spice-laden breezes from the coast of africa reached the yacht tempered by the moist atmosphere of the sea furnishing an additional element of enjoyment the count of monte cristo and haydee who seemed inseparable came on deck every morning at dawn and each evening walked back and forth admiring the gorgeous sunset and watching the shades of night as they gradually settled down upon the wide expanse of the waters it required no unusual penetration to see that they were lovers and that their delight in each other's society was unalloyed haydee clung to the count who with his arm wound about her slender waist looked down into the liquid depths of her eyes with a smile of perfect content while his free hand ever and anon toyed with her night-black tresses one evening as they were walking thus it was the evening of the fifteenth of october and crete was distant but two days sail monte cristo tenderly took haydee's hand in his and said to her in a tone of ineffable softness haydee do you remember what you said to me on the isle of monte cristo just before we parted from valentine and maximilian oh yes my lord was the low reply i said i loved you as one loves a father brother husband i loved you as my life and do you now regret those words regret them oh my lord how could i do that i ask you said the count slowly because we are nearing our destination in two days we shall land upon the shore of crete and once there it is my intention to make you my wife provided your feelings toward me are still unchanged marriage my child is the most important step in life and i do not wish you to take that step without fully understanding the promptings of your own dear heart only misery can follow the union of two souls not in perfect accord not entirely devoted the one to the other i am much older than you haydee and my sufferings have aged me still more than years i am a sad and weary man you on the contrary stand just upon the threshold of existence the world and its pleasures are all before you think my child think deeply before you pronounce the irrevocable vow haydee threw herself passionately upon monte cristo's breast my lord she cried in accents broken by extreme agitation and emotion am i not your slave no haydee answered the count his bosom heaving and his eyes lighting up with a strange flash you are free your fate rests in your own hands then said the young girl ardently i will decide it this very instant i accept my freedom that i may voluntarily offer myself to you my love my husband you have suffered granted so have i your sufferings have aged you mine have transformed a child into a woman a woman who knows the promptings of her heart who knows that it beats for you and you alone in all the world my lord i resign myself to you do you accept the gift as haydee concluded her beautiful eyes were suffused with tears and her whole frame quivered with intense excitement monte cristo bent down and kissed her upon the forehead haydee my own haydee he said with a slight tremor in his manly voice i accept the gift be my wife the wife of monte cristo and no effort of mine shall be wanting to assure your happiness at that moment there was a sinister flash in the heavens that were as yet without a cloud the livid light shot downward to the water and seemingly plunged to the depths of the mediterranean the count gave a start and drew his beloved haydee closer to him the frightened girl trembled from head to foot and clung to him for protection 
oh my lord my lord she murmured does heaven disapprove of our plighted troth calm yourself heyday answered monte cristo the lightning is god's seal and he has set it upon our betrothal the flash was now repeated and was succeeded by several others of increased intensity but as yet no thunder rolled and there was not the slightest indication of an approaching storm monte cristo took heyday's hand and led her to the side of the yacht not a single wave wrinkled the surface of the sea for miles and miles the water seemed asleep while down upon it the moon poured a flood of silvery radiance the stars too were beaming brightly still however the intense lightning shot athwart the placid sky it had become almost incessant monte cristo could not account for the bewildering phenomenon he summoned the captain of the alcyon and said to him giacomo you have sailed the mediterranean all your life have you not all my life excellency replied he touching his cap have you ever before seen lightning such as this on a calm night never excellency it certainly cannot be heat lightning i think not excellency heat lightning has a quicker flash and is much less intense what do you suppose it portends i can form no idea excellency oh my lord said heyday a terrible storm is coming i am sure i feel a premonition of approaching danger i pray you guard against it nonsense my child returned monte cristo with a laugh that in spite of all his efforts at self-control betrayed nervous agitation and an undefinable dread the sky is clear the moon is shining brilliantly and the sea is altogether tranquil if a storm were coming it would not be so banish your fears and reassure yourself the lightning is but a freak of nature the captain too was disturbed though he could give himself no satisfactory reason for his uneasiness ali with the characteristic superstition of the nubian race had prostrated himself upon the deck and was making signs the moslems of his country used to drive away malignant spirits the night however passed without accident though the singular lightning continued for several hours next morning the sun rose encircled by a ruddy band fringed on the outer rim with a faint yellow while its beams had a sullen glare instead of their normal brilliancy the lightning of the previous night was absent but soon another and not less disquieting phenomenon manifested itself as far as the eye could reach the sea seemed boiling and at intervals a puff as if of vapour would filter through the waves rising and disappearing in the heavens meanwhile the wind had fallen and amid an almost dead calm the sails of the alcyon hung listlessly with only an occasional flapping the yacht moved forward indeed but so slowly that it scarcely appeared to move at all monte cristo and heyday came on deck at dawn but the young girl displayed such terror at the unwonted aspect of the sun and the sea that the count speedily persuaded her to return with him to the cabin there she cowered upon a divan hiding her face in her hands and moaning piteously her fiance distressed at her condition endeavoured to soothe and comfort her but utterly without avail her fears could neither be banished nor allayed at length he threw himself on a rug at her feet and disengaging her hands from her face drew them about his neck heyday clasped him frantically and clung to him as if she deemed that embrace a final one as they were sitting thus the alcyon received a sudden and violent shock that shook the noble yacht from stem to stern instantly there was a sound of hurrying feet on deck and the captain could be heard shouting hoarsely to the sailors monte cristo leaped up and caught heyday in his arms at that moment ali darted down the companionway and stood trembling before his master what was that shock demanded the count hurriedly the agitated nubian made a sign signifying he did not know but that all was yet safe remain with your mistress ali said monte cristo i am going to see what is the matter 
oh no no cried haydée imploringly as the count placed her again on the divan and was moving away oh no no do not leave me my lord or i shall die ashy pale haydée rose from the divan and cast herself on her knees at monte cristo's feet swear to me at least that you will not needlessly expose yourself to danger uttered in a pleading tone i swear it answered the count ali will faithfully guard you while i am gone he added and ere you can realize my absence i shall be again at your side with these words he tore himself away and hastened to the deck there a scene met his eye as unexpected as it was appalling the entire surface of the mediterranean was aglow with phosphorescence and the sun was veiled completely by a heavy cloud that seemed to cover the whole expanse of the sky this cloud was not black but of a bloody hue and the atmosphere was so densely charged with sulphur that it was almost impossible to breathe the sea was boiling more furiously than ever and the puffs of vapour that had before only occasionally filtered through the waves now leaped up incessantly each puff attended with a slight explosion the vapour was greyish when it first arose from the water but as it ascended it became red mingling at length with the bloody cloud that each moment acquired greater density the wind blew fitfully sometimes amounting to a gale and then utterly vanishing without the slightest warning soon the bloody cloud seemed to settle of its own weight upon the sea growing so thick that the eye could not penetrate it and a few feet from the yacht all was inky darkness monte cristo hurried to the captain who was endeavouring to quiet the superstitious fears of the sailors drawing him aside he said in a low tone giacomo we are in frightful danger this elemental disturbance is volcanic and how it will end cannot be foretold no doubt an earthquake is devastating the nearest land or will do so before many hours have elapsed at any moment rocks or islands may arise from the sea and obstruct our passage all we can do is to hold ourselves in readiness for whatever calamity may happen and make for crete as rapidly as possible with the hope of eventually getting beyond the volcanic zone do not enlighten the crew as to the cause of the disturbance did they know or even suspect it they could not be controlled but would become either stupefied or reckless try to convince them that we are simply in the midst of a severe electrical storm that will speedily exhaust its fury and subside now to work and remember that everything depends upon your courage and resolution giacomo rejoined the sailors who were huddled together at the stern of the yacht like so many frightened sheep he spoke to them doing his utmost to reassure them and ultimately succeeded so well that they resumed their neglected duties with some show of alacrity and even cheerfulness meanwhile monte cristo with folded arms and an outward show of calmness was pacing the deck as if nothing unusual were in progress and his demeanour was not without its effect on the sailors who looked upon him with a species of awe and admiration at times he went below to cheer the drooping spirits of his beloved heyday but speedily returned that the influence of his presence might not be lost thus the day passed a night of painful suspense succeeded it during which not a soul on board the alcyon thought of sleeping nothing however occurred save that the intense lightning of the previous night was renewed toward eleven o'clock the breeze freshened to such an extent that the yacht sped along on her course with great fleetness in the morning the sun arose amid a purple haze and the mediterranean presented a more tumultuous and threatening aspect than it had the preceding day the breeze was still blowing stiffly and the lightning continued giacomo informed monte cristo that unless a calm should suddenly come on they would certainly arrive at crete by noon the sailors he added were in good spirits and might be relied upon though they were much fatigued by reason of their unceasing labour 
at ten o'clock the man at the wheel hurriedly summoned the captain to his side and with a look of terror and bewilderment directed his attention to the compass the needle of which no longer pointed to the north but was dancing a mad dance not remaining stationary for a single instant to complicate the situation still further the sun was suddenly obscured absolute darkness invading both sea and sky only when the vivid lightning tore the dense clouds apart were those on board the alcyon enabled to catch a glimpse of what was going on about them and that glimpse was but momentary thunder peals were now added to the terrors of the time while the yacht tossed and plunged on angry threatening billows showers of sparks and glowing cinders as if from some mighty conflagration poured down into the water striking its surface with an ominous hiss they resembled meteors and their brilliancy was augmented by the surrounding gloom rain also began to descend not in drops but in broad sheets and with the roar of a cataract in a moment everybody on the alcyon's deck was drenched to the skin heyday had not ventured from the cabin since the first day of the elemental commotion in obedience to his master's commands ali constantly watched over her whenever the count was facing the strange storm with giacomo and the sailors as the captain approached the man at the wheel monte cristo fixed his eyes upon the old italian's countenance and saw it assume a deathly pallor as he noticed that the needle of the compass could no longer be depended on in an instant the count was beside him and realized the extent of the new evil that had befallen them we can steer but by guess now said giacomo in a low hoarse whisper god grant that we may be able to reach our destination as he spoke a loud crash was heard and the rudder torn from its fastenings by the violence of the tempest swept by them vanishing amid the darkness the man at the wheel gazed after it uttering a cry of despair we are completely at the mercy of the wind and waves said monte cristo in an undertone can nothing be done he added hurriedly nothing excellency returned the captain a temporary rudder might be rigged were the sea calmer but boiling and seething as it is such a thing is utterly impossible a panic had seized upon the sailors as they witnessed the catastrophe that rendered the alcyon helpless but this immediately gave place to stupor and the mid stood silent and overwhelmed bertuccio from the time the dread storm had broken forth had been gloomy and uncommunicative he had held persistently aloof both from monte cristo and the crew in the general turmoil and confusion his bearing and behaviour had passed unnoticed even by the vigilant eye of the count the steward now approached his master and taking him aside whispered in his ear heaven's vengeance is pursuing the alcyon and all on board because of my crimes i feel it i know it the steward's face was as white as a sheet but his eye betokened fixed resolution not another word of this cried monte cristo sternly should the superstitious sailors hear you they would demand with one voice that you be cast into the boiling sea and they would be right rejoined bertuccio doggedly if i remain where i am the, the alcyon's doom is sealed on the other hand the moment you are rid of me the storm will cease as if by magic and you will be saved be silent commanded monte cristo you are a corsican show a corsican's courage i will was the determined reply and the steward walked with a firm tread to the side of the yacht what do you mean said the count hurrying after him and placing his hand on his shoulder you shall see answered bertuccio shaking off monte cristo's grip he leaped upon the bulwarks and suddenly sprang far out amid the seething waves the count uttered a cry of horror that was echoed by the captain as for the crew so utterly stupefied were they that they did not seem to comprehend the suicidal act for an instant monte cristo and giacomo saw the steward whirling about amid the tumultuous flood then he was swept away and vanished in the impenetrable darkness beyond 
the force of the wind had meanwhile augmented until a perfect hurricane was raging about the alcyon the noise was deafening and the sails swelled to such an extent that they threatened to snap asunder suddenly they gave way and the tattered shreds flew in all directions like white-winged sea-fowl simultaneously the mast toppled and went by the board the yacht now a helpless wreck pitched and tossed but still shot onward impelled by the wild fury of the gale gigantic waves at intervals swept the deck each torrent as it retreated carrying with it all it could tear away and making huge gaps in the bulwarks to which the sailors were clinging with all the energy of desperation monte cristo had grasped the stump of the mast and the captain clung with all his strength to the remains of the wheel the lightning had become terrific and the almost continuous roar of the thunder was sufficient to drown the mad din of the waters all at once the jagged outlines of a gigantic rock loomed up directly in the course of the fated vessel in another instant the alcyon struck and remained fast while a vivid flash of lightning revealed what appeared to be an island about a quarter of a mile away but though the wreck of the yacht was motionless the furious sea continued to break over the deck and it seemed only a question of a few moments when the battered and torn hull of the alcyon would go to pieces the boat the vessel carried had long since been wrenched from its fastenings and swept into the whirlpool monte cristo quitting the stump of the mast darted down the companionway into the cabin and quickly returned to the deck bearing in his arms the swooning form of his adored heyday ali followed him the nubian seemed to have entirely recovered from his fear and manifested both alertness and decision shifting his lifeless burden to his left arm and grasping her firmly monte cristo advanced to the side of the alcyon pausing there for an instant he said addressing giacomo and the crew the yacht cannot hold together much longer if we remain where we are we shall inevitably be ground to powder on the rock with our vessel there is an island some distance to the right of us and sustained by providence we may succeed in reaching it by swimming for my part i shall try the venture and endeavour to save this lady you men are untrammelled and stand a better chance of success than i do i advise you all to follow my example to cling further to the wreck is death with these words the count made his way to a gap in the bulwarks and grasping heyday tightly leaped with her into the midst of the angry sea ali followed his master and soon they were seen far in the distance struggling and battling with the waves End of section one section two of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg the island it was the month of december but on the little island of salmas in the grecian archipelago the temperature was as mild and genial as that of june the grass was rank and thick while the blooming almond trees filled the atmosphere with fragrance on a narrow strip of sandy beach three or four fishermen were preparing their nets and boats for a fishing expedition to the waters beyond they chatted as they toiled the eldest of them a man about sixty with silvered locks and a long grey beard said you may talk of storms as much as you please but i maintain that the most severe tempest ever experienced in this neighbourhood was the one i witnessed ten years ago last october when we had the earthquake and the strange man who now owns this island was washed ashore the count of monte cristo you mean remarked one of the party yes the count of monte cristo who has done so much for us all and whose wife is nothing less than an angel of goodness and charity you rescued him did you not alexis i found him lying upon the beach with the lady who is now his wife tightly clasped in his arms so tightly that i had no end of trouble to separate them both were unconscious at the time and no wonder for the sea was furious 
and they must have been dashed about at a fearful rate it was a miracle they escaped with their lives near them lay that dark-skinned african their servant who styles himself ali as well as the corpses of several sailors the african however revived just as i approached him he's a man of iron i tell you for he immediately leaped to his feet and helped me to restore his master and mistress when they came to i took the whole party to my hut and cared for them the next day i rowed the count and the african out to the wreck of their vessel on that rock you see away over there and they brought back with them a fabulous amount of money and jewels that they found in the strangest closets i ever saw in the cabin then the count bought this island and has lived here ever since he took the lady to athens and was married to her there and on his return he had the palace they now occupy built in the midst of the palm grove by this time the fishermen had completed their preparations and leaping into their boats they started on their expedition the palace in the palm grove to which old alexis had alluded was indeed a magnificent dwelling suitable in every respect for the residence of an oriental monarch it was built in the turkish fashion and its exterior was singularly beautiful and imposing huge palm trees surrounded it they were planted in regular rows upon a vast lawn that was adorned with costly statues and fountains while at intervals were scattered great flower-beds filled with choice exotics and blooming plants of endless variety a wide gravelled walk and carriage road led to the palace the main entrance to which was flanked on either side by columns of dark veined marble the edifice itself was of green stone and sparkled in the sunlight like a colossal emerald it was surmounted by three zinc-covered domes above each of which towered a gilded crescent within all was elegance and luxury there were immense salons with marble floors and walls covered with smyrna hangings of the most beautiful description that of themselves must have cost a fortune these salons were furnished with rich divans tables of malachite cabinets of ebony and oriental rugs of the most artistic and complicated workmanship there were dazzling reception rooms filled with exquisite statues and superb paintings the works of the greatest sculptors and artists of the east and west of the past and the present figures by thorwaldsen powers and other modern celebrities of the block and chisel stood beside antique masterpieces framed by the genius of phidias and his brother sculptors of old greece and rome masterpieces that had been torn from the ruins of antiquity by the hand of the untiring and enterprising excavator among the paintings were fine specimens of the skill of albert dur murillo rubens van dyck rembrandt sir joshua reynolds and other votaries of the brush whose names are immortal these paintings did not hang on the walls for they were covered with rich tapestry from the looms of benares and the gobelins but rested on delicately fashioned easels themselves entitled to a high rank as works of art in the salons were statues by michelangelo pierre puget and pompeo marchesi and paintings by claude lorrain titian sir thomas lawrence correggio and salvator rosa the vast library was encircled by lofty bookcases of walnut and ebony filled with rare and costly volumes from the curiously illuminated missals of monkish days to the latest scientific works together with a liberal sprinkling of poetry and fiction upon tables stands and mantels were superb ornaments in brass repoussé work and grand eau faience including some wonderful specimens of ancient chinese crackleware the peculiar secret of the manufacture of which had been lost in the flight of ages at an exquisite desk of walnut carved with grotesque images sat the count of monte cristo he was busily engaged in writing and beside him lay a huge pile of manuscript that was ever and anon augmented by an additional sheet hastily scrawled in strange bewildering semitic characters the count showed but small trace of the passage of years 
he did not look much older than when he left the isle of monte cristo with haydee on that voyage which was destined to result so disastrously for the alcyon and her ill-fated crew to be sure his hair was slightly flecked with grey but his visage still retained its full outline and not a wrinkle marred its masculine beauty he was clad in an exceedingly picturesque costume half greek and half turkish while upon his head was a red fez from the centre of which hung down a gilt tassel as he wrote his eyes sparkled and he seemed filled with enthusiasm at length he threw aside his pen and rising began to pace the vast apartment with long strides alas he muttered perhaps after all i am only a vain dreamer as hosts of others have been before me but no my scheme is feasible and cannot fail it is based on sound principles and a thorough knowledge of mankind besides the immense wealth that an all-wise god has placed at my disposal will aid me and form a mighty factor in the cause in the past i used that wealth solely for my own selfish ends but now all is different i have no thought of self the philanthropist has replaced the egotist i have aided the poor relieved the stricken and brought joy to many a sorrowing home but hitherto i have acted only in isolated cases now i meditate a grand a sublime stroke to give freedom to man throughout the entire length and breadth of the continent of europe if i succeed and succeed i must every downtrodden human being from the coast of france to the ural mountains from the sunny mediterranean to the frozen arctic ocean will reap the benefit of my efforts and shake off the yoke of tyranny where shall i begin ah with france my own country the land that gave me birth i shall thus return good for evil and edmond dantes the prisoner of the chateau d'if will free the masses from their galling chains my most potent instrument will be the public press by means of journals i will found or buy the minds of all europeans shall become familiarized with the theory of universal liberty and ripen for sweeping revolutions and the establishment of republics i will also call fiction to my aid struggling novelists and feuilletonists shall receive liberal subsidies from my hand on condition that they disseminate my ideas theories and plans in their romances and feuilletons thus will i reach thousands upon thousands who hold themselves aloof from politics and almost insensibly they will be transformed into zealous active partisans of the order of things that is to be poets too shall sing the praises of freedom louder and more enthusiastically than ever before in fine no instrument no means however humble and apparently insignificant shall be neglected when the proper moment arrives but until it does arrive i must wait wait patiently wait though while waiting an internal fire consume me and my veins throb with anxiety and expectation to the point of bursting he sank into a chair and burying his face in his hands was lost in profound thought meanwhile a lovely woman leading a beautiful girl of eight years and a handsome boy of nine had noiselessly entered the apartment it was haydee the wife of monte cristo haydee grown mature and more beautiful than ever her night-black tresses were gathered in two wide braids at the back of her shapely head so long that they reached below her waist her eyes were as bright as stars and her slender hands tipped with their pink nails as white as the lily her tiny feet encased in cinderella slippers of rose-hued satin peeped out from beneath ample turkish trousers which were semi-transparent and disclosed the outlines of her beautifully turned limbs she wore a close-fitting gilet of pearly silk adorned with gilt fringe and cut low displaying her snowy neck and magnificent shoulders her arms were encompassed but not hidden by flowing sleeves of filmy gauze as fine as the tissue of a spider's web about her neck flashed a collar of brilliant diamonds of enormous value and on her tapering fingers were rings of emerald ruby and sapphire on her head was a red fez precisely similar to her husband's her countenance a perfect revelation 
of angelic beauty was wreathed in sunny smiles that betokened thorough happiness and contentment the little girl zuleika the daughter of monte cristo was her exact image a reproduction of her lovely mother in miniature a promise of rare delight for the future the child's costume was also modelled after heydays but with modifications suited to her tender years zuleika was of a gentle loving disposition but a vein of romance and poetry had already developed itself in her notwithstanding her extreme youth she sighed for the unknown delights of the sea and the wail of the surf sounded to her like the most delicious of mysterious harmonies her infant imagination peopled the watery realm with spirits of good and evil always in contention and the great ships with their huge white sails that she saw in the distance from the sandy beach of the island of salmis were in her eyes the mighty birds of arabian story the boy esperance the son of monte cristo resembled his father both in disposition and appearance his youthful soul was full of noble aspirations while his daring and bravery filled even the hardy fishermen of the coast with wonder and amazement he was a very manly and handsome child quick enthusiastic and energetic his father's hope and his mother's idol though haydee saw with extreme uneasiness that the little lad was wise beyond his years and was already devoted to monte cristo's somewhat visionary schemes which he appeared to grasp in all their complicated details his attire was that of a greek fisher-boy his trousers rolled up above his knees displayed his naked legs and bare feet in one hand he held a rough sea-cap that he had removed from his head at the door of the library esperance loved above all other things to be with the fishermen on the beach and his joy knew no bounds when he was permitted to accompany them on their fishing expeditions to the waters beyond haydee remained silently gazing at monte cristo for a moment then advancing into the middle of the room she stood beside him with the children zuleika dropping her mother's hand sprang lightly upon her father's knees and clasping him about the neck with her chubby arms kissed him rapturously the count started from his deep reverie and returned his daughter's kiss then looking up he perceived haydee and esperance ah my loved ones said he so you are all here yes papa returned zuleika in a clear crystal voice that sounded like the tinkle of a fairy bell we are all here mamma esperance and laika monte cristo smiled faintly and patted the little girl tenderly on the cheek heyday said he fortune favors us in our children they are indeed a blessing to us a veritable blessing my lord answered the lovely heyday but still i cannot help feeling some terror at the thought that esperance may one day be drawn into those political struggles you have so often foretold and in which it is your intention to act a prominent part papa will lead the people to victory and i will fight by his side cried esperance proudly haydee gazed sadly at the enthusiastic boy and tears came into her gazelle-like eyes oh my lord she said to her husband teach esperance the arts of peace implant in his boyish bosom while there is yet time the love of home and domestic joys the count glanced admiringly at the little lad who stood with dilated nostrils and eyes flashing fire then turning to haydee he said in an impressive tone my beloved wife esperance is but an infant and it may be years ere europe shall awake from her lethargy and strive to overturn the thrones of her despots before that period the period of revolution and bloodshed our son may change his opinions and cease to be the ardent republican he is now no no protested the enthusiastic boy i will be a republican all my life monte cristo smiled sadly and drawing the lad to his knee said to him esperance my son you are yet too young to know the ways of the world and the snares that monarchs set for the inexperienced and unwary there are temptations at their command capable of winning over even the most zealous enemies and they never hesitate to use them when the opportunity offers at the proper time i will instruct you fully about all this now you cannot understand it as monte cristo ceased to speak 
ali entered the library followed by three native servants attached to the palace the nubian bowed low before his master and reverently kissed Hayday's hand the servants did likewise then ali handed the count a sealed letter making signs to the effect that he had found it tied with a cord to one of the palm trees on the lawn monte cristo opened the letter and glanced at the signature as he did so a look of surprise and annoyance settled upon his face the note was written in the french language and read as follows count of monte cristo i am in hiding on the island of salmis and must see you without delay meet me at midnight in the almond grove near the eastern shore be sure to come alone benedetto humph said the count to himself as he finished reading this singular epistle i thought i was rid of that scoundrel for ever but it seems that the galleys at toulon cannot hold him well i suppose i must meet him otherwise he may take a notion to come here which would be both inconvenient and disagreeable i imagine he wants a little money to enable him to escape to the east if that is all i will gladly give it to be rid of his presence on the island i prefer not to have as a neighbor a thief and an assassin even if he did shine so brilliantly once in aristocratic parisian society as the prince cavalcanti what is the matter my lord asked Hayday, noticing the expression on monte cristo's countenance from whom is the letter oh it is nothing answered the count with a smile a poor fellow wishes my assistance and is too modest to ask it in person that's all Hayday was not satisfied with this indefinite reply she knew that the contents of the letter so strangely conveyed to her husband had vexed and troubled him but she also knew that monte cristo could be as silent as the tomb about anything he wished to keep secret and therefore judged it useless to attempt further questions besides a singular presentiment of evil had taken possession of her at the sight of the ominous note and she felt certain that some disaster was threatened hence she determined to be watchful and keep strict guard over her children until the mystery whatever it was should be cleared up as the clock in his library struck the quarter before midnight monte cristo arose from the chair in which he had been sitting donning his fez and a light cloak he prepared to go to the almond grove on the eastern portion of the island the spot benedetto had appointed for their meeting prior to setting out he slipped into his pocket a well-filled purse and thrust a loaded revolver into the belt he wore about his waist the scoundrel was anxious that i should come alone but he did not prohibit me from arming myself muttered he with a grim smile and i have seen too much of signor benedetto to care to leave the game entirely in his hands quitting the palace by a private door after making sure that everybody was asleep and that he was unobserved monte cristo bent his steps in the direction of the almond grove it was a moonless night and very dark the air was rather chill while the roar of the surf sounded louder than usual in the crisp bracing atmosphere the count gathered his cloak tightly about him and walked steadily onward notwithstanding the thick darkness at length the heavy odour of the almond blossoms warned him that he was approaching his destination and he paused to survey the scene about fifty yards away the almond grove loomed up casting a denser shade upon the surrounding blackness the count hastened his steps and in a few seconds stood among the trees as he paused the figure of a man emerged from behind a huge fragment of rock and thus hailed him are you the count of monte cristo i am was the firm reply and are you alone as i recommended entirely alone now if you have finished your questions pray who are you why do you ask merely for form's sake well then i am benedetto of course as it was too dark for me to distinguish your features i simply wanted to identify you now state your business as briefly as possible i escaped from toulon long ago and after wandering all over europe settled in athens where i remained until a week since when the result of a difficulty compelled me to quit the city an assassination yes an assassination monte cristo shuddered to hear the cold-blooded villain talk so calmly of his foul crime but conquering his aversion he said between his teeth proceed i fled from athens under cover of the night and the next morning hired a fisherman to bring me here in his boat thinking that the island was inhabited only by a few poverty-stricken wretches who gained a scanty subsistence from the sea on my arrival i was filled with terror at beholding your magnificent palace which i was told belonged to a great lord 
i naturally imagined that no one could inhabit such a dwelling save some high official of the greek government and without making further inquiries again secured the services of the fishermen who took me to the neighbouring island of kilo there i was in safety for i fell in with a band of stout-hearted men of whom i eventually became the chief bandits no doubt yes bandits if you will but valiant men all the same we prospered exceedingly and imagined that our career could be continued with impunity as long as we might desire in this however we were sadly mistaken for one fatal night the greek soldiery suddenly descended upon us and hemmed us in on every side ere we were aware of their presence we fought none the less desperately on that account and in the sanguinary conflict all my companions were slain i was grievously wounded and left for dead but the following day managed to crawl to the beach and contrived to be conveyed hither having learned by accident that the great lord of the island of salmis was no other than my old friend of happier days the count of monte cristo in short yourself now you know my story i am a fugitive here as in france and need your aid to enable me to escape you want money yes how much a million of francs man cried monte cristo breathless with astonishment at benedetto's audacious demand you are out of your senses i will give you a thousand francs but not a sou more beware how you trifle with the desperate man hissed benedetto what have i to fear said monte cristo calmly you are alone i am not alone count of monte cristo my stout-hearted friends of the island of kilo are with me and ready to support my demand then you lied to me your story was a base fabrication partly count but enough of this i want the million of francs it is a small sum for you to spare an old friend who did you as much service as prince andrea cavaconti are you going to give me the money i am not replied monte cristo drawing his revolver from his belt and cocking it ho ho laughed benedetto mockingly that's your game is it again i tell you to beware how you trifle with a desperate man at the repetition of this phrase as if it had been a preconcerted signal a dozen stalwart figures started up from the darkness and surrounded monte cristo who instantly discharged his weapon right and left among them several of the bandits fell pierced by the balls and benedetto with a loud oath leaped at the count's throat brandishing a long keen bladed dagger above his head raising his empty revolver monte cristo with a hand of iron struck his oncoming assailant full in the face stretching him instantly at his feet but scarcely had he accomplished this when three of the bandits sprang upon him and hurled him to the earth beside benedetto now cried one of the miscreants with a frightful curse at the same time placing the muzzle of a pistol at the count's temple now my lord of salmis your time has come as he was about to fire there arose a tremendous shout and headed by ali who swung aloft a turkish yatagan the entire force of monte cristo's servants armed to the teeth swept down upon the astonished bandits at the same instant a pistol shot rang out and the man who had threatened to take the count's life fell to the ground a corpse as monte cristo regained his feet he saw esperance standing a short distance away the smoking weapon with which he had just killed his father's would-be murderer still clenched in his boyish hand the struggle that ensued was of short duration for the bandits finding themselves outnumbered speedily fled to their boats leaving their wounded comrades behind them when the count realized that esperance his beloved son had saved him from death he rushed to the heroic lad took him in his arms and bore him beyond the reach of danger this done he returned to aid ali and the servants but they were already victors and in full possession of the field a search was made for the body of benedetto but it had disappeared end of section two section three of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg The Conflagration As the Count of Monte Cristo, Esperance, Ali, and the servants approached the palace on their return from the struggle with the bandits in the almond grove, their ears were suddenly saluted by loud cries of terror. They came from the library, and thither Monte Cristo hurried, followed by his son. On the floor in the centre of the apartment, Haydée lay in a swoon, and bending over her mother was Zuleika, screaming and wringing her little hands. The Count raised his wife and placed her upon a divan, while Espérance brought a water-jar and bathed her temples with its cool, refreshing contents, Zuleika, meanwhile, holding her mother's hands and sobbing violently at last haydee recovered consciousness and opening her eyes gazed wildly around her seeing her husband esperance and zuleika safe beside her she uttered a faint sigh of relief it was several moments longer before she could speak then she exclaimed in a tremulous voice oh my lord did you meet that terrible man what man haydee asked the count do you mean benedetto i do not know his name i never saw him before answered haydee but his face was all battered and bleeding on his uncovered head the locks were matted and unkempt and his garments were torn as if in wrenching his way through a thicket of tangled briars benedetto it was benedetto cried monte cristo you do not mean to say he was here in this room he was here and only a short time ago replied haydee with a shudder i was standing at the window with zuleika when he rushed by me like a whirlwind and going to your secretary endeavoured to open it but in vain then with a cry of rage he ran to the window leaped out into the darkness and was gone i know nothing further for as he vanished i fell to the floor in a swoon monte cristo touched a bell and almost immediately ali stood bowing before him as calm and unmoved as though nothing unusual had occurred ali said the count post all the servants within and without the palace and let the strictest watch be kept until dawn the chief of the bandits who is no other than the former prince cavalcanti was here in our absence and must yet be hovering in the vicinity see that he does not effect another entrance as his purpose is robbery if not murder ali signified by his eloquent pantomime that he had already taken it upon himself to station the servants as his master directed and that it would be utterly impossible for any one to approach the palace without being seen and seized as the faithful nubian turned to retire monte cristo noticed that his right hand was bandaged as if wounded and inquired whether he had been hurt in the conflict with the bandits ali explained that a dagger thrust had cut his palm but that the wound had been properly cared for and would soon heal when the count and his family were once more alone together haydee threw herself at her husband's feet and humbly demanded pardon what have you done to require pardon asked monte cristo in astonishment speak but i forgive you beforehand oh my lord said haydee still maintaining her kneeling posture despite her husband's efforts to raise her oh my lord i have been guilty of a despicable act but my love for you and fears for your safety must be my excuse you left the letter you received so strangely this morning lying upon your secretary i opened it and hurriedly made myself acquainted with its contents for i had a premonition that some terrible danger threatened you oh my lord pardon pardon monte cristo raised her to her feet and imprinted a kiss upon her pallid brow so then it is to you haydee that i owe my timely rescue from the hands of benedetto and his band of cutthroats had you committed even a much more serious fault than peeping into my correspondence that would be more than sufficient to secure my full forgiveness but do you know that esperance shot and killed the miscreant who held his pistol to my temple and was about to blow out my brains esperance 
said Haydée, in bewilderment. Did he not remain behind with Zuleika and myself? No, mamma, said the boy, holding his head proudly erect. I could not remain behind. I knew papa was in danger, and taking a pistol that I had seen Ali load this morning from the cabinet of firearms, I followed the servants, arriving at the almond grove just in time haydee ran to her son and taking him in her arms pressed him fondly to her heart kissing him again and again oh esperance she cried had i known you were in the midst of those bloodthirsty cutthroats i should have died of terror but you have saved your father's life my son and i bless you for it he is a little hero said monte cristo impressively zuleika had thrown herself upon the divan and utterly worn out by the excitement through which she had passed was already wrapped in a deep slumber the count haydee and esperance however could not resign themselves to sleep and when the grey light of dawn appeared in the eastern sky they were still in the library and still watching benedetto had not been seen again and a diligent search of the entire island made by ali and the servants failed to reveal even the slightest trace of him he had evidently succeeded in finding some fisherman's skiff and in it had made his escape this view of the case was confirmed a few hours later when old alexis came to the palace and informed monte cristo that his smack had vanished during the night having in all probability been carried off by thieves i knew said the fisherman that the island of kilo was infested by bandits but i had no idea they would venture here now however i thought i had better put you on your guard i am much indebted to you alexis said the count then slipping a purse of money into his hand he added take that and provide yourself with a new boat alexis touched his cap bowed and was about to withdraw when monte cristo said to him assuming a careless tone by the way my good fellow have you ever chanced to meet any of the bandits you mentioned often excellency replied alexis what kind of men are they bold bad wretches whose hands have been more than once stained with innocent blood what is their strength they number about fifty do any women dwell among them yes excellency their wives and sweethearts who is the leader of the band a strange morose man who has not been long in their midst is he a greek no excellency he is a foreigner a frenchman quite likely though i am not sure what is his name he calls himself demetrius did he ever question you about me yes excellency and what did you reply i told him you were the count of monte cristo ah what did he say then he said he had heard of you before that will do alexis i have all the information i require the fisherman again touched his cap and making a low bow took his departure under ordinary circumstances monte cristo would not have been disturbed by the presence of bandits so near the island of salmis but it became an altogether different thing when those bandits were led by benedetto a month passed but in it nothing occurred calculated to break the tranquillity of the count and his family the bandits had not reappeared and benedetto had given no sign of life the faithful ali no longer deemed it necessary to maintain his precautions against surprise and the strict watch that had been kept up day and night ever since the conflict in the almond grove was abandoned Heyday, zuleika and esperance resumed their usual mode of life having apparently dismissed the robbers from their minds while even monte cristo seemed free from all uneasiness one night while the count was writing at a late hour in the library he yielded to fatigue and fell asleep over his papers his slumber was troubled with a strange and vivid dream a man in the picturesque garb of a greek peasant and wearing a mask on his face suddenly stood before him with his arms folded upon his breast monte cristo saw him distinctly though unable to stir either hand or foot the singular visitant surveyed the count long and steadily there was something vaguely familiar about him but as to his identity the sleeper could form no idea 
at last he slowly removed the mask and recognition was instantaneous the man was danglars he raised his right hand and pointing with his forefinger at the count said deliberately with a hiss like some venomous serpent edmond dantes there is a bitter account open between us and i am here to force you to a bitter settlement the light of the huge lamp suspended from the ceiling fell full upon danglars countenance it was as bloodless as that of a corpse and the eyes shone with a remorseless vindictive glare the banker continued in the same hissing tone his words penetrating to the very marrow of the slumberer's bones count of monte cristo for by that name it still pleases you to be called listen to me by the most ingenious and fiendish combinations possible for a human being to contrive you wrecked my fortune and with it my hopes you drove me ignominiously from paris in rome you caused me to be starved and robbed by luigi vampa and his brigands then with the malevolent magnanimity of an archdemon you sent me forth into the world a fugitive and an outcast count of monte cristo edmond dantes low-born sailor of marseilles modern mephistopheles as you are i will be even with you you have had your vengeance now you shall feel mine here in the grecian archipelago on the island of salmis i will torture you through your dearest affections and grind you to dust beneath my heel as danglars finished his features changed and became those of villefort while his greek peasant's garb was transformed into the sombre habiliments of the procureur du roi villefort's face wore the look of madness but there was a freezing calmness in his voice as he said edmond dantes count of monte cristo gaze upon the ruin you have made through you i was dragged down from my high position exposed humiliated and deprived of reason but although the mere wreck of my former self i am not utterly powerless as you shall learn to your cost you raised up my infamous son benedetto to be the instrument of my destruction now he shall work yours and avenge his unhappy father the apparition paused sighed deeply and then resumed in a tone of still greater menace count of monte cristo look well to your beloved wife heyday look well to your heroic son esperance look well to your darling daughter zuleika for this night they are in frightful danger look well to your fabulous riches for they are threatened look well to your stately and magnificent palace for already the element that shall devour it is noiselessly and stealthily at work count of monte cristo farewell a heart-rending shriek rang in the sleeper's ears a mighty flash dazzled his eyes and with a grim smile upon his pallid countenance villefort vanished monte cristo awoke with a quick start and passed his hand across his forehead as if dazed then he leaped to his feet and glanced breathlessly about him danglars and villefort had been only the idle coinage of his brain but the heart-rending shriek the mighty flash they were indeed stern realities the shriek was heydays and the flash was fire my god cried monte cristo standing for an instant rooted to the spot can it be possible that this dream is the truth after all and that i am even now to feel the vengeance of those two men he sprang into the spacious hall that was as light as day and as he did so the figure of a man rushed by him it was benedetto and in his hand he held a long knife dripping with blood the count turned and pursued him snatching a dagger from a table as he ran at the door leading to the lawn he grasped him firmly by the shoulder and held him murderer he shouted whose blood is that upon your knife the blood of heyday the greek slave hissed benedetto with a glare of ferocious triumph the blood of heyday your wife edmond dantes i am even with you monte cristo struck at the assassin with his dagger but benedetto eluded the blow and raising his own weapon inflicted a frightful gash upon the count's cheek 
a terrible struggle ensued monte cristo was possessed of wonderful strength and activity but in both these respects the two desperate antagonists seemed fairly matched three times did the count bury his dagger in benedetto's body but though the assassin's blood gushed copiously from his wounds he continued to fight with the utmost determination at length the men grappled in a supreme deadly effort but monte cristo making a false step slipped on the blood-spattered marble floor and benedetto with the quickness of thought hurling him backward freed himself and bounding through the open doorway vanished in the darkness beyond the count uttered a groan of despair as he saw haydee's self-confessed murderer escape him and staggered to his feet the fierce conflict with benedetto had exhausted him and he stood for an instant panting and breathless the shrieks had now grown fainter and the hall was full of smoke during all this time neither ali nor any of the servants under him had appeared a circumstance that to monte cristo seemed inexplicable he however did not pause to give it thought but dashed up the stairway and strove to reach his wife's apartment blinding stifling clouds of smoke through which penetrated the glare of the conflagration drove him back again and again but he renewed his attempts to force a passage with undaunted energy and courage finally compressing his lips and holding his nostrils with the thumb and forefinger of his right hand he gave a headlong plunge and succeeded in reaching haydee's door it was open displaying a scene that caused the count's heart to sink within him the whole chamber was one sea of flame fiery tongues like so many writhing and hissing serpents were licking and consuming the costly tapestry the richly carved furniture and the magnificent objects of art the curtains of the bed were blazing and upon the couch lay the senseless form of the wife of monte cristo the pallor of her faultless countenance contrasting painfully with the ruddy glow of the devouring element in haydee's breast was a gaping wound from which her life-blood was slowly oozing in ruby drops rendered utterly reckless by the terrible sight the count madly rushed to the couch tore his beloved haydee from it and clasping her tightly against his bosom staggered into the corridor with his precious burden there the smoke had increased in volume and density but summoning all his resolution and endurance to his aid he plunged through it and finally was successful in reaching the library then with the swiftness of a flash of lightning the husband was replaced by the father and monte cristo for the first time since haydee's shrieks had awakened him from his dream thought of his children where were they and what had happened to them the count felt a cold perspiration break out upon his forehead and a feeling of unspeakable dread took entire possession of him haydee demanded immediate attention but esperance and zuleika must instantly be found and rescued at the top of his voice monte cristo shouted for ali but no reply was returned fearing to leave haydee for even a moment the count strode about the library like a caged wild animal still holding her in his arms he shouted again and again until he was hoarse calling distractedly upon esperance zuleika and all the servants in turn at last an answering shout came suddenly from the lawn and old alexis followed by several fishermen leaped into the library through an open window resigning haydee to alexis the count accompanied by the fishermen fairly flew to the apartment of his children situated on a corridor in another portion of the palace there esperance and zuleika were discovered gagged and bound they lay upon the floor of their chamber while ali who had been treated in like manner was extended near them to release the prisoners was but the work of a moment and then it was learned that all the servants under ali were confined in their dormitory they as well as monte cristo's children and the nubian had been suddenly seized by a party of rough-looking greeks evidently a portion of benedetto's band meanwhile the flames had spread from haydee's chamber to the adjoining quarters of the edifice and the entire palace seemed doomed 
for to check the conflagration appeared impossible but so happy had the count been made by the recovery of his son and daughter unharmed that he gave himself no concern about the probable destruction of his magnificent property seizing his children he directed ali and the fishermen to release the captive servants and hastily returned to the library as he entered the room haydee uttered a low groan and opened her eyes she was lying on a divan where old alexis had placed her esperance and zuleika sprang to her side she took each by the hand and as she did so they saw the wound in her breast zuleika burst into tears esperance compressed his lips and grew deadly pale my loved one said haydee faintly i feel that i am about to leave you for ever perhaps in a few moments be good children and obey your father in all things esperance zuleika stoop and kiss me they did as she desired her lips were already purple and cold the stamp of death was upon her features suddenly her frame was convulsed and her eyes assumed a glassy look monte cristo my husband where are you she said in a broken voice here haydee answered the count approaching he strove to appear calm but could not control his emotion nearer nearer edmund said haydee growing weaker and weaker the count sank on his knees beside his dying wife and put his arms about her neck oh haydee haydee he sobbed thrice accursed be the infamous wretch who has done this edmund my children farewell gasped haydee i am going to a better land the death rattle was in her throat she raised herself with a mighty effort gazed lovingly at her husband and children and strove to speak again but could not then a flickering shade of violet passed over her countenance and she fell back dead esperance and zuleika stood as if stunned monte cristo was overwhelmed with grief and despair the whole palace is in flames save yourselves save yourselves cried a fisherman rushing into the library followed by his companions ali and the servants monte cristo leaped to his feet seizing the corpse of haydee and raising it in his arms ali grasped esperance and zuleika and the entire party hastened from the burning edifice they were not an instant too soon for as they quitted the library the tempest of fire burst into it accompanied by torrents of smoke the fishermen and servants commanded by the nubian had made every effort to save the doomed mansion but in vain monte cristo and his children found refuge in the hut of alexis to which haydee's body was reverently borne the wife of monte cristo was buried on the island of salmis and over her remains her husband erected a massive monument shortly afterwards the count esperance and zuleika attended by the faithful ali quitted the island and took passage on a vessel bound for france End of section 3。section 4 of Edmond Dantes。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information。or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。recording by。Mike Manalakis。Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg。Chapter 4. The News from Algeria Beauchamp, the journalist, sat at his desk in his editorial sanctum early one bright morning in the autumn of 1841. He had gone to work long before his usual hour, for important movements were on foot, the political atmosphere was agitated, and Paris was in a state of feverish excitement. Besides, Beauchamp had that day printed in his journal a dispatch from Algeria that would be certain to cause a great sensation and with a proper spirit of pride, the journalist desired to be at his post that he might receive the numerous congratulations his friends could not fail to offer, as the dispatch had appeared in his paper alone. The sanctum had not an attractive look. In fact, it was rather dilapidated, while in addition the disorder occasioned by the previous night's work had not been repaired, and all was chaos and confusion. Beauchamp was busily engaged in glancing over the rival morning papers when Lucien de Bray entered and seated himself at another desk. The ministerial secretary smiled upon the journalist in a knowing way, and the latter, 
nodding to him with an air of triumph, silently pointed to the pile of journals he had finished examining. Lucien took them up, and without a word began scanning their contents. "'Glorious news, that, from the army in Algeria,' cried Chateau Renaud, rushing into the sanctum. "'Glorious indeed,' replied the editor, looking up from the paper over which he was hurriedly skimming. On the huge table at his side, as well as beneath it, and under his feet, and his capacious armchair, nothing was to be seen but newspapers. "'Take a chair, Renaud, if you can find one, and help yourself to the news. You see, I have Lucien similarly engaged yonder.' The ministerial secretary glanced up from his papers, returned his friend's salutation, and resumed his reading. He was dressed with his customary elegance and richness, but his form and face were fuller than when last before the reader, and his brown hair was besprinkled with grey. "'I congratulate you, Beauchamp, on being the first to give the news,' continued Chateau Renaud. "'Not a paper in Paris but your own has a line from the army this morning.' "'Rather congratulate me and my paper on having a friend at court. Huh, "'And that explains the fact, otherwise inexplicable, "'that an opposition journal has intelligence, "'which only the Bureau of War could have anticipated. "'Treason! Treason!' "'The editor and the secretary exchanged significant smiles. "'Oh, I don't doubt that your favors are reciprocal,' "'continued the young aristocrat, laughing. "'I've half a mind to be something useful myself.' minister editor anything but an idler and a lawgiver just to experience the exquisite sensation of a new pleasure the pleasure of revealing and publishing to the world something it knew not before why you two fellows in this dark and dirty little room are the two greatest men in paris this morning or were rather before your paper beauchamp laid before the world what only you and lucien knew previously Oh, the delight, the rapture of knowing something that nobody else knows, and then of making the revelation. And this news from Algeria is really important, remarked the editor. Important, so important that it will be before the chambers this morning, replied the secretary. So I supposed, said the deputy, and called to learn additional particulars, if you had any, on my way to the chambers. We gave all we had, my dear Lycurgus, and for that we were indebted to an official dispatch, a telegraph to the war office, and faithfully re-telegraphed to us by our well-beloved Lucien. It's true, then, as I have sometimes suspected, that the wires radiate from the minister's sanctum to the editors, was the laughing rejoinder. It must be so, or there's witchcraft in it. There's witchcraft, at any rate, in this new invention. Speed, secrecy, security, and surety— no eastern genius of Arabian fiction can be compared to the electric telegraph, and how ministers or editors continue to keep the world in vassalage, as they always have done, without this ready slave, seems now scarce less wonderful than the invention itself. Instead of detracting from the power of the press, the telegraph renders it more powerful than ever. But affairs in Algeria, is not the news splendid? cried the editor. Why do we not all become spahis and win immortality, as some of our generals have? As to immortality, said the secretary, we should have been far more likely to win the phantom as dead men than as living heroes. Debray was at the raising of the siege of Constantine, said Beauchamp, laughing, and knows all about the honors of war. Yes, indeed, and all about the raptures of starvation, of cold and hunger, after victory and the ecstatic felicity of being pursued by six Bedouins, and after having slain five, having my own neck encircled by the Yatagan of the Sixth. "'And how chanced it that you saved your head, Lucien?' asked the Count. "'Save it? I didn't save it. But a most excellent friend of mine, a friend in need, galloped up and saved it for me.' "'Yes,' replied Beauchamp. "'Our gallant friend, Maximilian Morel, the, the captain of Spahis, now colonel of a regiment, and in the direct line of promotion to the first vacant baton, eh, Lucien? A lucky thing to save the head of one of the war office from a Bedouin's yatagan. Up, up, up like a balloon has this young Spahi risen ever since. You are wrong, Beauchamp. Not like a balloon, rather like a planet. Maximilien Morel is one of the most gallant young men in the French army, and step by step, 
from rank to rank, has he hewn his own path with his good saber and a strong hand, nerved by a brave heart and proud ambition, to the position he now holds. His name I see among the immortals in the dispatch of this morning. Well, well, Morel is a splendid fellow, no doubt, but it's a splendid thing to have friends in the war office, nevertheless, who will give that splendor a chance to shine, will plant the lighted candle in a candlestick and not smother its beams under a bushel. Morel has now been in Africa five whole years, said the secretary, a few months only excepted after his marriage with Villefort's fair daughter, Valentine, as was said, when he was indulged with a furlough for his honeymoon. She is not in Paris, asked Beauchamp. No, she leads the life of a perfect recluse with her child, during her husband's absence, at his villa somewhere in the south, near Marseilles, where the department forwards her letters. Yet she is said to be a magnificent woman, remarked the Count. Wonderful, cried Beauchamp, a magnificent woman and a recluse. Oh, but it was a love match of the most devoted species, you must remember. True, she was to have married our friend, Franz Depinay, and died to save herself from that fate, I suppose, and afterwards was resurrected, and blessed Morel with her hand and heart, and the most exquisite person that even a jaded voluptuary could covet. Happy, happy, happy man. Apropos of dying, said the secretary, do you remember how fast people died at Monsieur de Vifo's house about that time? Horrible! A whole family of two or three generations, one after the other. First Monsieur and Madame de saint Morin, then Barois, the old servant of Monsieur Noirtier, then Valentine, and last of all, Madame de Villefort and Edward, her idol. No wonder that Monsieur de Procure de Roy himself went mad under such an accumulation of horrors. By the by, de Bray, is Monsieur de Villefort still an inmate of the Maison Royale de Charenton? I know nothing to the contrary, replied the secretary, who had resumed his paper and to whom the subject seemed not altogether agreeable. He is an incurable. And then to turn the subject, he continued, Apropos of the immortals of Algeria, here is a name that seems destined even to a more rapid apotheosis than that of the favored Morel. You mean Joliet? said the editor, who, in the name of all that is mysterious and heroic, is this same Joliet? I have found it impossible to discover, with all the means at the command of the press. And I, with all the means at the command of the government. All we can discover is this, that he is a man of about twenty-five, that he enlisted at Marseilles, and in less than three years has risen from the ranks to the command of a battalion. His career has been most brilliant. And to whose favor does he owe his wonderful advancement, Beauchamp? asked the deputy, laughing. To that of Marshal Bougot, Governor-General of Algeria, ah, who has indulged him with an appointment in every forlorn hope. Excellent, cried the Count. What more could a man resolve to be a military immortal desire? Immortality the goal, two paths conduct to it, each sure, death, life, the former the shorter, and perhaps the surer, but there is one name I never see in the war dispatches. Do you ever meet with it, Monsieur's editor and secretary? I mean the name of our brilliant friend, Albert de Mosset. The rumor ran that after the disgrace and suicide of the Count, his father, he and his mother went south, and he later to Africa. I have hardly seen the name of Marcel in print since the paragraph headed Yanina in my paper, about which poor Albert was so anxious to fight me. Nor I, said Debray, but where now is Madame de Marcel? Without exception, she was the most splendid specimen of a woman I ever saw. <laughs> High praise that, cried the Count, laughing. Who would suppose our cold, calculating, ambitious, haughty, talented, and opulent diplomat and aristocrat had so much blood in his veins? When before he was known to admire anything, male or female, but himself, or at all events to be guilty of the bad taste of expressing that admiration. Debray is right, replied the journalist somewhat gravely. Madame de Morcerf was indeed a noble and dignified woman, accomplished, lovely, dignified, amiable, 
Stop, stop, in the name of all that's forbearing, be consider of my weak nerves. You too, Beauchamp. Well, she must have been a paragon to make the conquest of two of the most inveterate bachelors in all Paris. But where is this marvel of excellence? Uh, pardon me, Beauchamp, perceiving that the journalist looked yet more grave, and seemed in no mood for bantering or being bantered. Where does Madame de Morcerf at this present time? At Marseilles, I have heard. And is married again? No, she is yet a widow. And is a recluse like Morel's beautiful wife? So says report. They dwell together. How romantic! The young wife, whose hero husband is winning glory amid the perils of war and pestilence, pours her griefs, joys, and anticipations into the bosom of the young mother, who appreciates and reciprocates all because she has a son exposed to the same perils. And both beautiful as the morning. A charming picture. Two immortals in epaulets and sashes in the background are only wanted instead of one. But I must to the chambers. Monsieur Dantes is expected to speak in the tribune this morning upon his measure for the workmen. Do you know, Count, who this Monsieur Dantes really is? asked the Bray. There's a question for a ministerial secretary to ask a member while a journalist sits by. I only know of Monsieur Dantes that he is the most eloquent man I ever listened to. I don't mean that he's the greatest man, or the profoundest statesman, or the wisest politician, or the sagest political economist. But I do mean that for natural powers of persuasion and denunciation, for natural oratory, I have never known his rival. If Plato's maxim that oratory must be estimated by its effects is at all correct, then M. Dantes is the greatest orator in France, for the effect of his oratory is miraculous. There is a sort of magic in his clear, sonorous, powerful, yet most exquisitely modulated voice, and the wave of his arm is like that of a necromancer's wand. You are enthusiastic, Count, observed Beauchamp, but very just. Monsieur Dantes is indeed a remarkable man, and possessed of remarkable endowments, both of mind and body. His personal advantages are wonderful. Such a figure and grace as his are alone worth more than all the powers of other distinguished speakers for popular effect. The eyes of the multitude are more eloquent than their ears, as the English Shakespeare says. I never saw such eyes and such a face, remarked de Bray, but once in my life. Do you remember the Count of Monte Cristo, messieurs? We shall not soon forget him, was the reply, but this man differs greatly from the Count in most respects, though certainly not unlike him in others. True, replied the secretary. In manners, habits, costume, and a thousand other things, there is a marked difference. Besides, the Count was said to be incalculably rich, while the deputy has every appearance of being in very moderate circumstances. But he leads a life so retired that he is known only in the chambers and in his public character. I allude to the deputy's person when I speak of resemblance to that wonderful Count, who set all Paris in a fever, and more wonderful still, kept it so for a whole season. There is, I know, not what in his air and manners that often recalls to me that extraordinary man. There are the same large and powerful eyes, the same brilliant teeth for which the women envied the Count so much, the same graceful and dignified figure, the same peculiar voice, the same good taste in dress, and above all, the same colorless, pallid face, as if, to borrow the idea of the Countess of G, he had risen from the dead, or was a visitant from another world, or a vampire of this. Her celebrated friend, Lord B, she used to say, was the only man she ever knew with such a complexion. But if I recollect rightly, said Beauchamp, the Count of Monte Cristo was somewhat noted for his profusion of black hair and beard. The deputy Dantes is so utterly out of the mode, and out of good taste too, as to wear no beard, and his hair is short. His face is as smooth as a woman's, and he always wears a white cravat like a curé. But he is, nevertheless, one of the handsomest men in Paris, added the Count. At least the women say so. You might add, the deputy has many gray hairs among his black ones, and many furrows on his white brow, while Monte Cristo had neither. Uh, besides, M. Dantes has a handsome daughter, and a son who resembles him greatly, both well-grown, while the Count was childless. 
"'Well, well, be his person and family what they may,' said the secretary, rising. "'I wish to God the ministry could secure his talents. "'I tell you, messieurs, that man's influence over the destinies of France is to be almost omnipotent. "'His powerful mind has grasped the great problem of the age, remuneration for labor. "'The next revolution in France will hinge upon that. Mark the prediction. "'And this man and his coadjutors among whom Beauchamp here is one, are doing all they can to hasten the crisis. The whole soul of this remarkable man seems devoted to the elevation of the masses, the laboring classes, the people, and to the amelioration of their condition. His efforts and those of all like him cannot ultimately succeed, but they will have a temporary triumph, and the streets of Paris will run with blood. These men are rousing terrible agencies. They are evoking the fiends of hunger and misery, which will neither obey them nor lie down at their bidding. And the magicians who have summoned these foul fiends will prove their earliest victims, said Chateau Renan in some excitement. Messieurs, listen a moment, cried Beauchamp, rising. Pardon me, but this discussion must cease, at least here. It can lead to no good result. As the conductor of a reform journal, I entirely differ with you both. But let not political differences interfere with our personal friendship. Come, come, old friends, let us forsake this place, redolent with politics, having a very atmosphere of discussion, and repair to the chambers, taking various on our way. Agreed, cried the deputy and the secretary, and the three left the journalist's sanctum arm in arm. End of section four. Section 5 of Edmond Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 5 Edmond Dantes, Deputy from Marseille. Beauchamp, Lucien de Bray, and Chateau Renaud were not the only persons puzzled with regard to the enigmatical Monsieur Dantes. All Paris was more or less bothered about him. His entire career prior to his appearance at the capital as the deputy from Marseilles seemed shrouded in impenetrable mystery, and this was the more galling to the curious Parisians as his wonderful oratorical powers and his intense republicanism rendered him as the cynosure of all eyes and made him the sensation of the hour. The government had instituted investigations concerning him, but without result. Even in Marseilles his antecedents were unknown. He had come there from the east utterly unheralded, attended only by a black servant, and bringing with him his son and daughter. But almost immediately he had plunged into politics, winning his way to the front with startling rapidity. From the first he had ardently espoused the cause of the working people, and such was his personal magnetism that he had made hosts of admirers, and had been chosen deputy with hardly a dissenting voice. Some of the inhabitants of Marseilles, indeed, remembered a youthful sailor named Edmond Dantes, but they asserted that he had been dead many years, and that the deputy was unlike him in every particular. As the young men passed the Théâtre Francais, on their way to the Chamber of Deputies, after a glass of sherry and a biscuit at Varys, their attention was attracted by a crowd gathered around an immense poster spread upon the billboard. There seemed no little excitement among the throng, a large proportion of whom seemed to be artisans and laborers, and loud expressions of admiration, accompanied by animated gestures, were heard. Nor were there wanting also words of deep denunciation and of significant threatening. "'Down! Down with the tyrants! Bread or blood! Wages for work! Food for the laborer! And other cries of equally fearful significance were audible. "'Do you hear that, Beauchamp?' said Debray quietly. "'Undoubtedly,' was the equally quiet reply. "'Those laborers have deserted the daily toil which would give them the bread they so fiercely demand in order to discuss their imaginary misery.' and denounce those who are richer than themselves. "'But what brings them to the theatre at this hour?' asked Chateau Renaud. 
the new play suggested beauchamp ah the new play the labor of lyons is it not yes said debray and one of the most dangerous productions of the hour it is evidently from the pen of one unaccustomed to dramatic composition yet familiar with stage effect added the journalist and yet without the least claptrap with but little melodramatic power against strong opposition and bitter prejudices and without clackers its own native force and the popularity of the principles it supports have carried it triumphantly through the ordeal of two representations it will doubtless have a long run and its influence will be incalculable in the cause it advocates the cause of human liberty and human right no doubt it will exert a most baneful influence bitterly rejoined debray without containing a syllable to which the ministry can object at least sufficiently to warrant its suppression it yet abounds with principles sentiments and theories of the most incendiary description well calculated to rouse the disaffection of the laboring classes to frenzy its inevitable effect will be to give them a false and exaggerated idea of their wrongs and their rights and to stimulate them to revolution oh these men have much to answer for they are drawing down an avalanche they are the champions of human liberty said beauchamp warmly and will be blessed by posterity if not by the men of the present generation truce to politics messieurs cried the deputy observing that his friends were becoming excited i had heard of this play and its powerful character who's the author beauchamp the production is attributed to monsieur dantes the deputy from marseilles with what truth i know not but he is fully capable of composing such a drama Tomorrow night, it is supposed, the author, whoever he may be, will be compelled by the people to appear and claim the laurels ready to be showered on him in such profusion. But it is nearly three o'clock, continued Beauchamp, and M. Dantes is expected to speak in the early part of the sitting. To the chamber, then, said the others, and the trio mingled with the crowd hurrying in the same direction. "'What a glorious thing is popularity!' exclaimed the Count. "'What a glorious thing to be the champion of the people!' rejoined Beauchamp. "'And how glorious is that champion's glorious career!' cried the secretary. "'Let the hydra alone. "'Like the antique god of mythology, it eats up its own children "'as soon as they get large enough to be eaten. "'It is a fickle beast, and the idol of today it crushes tomorrow.' The hall of the Chamber of Deputies was crowded when the three friends entered. Although the hour for the President to take the chair had not yet arrived, the benches were full, and the galleries, public and private, were overflowing. Strong agitation was visible among the ministerial benches of the extreme left. The Premier himself was present, although his cold countenance, like the surface of a frozen lake, betrayed neither apprehension nor the reverse. Self-reliant, Self-poised, calm, seemingly insensible to surrounding objects and events, this man of iron, with a heart of ice and a brain of fire, glanced quietly and fixedly around him, with his cold dark eye, which from time to time rested on the communist benches of the extreme right, unmoved by the stern glances hurled at him by his many fierce opponents and the almost tumultuous excitement by which they were agitated." At length, President Soze took the chair. The House came to order, and the sitting opened with the usual preliminary business. A large number of petitions from the workmen of Paris for employment by the government were presented and referred, and one immense roll containing a hundred thousand names, which came from the manufacturing districts, was brought in on the shoulders of two men and placed in the area before the President's chair, escorted by a deputation from the artisans. It was received with an uproar of applause from the center of the extreme right of the benches and from the throngs of blouses in the galleries. The tumult having, at length, subsided, the order of the day was announced to be the discussion of the bill introduced by M. Dantes, having for its purpose the general amelioration of the condition of the industrial classes in the kingdom, and M. Dantes was himself announced to be the first on the list to occupy the tribune. A deep murmur of anticipation ran around the vast hall at this announcement. The multitudes in the galleries leaned forward to gain a better view of this idol, 
and to catch every syllable that might fall from his lips, and every eye among the members was turned to the seat of M. Dantes, on the centre right of the benches. A tall figure in black, with a white cravat, rose and advanced to the tribune slowly, amid a stillness as hushed and breathless as the prior excitement had been noisy. In age, M. Dantes seemed about fifty or fifty-five. His form was slight, and his movements were graceful and dignified. His face was livid and as calm as marble, but for the large and eloquent eye, dark as night, one might have thought that broad white brow, that massive chin, those firmly compressed lips and that colorless mouth were those of a statue. Yet in the furrows of that forehead and the deep lines of that face could be read the record of thought and suffering. The busy plowshare had turned up the deep graves of departed passions. No one could gaze or even glance at that face and not perceive at once that it was the visage of a man of many sorrows, yet of a man proud, calm, self-possessed, self-poised, and indomitable. His hair, which had been raven black, now rested in thin waves around his expansive forehead and was sprinkled with gray, while his intellectual countenance wore that expression of weariness and melancholy which illness, deep study, and grief invariably trace. Mounting the steps of the tribune with slow and deliberate tread, he drew up his tall figure, and resting his left hand, which grasped the roll of papers, upon the marble slab, glanced around on the turbulent billows of upturned and excited faces, as if at a loss how to address them. Having read the bill, after the usual prefatory remarks, he began by laying down the platform which he proposed occupying in its advocacy and support, consisting, of course, of abstract, self-evident propositions, which none could have the hardihood to gainsay. Yet, when once admitted, the deductions invariably flowing therefrom none could resist. The propositions seemed safe and indisputable, but the deductions evolved from those propositions were as frightful to the legitimist as they were delightful to the liberal. That each man is born the heir to the same natural rights, that each man, alike and equally with all others, has a birthright of which he cannot be divested, and of which he cannot divest himself, to act, to think, and to pursue happiness wherever he can find it without infringement on the rights of his fellow beings, none were disposed to deny. That each human animal, as each animal of inferior grade, has also the right of subsistence, drained from the bosom of the earth, the great mother of us all, which without his foreknowledge or wish gave him being, seemed also indisputable. But when from these propositions were deduced that crime is rather the result of misery than depravity, and that the office of government is more to prevent crime by creating happiness than to punish it by creating misery, and that for the natural rights resigned by the individual in entering into and upholding the social system, human government is bound to afford employment and subsistence to each of its members, that labor and its produce should be in partnership, that competition should be abolished, and work and wages so distributed by the state as to equalize the condition of each individual in the community, and finally, that the claims of labor are not satisfied by wages, but the workman is entitled to a proprietary share in the capital which employs him, inasmuch as all the woes and miseries of the labor arise exclusively from the competition for work. When these deductions were advanced, the opulent and the conservatives started back in terror and dismay. Distribution of property, universal plunder, havoc, bloodshed, sans culatism, a red republic and the ghastly shapes of another reign of terror rose in frightful vividness before the fancy. As the speaker proceeded to illustrate and sustain his positions, which were those of the communist, socialist, forerist, call them what we may, and poured forth a fiery flood of persuasion, invective, denunciation, and shouts of applause, mingled with cries of rage and dismay, rose from all quarters of the hall. Unmoved and undaunted, that marble man, livid as a specter, his dark eyes blazing, his thin and writhing lip flecked with foam, his tall form swaying to and fro, rising, bending, now thrown back, then leaning over the marble bar of the tribune, continued to pour forth his scathing sarcasm, his crushing invective, his eloquent persuasion, and his unanswerable argument in tones, 
now soft and tuneful as a silvery bell, then sad and pitiful as an evening zephyr, then clear, high, and sonorous as a clarion, then hoarse and deep as the thunder, for a period of four hours, unbroken and continuous, without stop or stay. The effect of this speech, as the orator, pale, exhausted, shattered, unstrung, with nerves like the torn cordage of a ship that is outridden the tempest, descended from the tribune, baffles all description. Fearful of its influence, the Minister of Foreign Affairs at once arose, and in order to divert the attention of the chamber, asked leave to lay before the late dispatches from the seat of war, setting forth the glorious triumph of the French arms in Algeria. This intelligence, which at any other time would have been received with rapturous enthusiasm, was listened to under the influence of a counter-irritant already at work, with comparative calmness, and its only effect was to cause a postponement of the vote on the laborer's bill upon the plea of the lateness of the hour, although not without strenuous opposition from the extreme right. The rejoicing of the galleries at the triumph of their champion and their fierce applause knew no bounds at the close of the sitting, and their idol escaped being borne in his chair to his lodgings only by gliding through a private exit from the hall to the first carriage he could find. "'What think you?' cried Beauchamp, triumphantly, to the ministerial secretary, as they were pressed together for an instant by the excited throng on the steps as they left the hall. "'Think, monsieur,' was the bitter rejoinder of the secretary, whose agitation completely overcame his habitual and constitutional self-possession. "'I think Paris is on the eve of another reign of terror.' Beauchamp laughed, and the friends were drawn apart by the conflicting billows of the crowd." End of section 5section 6 of Edmond Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 6. The Mystery Thickens. Monsieur Dante's wonderful speech was the principal topic of conversation in every quarter of Paris, exciting comment of the most animated description. Of course, the workmen and their friends were delighted with it, and could not find words strong enough to adequately express their enthusiastic admiration for the gifted orator. Those belonging to the government party, on the other hand, denounced the speaker as a demagogue, and the speech as in the highest degree incendiary and dangerous. Strange to relate, whoever spoke of the oration always mentioned the new play, The Labor of Lyons, attributing its authorship to the mysterious deputy from Marseille, and the drama received cordial endorsement or scathing censure according to the political opinions of those who alluded to it. For these reasons, curiosity in regard to M. Dantes ran higher than ever, but instead of decreasing as he became more prominent, the mystery surrounding him seemed only to thicken. Nevertheless, the deputy was the lion of the hour, or rather would have been, had he permitted himself to be lionized. But this he persistently declined to do, holding aloof from society and mingling with none save his political associates, though even to them he was a problem they could not solve. They, however, recognized in him a powerful coadjutor, and with that were forced to be content. The hall of the Chamber of Deputies was last evening thronged to overflowing. It had been understood that M. Dantes was to advocate the People's Bill, and, as usual, it had but to be known that this distinguished orator was to occupy the Tribune to draw out all classes of citizens. Nor was the vast multitude disappointed. A more powerful speech has never been heard within those walls. More than four hours was the audience enchained by the matchless eloquence of this remarkable man, which was received with thunders of applause. A report of this speech will be found under the appropriate head. The new play entitled The Labor of Lyons, recently produced at the Théâtre Francais with triumphant success, and which has caused such a deep and universal sensation, is repeated tonight. There is reason to anticipate that the author, who is supposed to be a celebrated orator of the opposition, may be induced to comply with the call, which will be again renewed, to avow himself. 
such were two paragraphs which the following morning appeared in beauchamp's journal and similar notices of both speech and drama were published in every other opposition sheet in paris in the ministerial organ on the contrary and in all the papers of like political bias appeared the following and similar paragraphs the speech of m dantes last evening in the chamber of deputies was one of the most dangerous diatribes to which we ever listened dangerous for the insidious and sophistical principles it advanced and the almost fiend-like eloquence with which they were urged where are these things to stop at what terrible catastrophe do these men aim what crisis do they contemplate the new drama at the theatre francais called the labor of lyons which is tonight to be repeated is calculated and seems to have been designed by its reckless author to produce the very worst effects among the laboring classes we deeply regret that it has been suffered by the censors to be brought out the multitude called forth by paragraphs like these to witness the new play was of course immense long before the time for the curtain to rise the vast edifice was crowded to its utmost capacity with an eager and enthusiastic assemblage not only were the galleries parquet and lobbies filled with blouses but the boxes were glittering with a perfect galaxy of fashion loveliness and rank conspicuous in the orchestra stalls were the three friends the secretary the journalist and the deputy in a small and private loge in the second tier concealed from all eyes by its light curtain of green silk and its position but himself viewing everything upon the stage or in the house sat the author of the play calmly awaiting the rising of the curtain the performance at length began and the piece proceeded to its termination amid thunders of applause which as the curtain finally descended on the last scene of the last act became perfectly deafening accompanied by cries for the author but no author appeared behind the footlights or in the proscenium box and at last the uproar becoming redoubled the manager came forward and in the author's behalf tendered grateful acknowledgments for the unprecedented favor even by a parisian audience with which the production had been received but at the same time entreated the additional favor that they would grant the author's request and permit his name for the present to remain unknown he would however venture to reveal this much that the author was a distinguished friend of the people the earthquake of applause which succeeded this announcement was almost frightful and while the scene was at its height the three friends with great difficulty managed to extricate themselves from the multitude which wedged up the lobbies and to make their escape a friend of the people cried debray bitterly as his coupe containing himself and his companions drove off to Verres. from such friends let the people be saved and they may save themselves from their foes and the play what think you of that cried beauchamp that it is a most able and abominable production eminently calculated to cause exactly the evils which we have this night perceived to excite and rouse the worst passions of the mob and render the masses dissatisfied with their inevitable and irredeemable lot and as dangerous as wild beasts to all whose lot is more favored man has rights as man and men in masses have rights and one of those rights is to know actually what those rights are said beauchamp the most melancholy feature in the oppression of man is his ignorance that he is oppressed enlighten him as to those rights elevate his mind to appreciate and value them and then counsel him firmly and resolutely to demand those rights and quietly and wisely to obtain them ay but will he obey such counsel exclaimed chateau renaud will not the result of such enlightenment and excitement prove as it ever has proved anarchy revolution guilt blood who shall restrain the monster once lashed into madness but you can surely perceive no such design in this play and no such effect rejoined beauchamp in the abstract replied the count this production is unexceptionable most beautiful yet most powerful how it could have been the work of an unpractised pen embodying as it does passages of which the first dramatists of the romantic school might be proud i cannot imagine besides there seems familiar acquaintance with stage effect and the way in which it is produced but that might have been and probably was result of some professional player's suggestions and then the profound knowledge of the human heart evinced its passions motives and principles of action added the journalist 
there seems an individuality a personality in the production which compels the idea that the author is himself the hero that he has himself experienced the evils he so vividly portrays that the drama is at once the effusion of his own heart and the embodiment of his own history can that man be monsieur dantes if it be he cried the secretary there is more reason than ever to call him the most dangerous man in paris what with his speeches in the chamber and his plays at the theatre, all tending to one most unrighteous end, and all aiming to inflame such an explosive mass as the workmen of Paris, he may be regarded as little less than the very agent of the fiend to have accomplished havoc on earth. Yes, strange to say, my dear secretary, said the journalist laughing, you have not yet estimated the tithe of this man's influence for good, or, as you think, for evil. Rumor proclaims him to be as immensely opulent as appearances would indicate him to be impoverished. That his whole soul, as you say, is devoted to the people, with all his wonderful powers of mind and person, is undoubted. That he has availed himself of that grand lever, the press, to accomplish his purposes, be they good or bad, seems equally certain. La Reforme, the New Daily, is undoubtedly under his control, if not sustained by his pen and his purse for it has a wider circulation than all the other Parisian papers put together. It goes everywhere. It seeks the alleys, not the boulevards, finds its way to the threshold of all, whether paid for or not. Ah, cried Debray in great agitation, is it so? And then, not only is the public press subsidized by this man, if report is not even falser than usual, but a whole army of pamphleteers, journalists, literateurs, and students await his bidding, as well as some of the most distinguished novelists and dramatists of the nation and age. "'My God!' exclaimed the Count. "'Can this be so?' "'Nay, nay,' replied Beauchamp. "'I make no assertions. I merely retail rumors. But what cannot uncounted wealth achieve directed by genius and intelligence?' "'But is this man actually so wealthy?' asked Debray, pale with agitation. "'His manners, dress, equipage, residence and mode of life would indicate just the reverse i know not no one knows said beauchamp it is only known to myself and to a few others that he dwells in the mansion number twenty seven rue de helder formerly the residence of the count de morcerf and that his private apartment is that pavilion at the corner of the court where at half past ten on the morning of the twenty first of may eighteen thirty eight we breakfasted with our amiable friend albert and were met by that remarkable man, the Count of Monte Cristo. I remember that morning well, said Chateau Renaud. Everything, it is said, remains in that one splendid mansion precisely as when it was deserted by the Countess and her son, at the time of the suicide of the Count. Everything except that glorious picture of the Catalan fisherman by Leopold Robert in Albert's exquisite chamber, which alone he took with him. It is strange that a man so opulent as you represent M. Dantes to be should adopt his magnificence at second hand, observed Debray coolly. But I do not represent him as opulent, my dear Lucien, and he certainly is the last man either to invent magnificence or to adopt it. Why, he is as plain in manners and mode as St. Simon himself. His dress you have seen. As to equipage, his only conveyance is a public fiacre. As to diet, household arrangements, and everything else of a personal nature, nothing can be more republican and less epicurean than is witnessed at his house. His study, Albert de Marcef's pavilion, is said to be the only sumptuous apartment in the whole establishment, and that sumptuousness is of a character entirely literary and practical. His retinue consists of three servants, called Baptiste, Bertuccio, and Ali, the latter being a Nubian although fame gives him a perfect army of servitors prompt to execute his bidding. But I will not indulge your skeptical and sarcastic nature. Lucien, with a detail of all that rumor says of this wonderful man, I will only say that all he is and has or hopes for seems devoted to one single object, the welfare of his race. Has he a wife? asked Debray. He is a widower with two children, a young girl called Zuleika, and a youthful son called Esperance. But my acquaintance with him is wholly of a public character. I have never been in his house, 
and very few there are who have been. But here we are. And the coupé stopped at Verri's. End of section six. Section seven of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellery Davidson. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Section 7. Dantes and His Daughter. Even in the immediate vicinity of the Morsef Mansion, number 27 Rue de Held, no one was aware that its new tenant was Monsieur Dantes, the famous deputy from Marseilles. All the neighbors knew was that the palatial edifice had been purchased by a stranger who said he was acting for his master, a man of great wealth lately arrived from the east. No repairs or alterations had been made, while the Morsef furniture was bought with the house, the only new articles making their appearance being several huge bookcases and a number of large boxes evidently containing books, together with a host of traveling trunks filled, as was to be presumed, with the wardrobe of the family. The servants took possession during the day and were duly noted, but how or when the proprietor came could not be ascertained, while after his installation glimpses of him were exceedingly rare. Occasionally, however, a beautiful girl with an oriental look, notwithstanding her tasteful and elegant Parisian attire, would be seen for a moment at the windows, but she invariably vanished on realizing that she was observed. Sometimes a handsome young man stood at her side, but he also seemed anxious to avoid the scrutiny of the curious, although he evinced less timidity than his companion, always withdrawing slowly and with great deliberation. It was after midnight, on the second floor of the pavilion once inhabited by the Vicomte Albert de Marcef was now a spacious library. The walls were lined with tall bookshelves mounting to the lofty ceiling and groaning under ponderous piles of volumes, from the huge black letter folio of the Middle Ages to the lightest duodecimo of the day, while in all parts of the chamber, on the floor, tables and chairs, and in the deep embrasures of the windows were scattered huge masses of papers, pamphlets, manuscripts, and charts. Over the bookcases stood marble busts of Danton, Mirabeau, Napoleon, Armand Carrel, the Duc de Saint-Simon, and other great men whose names are identified with France. Between the windows, looking out on the garden, shrouded in shrubs and creeping plants, hung a full-length and magnificent picture of Foyer. Near the center of the apartment stood a vast table covered with books, papers, manuscripts, and writing materials, beside which stood one of those somber and massive armchairs, on the possession of which the former proprietor had so felicitated himself, bearing on a carved shield the fleur-de-lis of the Louvre, and whose sumptuous and antique embrace had perhaps reposed a Richelieu, a Mazarin, or a Sully. The windows were hung with heavy tapestry of ancient pattern and rich dye, and also the walls, save where covered with books, a soft and summery atmosphere, the warmth of which emanated from concealed furnaces, neutralized the chill of an autumnal night, and the mellow chiaro oscuro of a vast astral diffused its lunar effulgence on all around. Within this chamber was a man, who, with arms crossed upon his bosom, and eyes fastened in profound and seemingly mournful contemplation upon the floor, slowly paced from one extremity of the spacious apartment to the other. This man was Monsieur Dantes, representative of Marseilles in the French Chamber of Deputies. At last, at last, he murmured, the avenging nemesis ceases to gnaw. At length the angel peace begins to smile. The tempest, which for nearly thirty years has raved and swelled in my heart, begins to lull. At length I commence to live. At length I realize and pursue life's true end. Let me reflect, he continued after a pause. Let me review the past. The past, alas, my past is a painful blank. At twenty, from the very marriage feast, from the side of her whom more than life I loved, 
I was torn by the envy of one man and the jealousy of another, and then by the ambition of a third, to whom nothing was crime if it but ministered to the unhallowed impulse, I was plunged into a dungeon whose counterpart only the vault of hell can furnish. For fourteen long years I was the tenant of a somber tomb. The agony, the despair of those awful years. Oh, God, oh, God! And he shuddered and clasped his hands over his head as if to crush the recollection. After a pause he resumed. And then those daily vows of vengeance, oh, vain and impotent vows as then they seemed, vows of awful agony, of fiendish retribution, though at that time I knew not at all. I knew not that a venerable father had pined and died of starvation through the wrong done to me. I knew not that the woman I loved had become the bride of my destroyer. Yet those vows, awful and blasphemous as they were, those vows of vengeance have been terribly, dreadfully fulfilled. As the destroying angel of God's retributive providence, I was endowed with superhuman powers to walk the earth, to administer his justice, and to execute his decrees. For fourteen years was that vengeance prepared, yet delayed. At last it fell. It fell. All who had wronged me met their dreadful doom. Ambition was changed to madness. Avarice was tortured with bankruptcy. Falsehood sought refuge in self-destruction. And all, 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 even the meanest of those who had contributed to blight my life, perished miserably at my will. And did the guilty suffer alone? Alas, impious, remorseless, horrible revenge. The innocent and the criminal suffered alike. A might approaching omnipotence was vouchsafed me, but no power of omniscience to direct my hand or stay its effects. Blind and mad, I knew not what I did. Those I most loved fell beneath the blow which crushed those I most abhorred and shared the same fate. The terrible agencies I had summoned as my slaves became my masters. The fiends, which, as ministers of God's justice, Garbed in the guise of angels of light, I had, by hideous necromancy, evoked to aid me in righteous retribution, proved the dark demons of hell, and derided all orders to accomplish my bidding. The awful engines I had set in motion, I found myself powerless to arrest or control. Effects ceased not with the causes in which they had their origin. The stroke of vengeance, aimed at foes, recoiled on friends, recoiled on myself, and when I fain would stop, when I would arrest the awful havoc which my will had commenced, the dark ministers I had called up howled in my ears, On, 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 vengeance is thine, vengeance is thine. They mocked my terror and laughed at my apprehensions. At last there seemed a pause. Fate appeared to have done her worst, to have executed her decrees. The blind agencies of vengeance blasted no more, because there seemed no more to blast. The misery I had caused I strove to alleviate. The innocent hearts I had crushed I endeavored to heal, rejoicing in the joy I had created and the affection I gratified. Once more I loved. Loved, but, oh, not as I first had loved, not with that deep, adoring, delirious passion of my youth, and yet with the subdued, fraternal feeling I loved in the calm and sweet seclusion of a favored clime, parted from the world with all its miseries and its crimes, environed by all that man or nature could contribute to human bliss. I began to dream of happiness, and the happiness I had created. But alas, I forgot that man's happiness lies not in his own hand, but in the hand of his Maker. I forgot that an omniscient eye pursued me, that a blasphemed and an omnipotent power was over me. The blow paused, hovered, fell, not upon me, not on the guilty, but again it fell on the innocent. And she, who was my only hope, my beloved Hede, my wife, was snatched from my heart, ruthlessly murdered by that fiend, Benedetto. The unhappy man pressed his hand to his forehead, 
and for some time paced the chamber in silence. Then, approaching a small alcove at one extremity of the apartment, he raised the heavy and sumptuous hangings and revealed a small silver casket of exquisite workmanship and appointments that sparkled as the mellow light poured in upon it. Monsieur Dantes knelt beside the ebony table on which this casket rested, and for some moments seemed absorbed in prayer. Then, rising and taking the casket in his hands, he touched a spring, when the lid flew open, disclosing a miniature portrait of Hede, set in a frame of gold, ornamented with flashing diamonds and emeralds. He gazed long and lovingly at this portrait, that seemed designed to show how exquisitely fair God's creatures may be, after which he kissed it reverently, closed the casket, restored it to the table, and slowly dropped the hangings to their place. Resuming his walk, he said, mournfully, But the deepest wound will close, the heaviest grief, the bitterest woe, becomes assuaged. Time, the comforter, soothes and consoles. From this stroke of bereavement I at length awoke, and at the same moment awoke to the conviction that my whole past had been an error, that my life had been a lie, that the years which had succeeded my imprisonment had been more utterly lost than those passed within my dungeon itself, and there came to me the conviction that time, talent, power, and wealth had been worse than wasted, that the wondrous riches, undreamed of save in the wildest flights of oriental fiction, and by a miracle bestowed upon me, were designed for nobler, holier purposes than to subserve a fiendish and blasphemous vengeance for even unutterable wrongs, or to minister to the gratification of pride and the satisfaction of selfish tastes and appetites, however refined and sublimated. I looked around me. The world was full of misery, and the same disposition which had plunged me into a dungeon was crushing the hearts and hopes of millions of my race. My bosom softened by bereavement yearned toward my suffering fellows, and the path of duty, peace, and happiness seemed open to my desolate and despairing heart. Resolution followed conviction. The world was my field. Liberty, equality, and fraternity were my objects. Not France alone with her miserable millions, but Russia with her serfs, Poland with her wrongs, the enslaved Italian, the oppressed German, the starving son of Aaron, the squalid operative of England, the priest-ridden slave of Jesuit Spain, and the oppressed but free-born Switzer. Great men and good men I found had already, with superhuman skill, constructed a system, a machine for the amelioration of mankind's condition, which needed only the cooperation of boundless wealth to set it in motion. That wealth was mine. The common house for the laborer, the asylum for the insane, for the orphan, the Magdalene, the destitute, the sick, the friendless, the deserted, the bereaved, or the asylum for the victim of his own vices, or the vices of others, for the depravity which originates in misery, ignorance, or fate. All these my riches could sustain. Around me, in the accomplishment of this design, the uncounted wealth entrusted to my stewardship has already gathered the mightiest minds in every department of intellect, and the best hearts. And if but a few years are vouchsafed us to carry out the system we have adopted, all Europe, despite her throned and sceptred tyrants, impiously claiming the right to oppress by the will of God, shall be free. Silently but surely, the principle of human liberty is ceaselessly at work, undermining thrones and overthrowing dynasties. The hush that precedes the tornado even now broods over Europe. Nations slumber the heavy sleep that preludes the earthquake. The hour of revolution is at hand, of social regeneration, disenthrallment, redemption over all the world. In every capital of Europe the mine is prepared, the train laid to be lighted, and from this solitary chamber the free thought on the lightning's pinion flies to Vienna, St. Petersburg, Rome, Madrid, Berlin, London, over mountain and plain, over sea and land, through the forest wilderness and the thronged city, taken up by the press, 
it makes thrones totter and tyrants tremble. Tremble at an influence which emanates they know not whence, and contemplates a purpose they know not what, an influence whose mystery they are impotent to penetrate, and whose shadowy but awful right they are powerless to resist. At that instant the silvery tinkle of a bell was heard at the table, and a low and continuous whizzing as of clockwork at once commenced. The deputy advanced hastily to the table. The register of the electric telegraph, like a living thing, was unfolding the secrets of events at that moment, transpiring at the furthest extremity of the kingdom. Eagerly seizing the slip of paper which was gliding through the machine, he glanced over the cabalistic cipher there traced. Lyon, Marseille, Rome, Algeria, he murmured. All goes well. And while the wonderful register, like a thing of life, still whizzed, clicked and delivered its magic scroll, covered with characters unintelligible to all but him, for whose eye they were designed, he touched a spring, and a row of ivory keys resembling those of a pianoforte was revealed. Then rapidly touching them with the fingers of one hand, while he held up before him the endless slip of paper in the other as it was evolved, he transferred its cabalistic contents, character by character, to their distant destination. And when the day dawned on Paris, Berlin, Vienna, and Madrid, the intelligence thus concentrated and thus distributed in that solitary chamber was laid by the press before a hundred thousand eyes, in a language which each could comprehend, for in every capital of Europe unbounded wealth had established a press which groaned in unceasing parturition for human rights, causing princes to tremble and ministers to wonder and grow pale. Over each press, thus set in motion, as if literally by an electric touch, a thousand miles away, presided men of the greatest powers and most varied attainments which philanthropy or covetousness could enlist, while the result of their labors was sown broadcast among the poorest and humblest, without price or compensation, pouring light upon their darkened understandings and giving them knowledge of their rights. Nor was the newspaper press alone active. The Fuiten press was also at work, and magazines, reviews, pamphlets, whole libraries of volumes were flung like sibylline leaves on the four winds of heaven. Fiction, the drama, religion, art, literature, moral and mechanical science, all departments of intellect, silently unseen yet surely exerted their omnipotent influence for the attainment of one single glorious end, the happiness, rights, freedom of man. All this was under the guidance of one powerful mind and benevolent heart, wielding the resistless necromancy of countless and exhaustless treasure. Not a point in all Europe whence influence could radiate and be distributed was there at which this man, in one brief year, had not set in motion the press and the telegraph, those tremendous levers of the age to move the world, and all the more powerfully to move it because oft unseen. Not a court was there of emperor or prince, czar or kaiser, king, duke, or potentate, in which dwelt not his emissary, who suspected, least of all, knew everything that occurred, and, on the lightning's wing, dispatched it to its destination, so that the most important decrees of the cabinet council of Vienna were exposed to the whole world by the Parisian press long before they had been communicated by Metternich to his sovereign. And thus, often, the ruler first learned the purposes of the minister. Not a city or village was there in all Europe which nourished not in its bosom the germ of reform and revolution, while the great principle of association combined, embodied, and concentrated into a focus energies and influences which would otherwise have proved comparatively powerless. The click and buzz of the register ceased. The engine had revealed its secret. The shadowy tell had been caught up as it fell and given to the press of all Europe, thence to be laid before men's minds. Exhausted by the severe mental toil and by the lateness of the hour, the deputy sank back into his armchair and clasped his hands. Glorious, omnipotent science, he exclaimed in low and trembling, yet eager and enthusiastic tones. Wealth must yield in power to thee, for what wealth can rival thy achievements or secure thy results? Thou hast girt the earth with webwork, forced the lightning to syllable the unspoken thought, 
and made man's mind ubiquitous like God's. Ere long thou wilt have knit together with thy magic spells a world of mankind into one vast brotherhood. Monsieur Dantes ceased, and closing his eyes wearily, continued to think over the possibilities of the future. As he sat there motionless and seemingly asleep, a light footfall was heard in the apartment, and his daughter stood before him. Zuleika was now sixteen. Tall and matured beyond her years, she greatly resembled her dead mother, Hede, the beautiful Greek, and the half-oriental costume she wore helped to render the resemblance still more striking. Her abundant hair was the hue of the raven's wing, her feet and hands were those of a fairy, while her large and expressive eyes flashed like diamonds, and her parted lips, as red as rubies, disclosed perfect teeth of the whiteness of pearls. A shade of anxiety settled upon her handsome countenance as she bent over her weary father. The deputy opened his eyes and glanced at her. "'Why are you up so late, my child?' he asked fondly. I thought you were sleeping soundly long ere this. I was waiting for you, Papa, replied Zuleika, in a low, musical voice that sounded like a chime of tiny bells. I could not retire to my couch while you were toiling. Monsieur Dantes pointed to a stool. The young girl brought it and seated herself at his feet. He drew her to his knee, smoothing her tresses gently and affectionately. So you would not desert me, darling, he said with a glad smile. No, indeed, dear Papa, answered she, nestling closer to him. Will you always love me as you do now, Zuleika? asked the father, looking down into the liquid depths of her eyes. Oh, Papa, what a question! What a singular question! said the girl, springing to her feet, throwing her arms round his neck and kissing him again and again. But love of another kind and for another will come along after a while, said the deputy sadly and then you will forget your father. Zuleika blushed and hung her head in maidenly modesty. Then she exclaimed, No, no, Papa, never will I forget you, whatever may happen. Ah, oh, my darling, you know not what you are saying. It is only natural for a woman to cast her father aside and cleave unto her husband. But, Papa, I have not even a lover yet, and besides, I am not a woman. I am merely a little girl and your own true loving daughter. Yes, yes, but you must remember that last year, young as you were then, you attracted marked attention from several youthful Romans of the best families in the Eternal City, and that one of them, that Viscount Giovanni Massetti, went so far as to ask me for your hand. At the mention of Massetti's name, the blush upon Zuleika's cheek deepened. She trembled slightly, but said nothing. Her heart fluttered painfully, but the pain was not altogether disagreeable. The young Viscount was evidently not unpleasing to her. Monsieur Dantes resumed, looking at her fixedly the while. My daughter, as you were then attending the convent school, I felt in my duty to deny Giovanni Massetti's solicitation, nay, his ardent, impetuous prayer, but I did not deprive him of all hope, I gave him permission to urge his suit with you personally, after a year from that time had elapsed. Did I do right? Zuleika maintained silence, but blushed and trembled more than ever, while her heart fluttered so that she placed her hand upon her breast to still it. Come, come, my daughter, answer me, said the deputy kindly. Did I do right? Tell me what your little heart says. I do not know. Oh, I do not know, cried Zuleika, bursting into tears. There, there, now, said her father soothingly. I did not mean either to frighten or wound you. If the Viscount is displeasing to you, I will answer his letter tomorrow, and tell him as gently as possible that he has no hope of winning your hand. What? Have you received a letter from Giovanni? exclaimed Zuleika with sudden interest, her tears vanishing instantly and her pretty face brightening up. Ho, ho, said Monsieur Dantes to himself. Mademoiselle has waked up in earnest now. Then he added aloud, Yes, one came this afternoon. The Viscount is in Paris, and has claimed the privilege I accorded him a year ago, provided you interpose no objection. However, the matter can speedily be settled. Young Massetti is a man of honor, and will not for an instant think of troubling with his attentions a lady to whom they cannot prove acceptable. 
Oh, Papa, Papa, don't tell him that. He wouldn't come here if you did. Besides, did, did, did I ever tell you that Giovanni's attentions would prove unacceptable to me? No, not in so many words, answered Monsieur Dantes archly. But I inferred as much from your manner and tears just now. So I am to understand that you do not want me to reply to the Viscount's letter, am I? Oh, yes, I want you to reply to his letter, but, but, but what, darling? I do not wish you to tell him there is no hope. You think there is hope, then? I, I am afraid so, dear Papa. Yet a moment ago you told me you had no lover, and were merely a little girl. I did not know then that Giovanni was in Paris, and I, I thought he had forgotten all about me. Monsieur Dantes smiled as he said, that makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it, mademoiselle? Yes, answered Zuleika innocently. Then she added in a tone of great earnestness, Write to Giovanni in the morning, and, and tell him I shall be delighted to see him. I will write and inform him that, so far as I have been able to discover, my daughter does not object to receiving a visit from him. Oh, that would be too cold and formal, and Giovanni is such an old friend. Well, well, said Monsieur Dantes, I will so frame my reply as to give entire satisfaction both to you and him. Now, my child, kiss me and retire to your couch, for it is very, very late. Zuleika embraced her father and kissed him repeatedly. Then, with beaming eyes and a countenance overflowing with happiness, she ran lightly from the apartment. As she tripped joyously away, Monsieur Dantes arose from his armchair and gazed after her with a look of the utmost sadness. Oh, my daughter, my daughter, he murmured. Soon will you also quit me, and then I shall be alone, indeed. True, Esperance will remain, but generous, manly, and heroic as he is, he can never fill the void Zuleika will leave. Oh, Hede, Hede, my beloved wife, why were you torn so ruthlessly from your husband's heart? Zuleika's dreams that night were rose-hued and delicious, and in all of them the central figure was the youthful Roman Viscount. When day dawned, Monsieur Dantes was still pacing his library. End of section 7《セクション8》of Edmund Dantes。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellery Davidson. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 8: A Vast Printing House. A street somewhat famous in Paris is the Rue Le Pelletier, famous not for its length for its breadth, for the splendid edifices it exhibits, or for the scenes and events it has witnessed, but famous for the exploits beheld by its neighbors, and the magnificent structures by them displayed. Not that the Rue Le Pelletier can boast no fine edifices, for the Grand Opera House would give the loud lie to such an assertion. And then there is the Foreign Office nearby, the Hotel of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, at the corner of the boulevard and the Rue des Capucines and other noted places. But there is one structure on the Rue Le Pelletier not very noticeable, save for its immense size and its ancient and dingy aspect, which has witnessed more scenes and events, and is more important than all its more splendid neighbors put together. This edifice is of brick, five stories in height, and, as has been intimated, is time-stained storm-stained, smoke-stained, and stained, it would seem, by all other conceivable causes of stain, so begrimed and dingy, yet so venerable and imposing does it seem. This vast and ancient pile can be said to represent no order of architecture. Architectural elegance appears not to have been thought of when it was designed, and yet the façade of the old building seems to bear the same relation to the building itself as the face of an old man bears to his body, and that face is full of character, as are the faces of some men, somber, sedate, serious, almost sinister in aspect. This old face, too, seemed full of apertures, through which unceasing and sleepless espionage could be kept up on the good citizens of the good city of Paris. 
doors and especially windows numberless opened and looked upon the street and on a cul-de-sac at one end of the edifice one of the doors opening on the cul-de-sac at its further extremity was broad low dark and sombre like the gates of hell as portrayed by the english bard it stood open night and day if you entered this door and advanced you would immediately find yourself ascending a narrow gloomy and winding flight of stairs having with difficulty groped your way to the top without having broken your neck by having first reached the point from which you started to wit the bottom or your shins by stumbling against the steps having i say accomplished the ascent to the first landing your further passage is effectually stopped by a massive door which resists all your efforts to open it and as you are contemplating the dangerous descent which you now think you are immediately and inevitably forced to make an ivory bell handle against the wall beside the door arrests your attention with the words around it which with difficulty you decipher by the dim light editor's room no admittance followed by the encouraging but somewhat contradictory word ring which doubtless means this if you are a particular friend of the editor or have particular business with him as a journalist ring the bell and perhaps you may be admitted supposing either of these positions yours you ring the bell and immediately you are startled by the tinkling of a small bell in the darkness close beside you and the ponderous door firm as a barricade till then is now opened by unseen hands by the same hand indeed and by the same action of that hand which caused the bell to tinkle you enter the door and find yourself in a corridor or passage long and dark for everything in this building is dark and gaslight is the only light eighteen hours in the twenty-four you find yourself in a corridor i say running the entire depth of the building and bringing you back again toward the rue le pelletier which you left on entering the cul-de-sac to seek the low entrance below as you traverse the endless gallery your attention is arrested by a deep hum as of many voices at a distance with which the entire structure seems pervaded accompanied by a heavier sound which rises and falls with measured stroke this mysterious hum might have been heard when you first approached or entered the building but the silence and solitude of the corridor have caused you to notice it now for the first time and to wonder at its cause now had you the power of those magicians necromancers clairvoyants and demi-devils whether of the flesh or the spirit who at a glance can gaze through massive walls and peer down the chimneys of a great city and who almost without glancing at all can see through partitions keyholes and iron doors your wonder at the cause of these unknown sounds would instantly cease while it would be yet more excited by those causes themselves for the vast building all around you and through which you are passing and which envelops you in its ceaseless hum like the voice of a great city would seem to you nothing less than a leviathan of life and action a titan a frankenstein a mental and material giant with its acoustic tubes like veins and arteries running all over the structure just beneath the surface of the walls and uniting in every apartment with its electric wires like bundles of nerves which having webbed the whole body with network converge into a focus tube and thence pass down into the vaults through the massive foundations and beneath the pavements of the thronged streets of the metropolis and thence rising again to the surface branching on distinct diverse and solitary routes without the suburbs all over europe you would see too the mighty heart of this titan whose heavy heavings you have felt heard and wondered at the press in its subterranean tenement amid smoke and flame the press which like the animal heart receives eventually all that the veins convey to it and flings forth everything in modified form through lungs and arteries tireless and untired in its action never ceasing never resting for as well might a man think to live when his heart had ceased to beat as a printing office exists when the throbbings of its press were no longer felt and as well could a man be supposed to live without breath as a printing office of the nineteenth century without its lungs the steam engine or its breath of life 
the subtle fluid by which it is moved. But to drop metaphor, in the basement of the building you would find the press room with its steam engine, its furnaces, its presses, its dark demi-devils, and ghostly and ghastly gnomes and genii groping or flitting about amid the glare and gloom, begrimed and besmoked, seemingly at work at unhallowed yet supernatural toil, which toil, as if a punishment for sin, like that of Sisyphus, or the daughters of Danae in the heathen Tartarus, was eternal. The press never stops. On the first floor you would perceive the financial and publishing department, in all its endless ramifications, with the separate bureaus for folding, enveloping, mailing, etc. On the second floor, but that you will shortly behold, and it will describe itself. On the third floor you would discover immense magazines of material, paper, ink, of every hue and quality, and type of every known description, and all in quantities seemingly as useless as incalculable. On the fourth and fifth floors you would find the composition rooms, whence fly the winged words all over the world, peopled by its whole army of compositors, while from the long platoons of cases, click, click, click is heard, the sole and unceasing sound which alone in those apartments is ever suffered to fall on the ear. If we add that the entire structure is warmed in winter by heated air, conveyed in tubes from the furnaces of the press, our description will be complete, and we may say such is the printing office of the 19th century in Paris. How changed from that of German Gutenberg or English Caxton, 300 years before. Such is it by daylight. Flood every object and apartment with gaslight, and you have the scene at night. Through all the night, for couriers and dispatches, never cease to arrive, and the journal issues with dawn, and the workmen are relieved by constant and continuous relays. Such an office gives employment to hundreds and bread to thousands. It demands twenty editors, exclusive of their chief, twenty reporters, exclusive of the same number in the commercial and mercantile corps, twenty-five clerks and bureau agents, sixty carriers, twenty mechanicians and margers, sixty folders, twenty pressmen, seventy correctors and compositors, and five hundred distributors, besides a numberless and nameless army of attachés and employees too numerous to be specified. The aggregate compensation of this army is ten thousand francs per day. The annual income is nine millions of francs. The circulation is ninety thousand copies daily, and each number is read by half a million people, and through their influence by half a million more. The daily tax of the government is 9,000 francs. The press has been called the third estate of France. It is not, nor is it the second, nor is it the first. It combines all three. Nay, the power of all three united equals not its tithe, and its position, its rank, royalty itself bows to the press. Ask the history of the past ten years. Point to the man of power or position in the quarter state who owes it not to the press? Where is the statesman who is not or has not been a journalist, or the savant, the philosopher, the philanthropist, the poet, the orator, the advocate, the diplomat, even the successful soldier? The sword and the pen are emblems of the power of France, its achievements and its continuance. Sir Bulwer Lytton says, The pen is mightier than the sword. But I have left you, dear reader, perambulating the dim corridor, so dim that your eyes can hardly decipher, although it is now high noon, the various signs upon the series of doors in the wall on your left, designating the various rooms of the editorial corps, for the editorial department is devoted the second floor of this extensive edifice. The last door in this prolonged series bears the name of the chief journalist. You ring a bell, are bid to enter, and the apartment is before you. Immense windows, rising from the floor to the ceiling, and opening upon a balcony which overhangs the Rue Le Pelletier, afford abundance of light for your eye to detect everything in the room by day, and an immense chandelier with gas burners and opaque shades pouring forth its flood of mellow radiance would facilitate the same investigation yet more at night. Beneath the chandelier is spread the immense oval slab of the table. At it sits a man writing. 
Well, let him write on, at least for the present. Beside him, pile upon pile, pile upon pile, rise papers, wave after wave, flood upon flood, nothing but papers. On the floor beneath his feet, on the table, and under the table before him, behind him, and all around him, naught but papers, papers, rising, rising, as if in wrathful might and stormy indignation, while the very walls are lined with papers in all languages, from all climes and governments, and of every age and dimension, deposited in huge folio volumes, and arranged in huge closets, along one whole side of the room. From the four continents, yea, and from the islands of the sea likewise, has this vast army come. In those tall closets, extending from floor to ceiling, might be found the full files for years of every leading paper in every part of Christendom, affording a treasury of reference, universal, unfailing, exhaustless, of knowledge of every conceivable description rapidly found by means of exact and copious tables of contents. Upon the other side of the apartment extended ranges of shelves from floor to ceiling filled with ponderous tomes in black substantial binding seeming to belong to that class of standard works chiefly valuable for reference as authorities and bearing ample testimony in their wear and tear and their soiled appearance to having been faithfully fingered. No thin, delicate, and perfumed duodecimo is there, resplendent in gold in Russia, with costly engravings on steel, and letterpress in gilt or hot-pressed post. No, the books, the table, the journalist, and the whole chamber bear the dark, stern, toil-soiled aspect of labor, the severe air of practical utility. The only ornaments, if such they can be styled, are busts, the busts of the silver-tongued Vergineau, and a view of his political brothers, the victim Girardin of ninety-two being conspicuous. Here, too, in a prominent niche, is the noble front of Armand Carral, the brave, the knightly, the chivalric, the true republican, the true statesman, the true journalist, the true man, Armand Carral, who, with Adolphe Thier, his associate, sat first in this apartment as its chief, Armand Carrel, who fell years ago before the pistol of Emile Desjardins, a brother journalist, the founder of the cheap press, the hero of scores of combats before and since, yet almost unscathed by all. Such are some of the ornaments of the chief editor's sanctum. At the further extremity of the apartment, the wall is covered with maps and diagrams, as well as charts of the prominent cities and points in Europe and a large table beneath is heaped with books of travel, geographical views, and historical scenes arranged with no regard to order, and seeming to lie precisely as thrown down after having been used. In a word, the whole room bears unmistakable evidence of stern, practical thought. In it and about it display is everywhere scrupulously eschewed. Practical utility is the only question of interest as touching the instruments of an editor, as of those of a carpenter, and the workshop of the journalist bears no inconsiderable similarity to that of the artisan in more respects than one. To each a tool is valuable, be that tool a book or a chisel, only for its usefulness and the facility and rapidity with which it will aid the possessor to accomplish his ends and not for its beauty of form or costliness of material or construction. In one respect only was their variance from this settled custom to be perceived, and that was in that delicate mechanism embodying the triumphs of modern science, which facilitates transmission of thought, and which, by skillful adaptation, made this one chamber of focus to which ideas and feeling in every other apartment of that vast establishment converged, and which enabled one man, without rising from his chair, to issue his orders to every department, from press room to composing room, from foundation stone to the turrets of that tall pile, everything being governed by the will and impulse of a single mind. Indeed, to such an extent is labor-saving carried in the Parisian printing office that the compositor may never have seen the journalist whose leaders he has spent half his life in setting up, for copy, proof, and revise, glide up or down as if by the agency only of magic, and the real actors rarely meet. End of chapter 8
Section 9 of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellery Davidson. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 9 Armand Marast. The journalist who now occupied the editorial chair was seemingly about thirty-five years of age, and one whom the ladies would call a fine-looking man. His stature was about the average, his shoulders broad and his form thick-set. His face was long and thin, his forehead full and capacious, though not high, and was furrowed by thought. His beard, which, like his hair, was black, encircled his chin, and a moustache was suffered to adorn his lip. His dress was black, and a plain stock without a collar surrounded his throat. His eyes were large, black, and piercing, and the expression of his countenance was contemplative and sad. Such is a hasty limbing of the personal outlines of the first journalist in Paris, the chief editor of the chief organ of the democracy in Europe, Armand Marast of Le National. An air of depression, exhaustion, and regret was upon his face as he sat beside the table, with a pen in his hand and paper before him, in a thoughtful mood, as if planning a leader for his journal, of which but a single line was written. Whatever were his reflections, they were evidently far from pleasant, but the single line traced at the head of the paper indicated the source of his uneasiness. It read, Again the House of Orleans Triumphs. Throwing down his pen, he folded his arms and began hastily pacing the chamber. Again the House of Orleans triumphs, he bitterly exclaimed. I, again and again, it is thus forever, and thus forever seems likely to continue. Every measure, however imperative, of the opposition ignominiously fails. Every measure of the government, however infamous, succeeds. And so it has been for twelve years. Ah, what a barren scepter did the three days of thirty place in the hands of the French people. The despotism of a citizen king has been as deadly as that of the restoration, and more insulting. For twelve years his acts have been but a continuous series of infringements upon the rights and insults to the opinions of the men of July. The Republican Party is trampled on. Freedom of the press, electoral reform, rights of labor, restriction of the royal prerogative, reduction of the civil list, all these measures are effectually crushed. The press is fettered, and its conductors are incarcerated. Out of a population of 33 millions, but 200,000 are electors. Out of 460 deputies, one-third hold places under the government, the aggregate of whose salaries would sustain thousands of starving families at their very doors. Paris, despite every struggle of freedom, is, at this hour, a Bastille. The line of fortification is complete. Wherever the eye turns, battlements frown, ordnance protrudes, bayonets bristle. Corruption stalks unblushingly abroad in the highest places, and the frauds of Gisquet, all Paris knows, are but those of an individual. The civil list, instead of being reduced, is every year enlarged. A citizen king receives forty times the appropriation received by the first consul, while his whole family are quartered on the state. The dotation to the Duke of Orleans on his marriage would have saved from starvation hundreds of thousands whose claim for charity far exceeded his. Thank God his own personal unpopularity defeated the dotation designed for the Duke of Nemours. But the appanage were not granted because the king's life was attempted by an assassin. A citizen king, indeed. This man cares only for his own. He would be allied to every dynasty in Europe. His policy is unmixed selfishness. His love for the people who made him their monarch is swallowed up in love for himself. Millions have been wrung from the sweat of toil to accomplish a worse than useless conquest. Thousands of Frenchmen have been sacrificed on the burning sands of Africa, and all for what? That a throne might be won for a boy, a boy without ability or experience, and now the Duke of Omal is Governor-General of Algeria, while hundreds of brave men are forgotten. 
At these last words, which indicated the cause of the present agitation, were uttered by the excited journalist, a door at the further end of the apartment softly opened, and a young man of very low stature and boyish in aspect entered. He seemed, at a first glance, hardly to have attained his majority, though actually he was ten years older. His face was round, yet pale, his lips full, his brow commanding, his eye large, dark, and thoughtful, and his characteristic expression mild and benevolent. He wore a dark frock coat, buttoned to the chin, and a plain black cravat was tied around his neck. The journalist was so deeply absorbed in his meditations that for some moments he seemed unaware that he was no longer alone, and he might have remained yet longer in that ignorance had not the guest approached and exclaimed, Algeria! The journalist raised his head and hastily turned. Ah, Louis, is it you? he said, cordially extending his hand. I'm glad you've come. But why did I not hear you? For two reasons, my dear Amon, said the visitor, seating himself in an editorial chair. One, that I came in by the private entrance, and the other, that you were too zealously engaged in cursing the recent appointment of the king to hear anything short of a salvo of artillery. Ah, that cursed appointment! What next I wonder! Thank God the old man has no more sons to make governors, although he'll never be satisfied till each one of them has a crown on his head, by his own right or the right of a wife. And what care we whom the boys marry, so long as marriage takes them out of France? Montpensier can find favor in the eyes of the Spanish Infanta, Christina's sister, and thus balk England. Be it so, yes, be it so, especially since it can't be helped or prevented. But this affair of Algeria, Louis, is a very different affair, you would say. No doubt, no doubt. As to Algeria, I have always viewed it as a very costly bauble for France, an opera box, as the Duke of Broglie once said, rather too expensive for France. But then it has been a splendid arena for French valor. It has given the rough old Bougeot a marshal's baton, and has made the gallant Le Morcier his sworn foe, a general officer thanks to his own intrepid conduct and the court influence of his brother-in-law, Thiers. In the late dispatch appear the names of some new candidates for advancement, I perceive. You allude to Morel and Joliet, among others, I suppose. Morel has received a regiment, and Joliet is chef d'escadron of Spahis. Luckily for aspirants, and thanks to disease and slaughter, there is no lack of vacancies. The name of Morel I have seen before in Moniteur, but Joliet, who is he? A sort of protege of Bougeot, tis said. He is reported to have enlisted at Marseilles, and in three years has risen to his present position from the ranks. He is of a good family, rumor says, but suddenly reduced by some calamity, he became a soldier. He must be a brave fellow, Armand. As I said before, Algeria has been a fine field for the development of military genius. My chief objections to French conquests are these. They have drained millions from France, which should have been devoted to the cause of labor, and have tended to dazzle the masses with the glory of achievements of French valor abroad. Thus, while thousands of the young and enterprising have been lured away to fill up the ranks and to seek fame and fortune, the minds of those remaining have been withdrawn from their own wrongs, oppression, and suffering, and from efficiently concerting to sustain the measures of their friends for their relief. There is not a race in Christendom so fond of military glory and achievement as the French. Dazzled by this, the people, the masses... The people, the masses, impatiently interrupted the journalist. You know me, Louis. For years you have known me well. For years have we devoted every energy of heart and soul to the cause of the people. And for years, ever since we came to man's estate, have we been equal sufferers in the same cause. Sufferers in the cause of the people of France, in the cause of man, we both doubtless have been, but not equal sufferers. What have been my sacrifices or sufferings, my dear Armand, compared to yours? In that dark hour when Armand Carrel fell, fell by an ignoble bullet in an ignoble cause, fell in bitterness and without a hope for liberty in his beloved France, I felt impelled to come forward and exert myself for the welfare of my race, and endeavor to aid others in filling the gap created by his loss. To France, to my country, did I then, though but a boy, devote myself. France, my country, for such I feel her to be, though I was born in Spain, and my mother was a Corsican. Since that hour my pen has been dedicated to the cause of the people, and the dethronement of the bourgeoisie, and the organization of labor. 
As to sacrifice or suffering, I have sacrificed only my time and toil at the worst. I have not been deemed worthy of suffering even a fine for a newspaper libel, and my paper has never been thought worth suppression. And what have I accomplished, Louis? asked Maras gloomily. My life seems almost a blank. With Armand Carrel, you have for fifteen years been the champion of republicanism in France, and with you, as leaders, has all been accomplished that now exists. When Carrel died, on you fell his mantle. As editor of La Tribune, your boldness in charging Casimir Perrier and Marshal Soule with connivance in Guisquet's scandalous frauds brought upon you fine and imprisonment. Your boldness in patriotism during the insurrection of the 5th and 6th of June, 1832, once more caused your paper to be stopped and your presses to be sealed. In April 34, your press was again stopped, and you, with Godefroy Cavignac, were thrown into Saint-Pelagie, whence you so gallantly escaped, though to become an exile in England. Again in 35, you were sentenced to transportation. So much for sufferings, as to sacrifices, why, you have been utterly ruined by fines. Well, Louis, well, was the sad answer. Granting all this, my sacrifices and sufferings are only the more bitter from the fact of having been utterly in vain, entirely useless. You, Louis, have been wiser than I. Your journal is well named Bon Saint. Possibly wiser was the reply, and possibly less bold. But does not discretion sometimes win what boldness would sacrifice? In rashly struggling for all, we sometimes lose all. Prudence and perseverance, my dear Armand, are invaluable. End of chapter 9section ten of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis edmund dantes by edmund flagg the communists part one at this moment the private door opened, and three men entered the editorial sanctum. Marast quickly turned, and his friend was silent. "'Ha! Albert Flocon Rollin!' he cried. "'Welcome, welcome! Our friend, Louis Blanc, was just about wasting on me a sermon upon patience. But now he'll have an audience worthy of the subject. Be seated and listen!' patience exclaimed flocon well i'm sure we need it that we do in our present low estate echoed rollin albert said nothing but smiled with sarcastic significance when the salutations were over and the party all but merest who restlessly paced the room were seated louis blanc looked around on his friends with a sad smile and continued marist is right messieurs i was indeed preaching patience i was endeavouring to soothe his irritation and chide his depression with a sermon since we are all old friends and fellow sufferers in the good cause and have a common interest in knowing the reasons of failure and the means of triumph i will by your leave proceed ay dear louis go on cried marist kindly but you are the most youthful sage i ever listened to yes louis proceed you look like a cure said rollin laughing i subscribe to louis blanc's creed be it what it may added flocon briskly and so do i said albert gravely in a deep tone of the new visitors ledru rollin was a man of medium stature about thirty-five years of age and dressed in the extreme of the mode his complexion and hair were light his eyes large blue and protruding his mouth prominent and his full cheeks covered with whiskers which like those of marist were closely trimmed and met beneath his chin his head and shoulders were thrown back and his air was bold and independent 
he was a lawyer of talent who had gained celebrity as advocate of the accused on many occasions of state prosecutions flocon was an older man than rollin and his countenance bore the wary vigilant and suspicious look which experience alone gives he was low in stature thick-set and close-knit in figure his eyes seemed always half closed his brow was broad and massive his face was long a moustache was on his lip and his hair was closely cut the outline of his head and the expression of his face seemed those rather of one born on the banks of the rhine than on the banks of the seine so calm and passionless did they appear his dress was plain but neat flocon was the chief editor of la reforme the name of which indicates its character it was this man who in february eighteen hundred thirty three repressed the violence of his partisans and saved the office of the gazette de france yet the very next day published his celebrated letter to the legitimists which for audacity force and pungency was only equalled by the paralyzing effect it produced the fines imprisonments and civil incapacities to which this man had been subjected for assaults upon a government he deemed corrupt for the ten years preceding had been literally numberless albert was a man of fifty or more with a large head square german face and forehead a large hazel eye fixed and unexcitable hair closely cut and beard upon his chin and lip his dress was a long iron-grey frock-coat, buttoned closely to his chin. His face was rather thin, and his complexion bronzed. His name had for years been identified with reform, and though a manufacturer himself, of the class of workmen, being proprietor and chief engineer of a large machine factory at Lyons, he had established and sustained in that city a paper to advocate his principles named la glanus the prosecution of which by the government for libel and the fining and imprisonment of its editor formed an originating cause of the revolt in lyons of april eighteen hundred thirty four for the part played by this man in the revolt thus arising he was sentenced to transportation a penalty afterwards commuted to fine and imprisonment he was a man of few words remarkably few but of deep thought and prompt action and in moments of crisis and emergency a man of unshaken and inflexible nerve to the casual observer he seemed only a silent man or a sullen one astute or stolid in times of peril he was a man of iron but a man of action and passion too moving with resistless might to rouse his powers mental or physical demanded indeed circumstances of unusual import but once roused they were irresistible such were the personages now assembled in the office of le national and of those five men all were connected with the press directly as editor or proprietor save only ledru rollin and he was a writer for law reform as well as an advocate the name of louis blanc's paper was as has been said le bon sens but to return to the narrative and you really wish a sermon from me old comrades with patience as the text ay 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 exclaimed all suppose i add to it this line i find on the paper before me on the table that our good marist has just written as the text for a paragraph which would probably have cost him another fine and imprisonment had the paragraph been completed and published read read cried rollin with your permission armand certainly replied the editor still continuing his promenade again the house of orlan triumphs read louis blanc aloud and is it not true the accursed tyrants vociferated rollin ay 
true was the mild answer alas too true that perfidious house does triumph and for that very reason the fact should never be acknowledged by its opponents rollin shook his head and throwing himself back in his capacious chair folded his arms sunk his chin upon his breast and closed his eyes marist continued his walk flocon remained silent and thoughtful albert gave a significant smile oppose ceaselessly but quietly every act of despotism this bourgeois government may attempt but be the result what it may never admit yourselves discouraged depressed dismayed defeated from every fall rise like antaeus with renewed vigour nor is it wise or prudent in those engaged in a great and glorious cause to provoke danger to brave penalty when nothing of good to that cause can reasonably be expected prudence policy patience and perseverance accomplish more than rashness yet are not inconsistent with intrepidity boldness patriotism and philanthropy the most exalted comrades what says the past the past ten years in whose events we have all so intimately mingled shall i tell you i la histoire de Dion, said flocon we are all sure of being immortal there in that same book of yours eh louis cried rollin opening his large blue eyes louis blanc smiled and continued shall i convince you comrades by the history of the past ten years the scenes we have all witnessed the events we have all deplored the defeats we have all sustained the insulting ovations we have all been forced to behold and the unceasing triumphs and tyranny of the house of orland that had patience and prudence been our motto these defeats and triumphs would never have been witnessed because these premature revolts would never have been made albert bowed and gave his peculiar smile our friend albert smiles and well he may he has had a sad experience in this error of premature outbreaks in april eighteen hundred thirty four he exerted every energy to restrain the revolt in lyons as chief of the Société des droits de l'homme and as the undoubted friend of the operatives but his efforts were futile exasperated urged on by less experienced leaders they were in full tide of revolution and could no more be restrained in their unwise rising than could the mountain cataract in mad career be damned the result was of course defeat most disastrous defeat hundreds of the people perished and our friend was imprisoned and fined for taking part in a movement which he had in vain attempted to quell and then with the certainty of defeat had joined rather than desert the people who trusted and relied on him a noble act cried marist as he paced the room albert quietly smiled but otherwise his countenance remained unmoved and was it not a most noble and a most wise act continued the author of the ten years when our friend flocon by an energetic and eloquent harangue restrained the indignant people from raising to the ground the office of the gazette de france the organ of the duchess of berry and his bitter foe terribly would that rash act have recoiled on us and yet at the same time with this most patriotic and prudent deed before us a wilder measure than even that was adopted and it was quelled only by force you all remember the events in february thirty three eugenie briefot in his corsair alluded jestingly to the mysterious pregnancy of the mother of henry v duke of bordeaux as did every one she then being imprisoned at bay because of her prior conspiracy to place her son on the throne 
and her secret marriage in italy being unrevealed the legitimus of la revenant challenged the illusion was repeated and a second trial and a death ensued le national and la tribune regarding these repeated challenges as a menace to the republicans hurled defiance at the legitimists and demanded twelve distinct rencontres in behalf of as many names of our friends posted at their offices among which those of armand carroll godfrey cavignac and armand marast were conspicuous the challenge is accepted the names of twelve legitimists are furnished armand carroll selects rue labory they fight and carroll is dangerously wounded the police then interfere the affair ends with flocon's terrific and audacious defiance flung down at the whole legitimist and orland parties in the columns of la reform now what to republicans were the quarrels of legitimists and orlanus if we were to be ruled by a king what cared we whether that king were henry the fifth or louis philippe how would the sacrifice of carol marest cavignac or any of those twelve brave men have been repaid or made up and afterwards alas in july of thirty six when armand carroll causelessly assuming a quarrel not his own because of a fancied attempt to degrade the press by rendering its issues accessible by cheapness to the masses was slain in the bois de vincennes by the vulgar bullet of emile de girardin of la presse what reparation to our cause was it that our champion had died like a hero and chateaubriand arago cormenin and peranger wept around his grave alas that inestimable life belonged to his country and his race and not to himself to fling away in an obscure quarrel but we are not all of us armand carols said Rollin and yet to the great cause of human liberty and the amelioration of man's condition to which each of us stands sworn are pledged our lives to hazard that cause by the sacrifice of those lives or by rashly and unwisely attempting its advancement makes us violators of our vows quite as much in reality as if we had become traitors but the instances you cite are those only of individual rashness louis and not of the people or of their leaders acting in concert remarked marist true concert of action has been chiefly needed but i have only to recall the dates and places of our repeated attempts and defeats for the past ten years to convince you all that those attempts were premature and had they not been so they might have been successful that they have frittered away energies which properly concentrated and directed might have achieved a revolution and that while they have betrayed our designs and depressed our friends have enabled our foes insultingly to triumph and caused them to be on the constant qui vive to anticipate our movements what but premature and undigested uprisings were the conspiracy of the bell tower of notre dame in january of thirty two when la national was seized or the disturbances in la vendee or those in grenoble or those in marseilles or those of the rue des prouvaires or those in april during the cholera when casimir perrier died or those of the fifth and sixth of june on the occasion of general lamarque's funeral on pretence of avenging upon the government the affront offered during the obsequies of casimir perrier the victim premier of the cholera for the part taken by la tribune then conducted by marist in this revolt its press was seized and sealed the same was the fate of la quotidienne and the same would have been the fate of la nationale but for its barricades well do i remember the meeting of our friends in this very apartment on the night after general lamarque's funeral the great shade of the venerable warrior seemed among us repeating for our counsel and imitation his last impressive words i die but the cause lives but alas we observed it not doubt 
dissension dismay and despair were in our midst all was dark all was defiance and denunciation crimination and recrimination brother's hand raised against brother armand carroll that night sat in this chair but he was not the man to command his own will or opinions how could he then bring to obedience and concert the conflicting impulses of others armand carroll was a wonderful man his motto like that of danton was this audacity audacity always audacity yet with all the audacity of danton he had little of his firmness an officer under the restoration a conspirator at beefort in arms in spain against the white flag three times a prisoner before a council of war in eighteen thirty he was with tears the founder of this journal but everywhere he carried the exactitude of the camp even in dress manner and bearing he was a soldier lofty haughty seemingly overbearing yet at heart noble and generous and to his friends accessible in the extreme to his military notions nothing could be accomplished without soldiers and for the people to carry a revolution against soldiers seemed to him absurd armand carroll would have been nevertheless a good revolutionist louis said marist but he was a bad conspirator he had no faith in the people no confidence in the efforts of undisciplined and unarmed masses and therein said rollin he greatly erred although we can as yet boast of having accomplished but very little by them ledru added flocon with a meaning smile the masses are easily roused but they don't stay roused and then they often get unmanageable even by those by whose summons they were stirred up they fight well but somehow or other they always get beaten they succumb at last and bow their necks to the yoke lower than ever it is not the people said louis blanc it is we the leaders who are to be blamed we rouse them before we are ready for them before we have prepared them or anything else for a result and then it is not strange that they only rush bravely on to death and defeat we seize on the occasion of a funeral for an outbreak without organization and the cuirassiers of the military escort trample our ranks beneath their horses hoofs but for unusual efforts such would have been the case at the funeral of dulong the deputy who fell in a duel with general bugaud in january of thirty four what were the circumstances asked rollin armand recollects them better than i replied louis blanc the circumstances were these as i remember them said marist general bugaud remarked in the course of a speech in the chamber that obedience is always a soldier's duty what if the order be to become a turnkey asked dulong in allusion to the general's position in relation to the duchess of berry during her pregnancy and confinement at bay armand carroll endeavoured to pacificate but the effort failed they met in the bois de boulogne at ten o'clock in the morning the weapons were pistols the distance forty paces bugaud fired almost as soon as he turned advancing only a few steps his ball entered above dulong's right eye and at six o'clock that evening he was dead there was a splendid ball at the tuileries that night was there not asked flocon there was and this with other things excited in the masses the idea that their champion was the victim of a royalist conspiracy which all the influence of armand carroll and dulong's uncle dupont de l'eure was hardly sufficient to suppress but dupont immediately resigned his seat in the chamber he would sit no longer in a body one man of which he deemed the murderer of a beloved nephew the obsequies were grand armand carroll pronounced the eulogy and two hundred and thirty-four deputies wet the grave with their tears the people were greatly excited and as has been said were with great difficulty restrained by carroll and dupont
had they been suffered to revolt the only result which could have followed would have been a terrific outpouring of their blood furnishing another instance i suppose of the evil of impatience is it not so louis undoubtedly was the reply and only two months after that other instance actually occurred for our warning in the revolt at lyons with which we are all familiar and in which we were all actors most of us to our sorrow this was in april albert's journal la clunus had been seized for libel on the government and the editor fined and imprisoned next a reform banquet of the operatives was forbidden although but a year before garnier pages had been suffered to banquet the lyonnese to the number of two thousand and although at no period had so many gorgeous festivities and public balls been given by the rich royalists as if in premeditated scorn of the banquet prohibited to the poor republicans the result was so prompt as to seem inevitable there was a strike of the operatives an insurrection of the people albert was sent to paris as an envoy to find a man to lead the revolt messrs cabot and pages were deemed too moderate cavignac would go only with cabot lafayette was too feeble but gave his name and letters carroll and marist were not members of the society des droits del homme and albert had been cautioned that carroll was too moderate Tears had denounced La Tribune, and Maris' friends were hiding him from the police. In despair concerning his mission, the envoy was about returning home, when he was sent for to Armand Carroll's house, and Carroll offered to go to Lyons and lead the revolt, provided Godefroy Cavagnac would accompany him. Now these friends had long been at feud, but all private grievances were forgotten in this crisis of the cause, and Albert is just about preceding them in the post-chaise to announce their coming, when, lo, the telegraph says, Order reigns in lions. Here, then, after a terrific slaughter, was recorded another fruitless revolt, because a premature one nay it was infinitely worse than fruitless not only did the republicans utterly fail in their attempts not only were they cruelly crushed by the royal mercenaries but they were openly derided in their defeat and the cause was gloomier than ever the slaughter of women and children in the streets of lyons and on their own hearthstones in the course of this insurrection was hideous and is graphically portrayed in the memorial of our friend ledru rollin as advocate in the matter but as if all this were not enough for our persecuted cause the decease of the great and good lafayette the idol of free men all the world over took place in the following may alas his son went down in clouds his end was dark bitter maledictions quivered on his dying lips he had lived to mourn that july day only three years before when on the steps of the hotel de ville he had with his own hands been called to invest a cold-blooded perfidious selfish and most ungrateful tyrant with royal robes alas there was order in lions lafayette was in his grave peace reigned in paris the house of orleans triumph those were dark days said marist sadly they were dear armand dark indeed for you and your friends for your journal had been suppressed and you were an inmate with cavagnac of saint pelagie once you both bravely and boldly effected your escape more than a year afterwards and fled to england to the most glorious discomfiture of the knaves who put you there cried rollin viva la republique yet messieurs we've all seen dark days and the present is none of the brightest and we've all come together at these old headquarters of liberty just to be unhappy together just to help each other be miserable which in fact is vastly happier unhappiness than being miserable alone at all events that's what i want but it can't always be right I predict a revolution before another ten years shall have rolled round, which shall make immortals of us all. That revolution for which we have been waiting, watching, toiling, and writing, 
lo now these thirteen years and upward for which waiting watching toiling and writing we have some of us been fined who had enough money to pay a fine and others imprisoned and hunted about and persecuted why there's albert and flocon haven't been able to get a franc cleverly warm in their pockets these ten years before forth it was drawn in the form of a fine while as for marist he has the perfect air and bearing of a bandit so often has he seen the inside of a dungeon and our friend albert isn't much better looking as for louis and myself why we never knew what it was to have a franc get warm in our pockets so we escaped having any drawn forth by ministers and they have never thought us worth prosecuting or imprisoning but they may change their minds when louis's book that is to make us all immortal comes out eh louis louis blanc smiled but made no answer well it is only meet i suppose that i should receive my share of the blows said marist i'm sure i'm not very delicate or very ceremonious in bestowing them besides every one of my predecessors has endured the same carroll thomas bastide while poor ruin the proprietor would have been ruined indeed a dozen times with fines but for his enormous profits why this old office has been perfect but for ministers to fire at it has received a dozen fusillades at least but it stands yet and strange as may have been the scenes it has witnessed it will witness yet other and stranger ones and we shall all be witnesses thereof and actors in them too or greatly do i err so be it with all our hearts was the general shout end of section ten Section 11 of Edmund Dante's. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Edmund Dante's by Edmund Flagg. The Communist. Part 2 apropos of state prosecutions against le national said louis blanc that was a most exciting time when ruin was brought by tears before the court of peers for a libel on that most august and erudite body ay and a most liberal honest and honourable conclave the thrice sodden and most solemn knaves and mules cried rollin ruin at the bar demanded armand carroll for his defence continued louis blanc to refuse was impossible but a bitter pill must it have been to tears and Mignet to consent they must have foreseen what came both now in the ministry only four years before both had been in le national tears as a colleague of carroll and Mignet as a collaborateur the files of the journal were produced and lo there stood paragraphs proven to have emanated from the pens of the prosecutors far more libelous and venomous on the august peers than anything ruin had published you all remember the scene that ensued and won't forget it soon no nor shall we soon forget that noble passage in armand carroll's defence said flocon in which he evoked the shade of marshal ney and from the wild excitement that followed one would suppose that it had really risen in the hall bleeding and ghastly and pointing to its wounds like the ghost of banquo to blast his hoary jewelled and noble assassin who seated on those very seats had sentenced him to an infamous doom carroll was instantly stopped but General Exelmans rose in his seat and pronounced the charge true. It was then reiterated with tremendous applause from the galleries. How Carroll escaped punishment for contempt is not known. Ruin was convicted of libel on the peers, of course. His sentence was a fine of ten thousand francs and imprisonment for two years. 
but of what words did this famous libel actually consist asked ledru rollin louis can tell you better than i said flocon why the words were severe enough no doubt replied louis blanc but Thiers and Mignet had themselves expressed the same ideas a hundred times, though in less powerful and pointed language. The passage which seems particularly to have given offence was this, that in the eyes of eternal justice and those of posterity, as well as in the testimony of their own consciences, these renegades from the revolution, these returned emigrants, these men of Ghent, these military and civil parvenus, these old senators and spoiled marshals of Bonaparte, these procureur generals, these new-made nobles of the Restoration, these three or four generations of ministers sunk in public hatred and contempt and stained with blood all these seasoned with a few notabilities thrown in by the royalty of the seventh of august on condition they should never open their lips save to approve their master's commands all this farrago of servilities was not competent to pronounce on the culpability of men seeking to enforce the results of the revolution of july it was not until the commencement of eighteen hundred thirty five i think said marist that ministers opened a general onslaught upon the parisian press le republican was interdicted that year it was then too that the laws against public criers and newspaper hawkers were instituted as far back as thirty-three however roddy had braved all such prohibitions by selling and with impunity too his own paper in the streets in may of thirty-five came on the general prosecution of the press rollin was advocate in the defence there were warm words between armand carroll and his friend dupont the lawyer and there was at one time apprehension of a duel the position of Armand Carroll with Tears, his former colleague, was at that time a singular one, remarked Rollin. Each seemed to be on the constant search for opportunities to exasperate the other. The editor assailed the minister in his columns, and the minister retaliated by an arrest. Carroll censured and ridiculed Tears, though he respected his abilities, and Tears feared and hated Carroll, though he admired his talents. It was about this time that Fieschi exploded his infernal machine at the king, was it not? asked Flocon. Tears arrested Carroll then, I know. It was on the 28th of July of 35, at ten in the morning on the Boulevard du Temple. This was the second attempt on the king's life, the first having been that of Bergeron in November of 33. Carroll was arrested as an accomplice. It was pretended, for every one of these attempts has been attributed to the whole body of the Republicans, while they were utterly ignorant of them until they took place, and then bitterly denounced them. But the government has made capital out of all these insane attempts, and against the opposition too. I've heard it asserted, said Rollin, that the government got up some of those little exhibitions of fireworks for that very purpose. They are quite harmless, so far as the old man is concerned, wonderfully so, and Fieschi was made a perfect fool of, so ridiculously lionized was he by king, court, and ministers. Our friend Marie was advocate for that wretched old man, Pepin, Fieschi's accomplice, more a ghost than a living creature. "'You are entirely right, friend Rollin, said Louis Blanc, "'in the idea that every one of these attempts strengthens the government and recoils on the opposition. No one should so vigilantly and vigorously watch for and suppress such attempts as we. Heaven defend the old despot from the assassin's weapon, as it seems well inclined to do, or the deed will surely be attributed to us.' every unsuccessful attempt at assassination is viewed like an unsuccessful attempt at revolt on the part of the opposition and injures our cause accordingly better never to attempt than never to succeed 
do you think it true louis as was reported asked marist that as soon as the smoke of fieschi's explosion swept off and the old man found himself standing unharmed amid a heap of slain and mangled marshal mortier and colonel Rusak being among the killed his first exclamation was this with ill-conceived gratification now i shall get my appendages and the dotations for the boys nothing is more probable said louis blanc that old man has but one impulse selfishness and but one attachment to his family his family because it is his his purse and family have for years been his sole objects of love to aggrandize his own has been for years his sole end and aim he parcels out the thrones and kingdoms of europe among his children as if it were but a family estate what thoughtful selfishness exclaimed flocon and at a moment too when he had but just escaped an awful death and all around him flowed the blood and lay scattered the lacerated limbs of his faithful servants either dead or dying with groans and shrieks of most agonizing torture and all because of himself how disgraceful that at such a terrible moment his first thought should have been of the few more francs his trembling hand was striving to tear from a people by whom he had already been made the richest man in europe and which the occurrence of this dreadful event might serve to win for him well said rollin whether this event aided to win the appendages and dotations and was so designed or not it is very sure the aforesaid appendages and dotations were secured no wonder that such attempts succeed each other so rapidly one every year at the least when was the next louis that of alibar i think that took place about sunset on the twenty fifth of june thirty six was the reply alibaud discharged a walking-stick gun at the king as he left the tuileries on his way to neuilly at the corner of the port royal that alibaud was a mere boy and a very interesting and intelligent boy too but for some mysterious cause he did not find favour with the court as did fieschi he evidently attempted the assassination from conviction from a feeling of manifest destiny after his failure he only wished to die and to die at once all who have succeeded alibaud have been but vulgar cutthroats. in what year was the insurrection of armand barbus and martin bernard asked flocon that proved most disastrous to our cause that was in thirty nine may i think answered rollin barbus blanqui and bernard were arraigned as leaders marie and myself were advocates for barbus Blanqui was sentenced to death, and Barbus to the galleys for life, but we obtain commutation of penalty for both. "'And where is to be the end of all these things?' asked Marist, gloomily, as he continued pacing the chamber with folded arms, his head resting on his bosom. "'Are the ten years on which we have now entered to be characterized by the fruitless efforts of the past?' are the people of france again and again and again to strike for freedom only to be stricken into the dust and trampled beneath the armed heel of a despot's myrmidons are the streets of lyons paris and marseilles again to be drenched with the life-blood of their dwellers poured out as freely as water and as fruitlessly are we all again for full ten years to toil strive struggle and suffer to be hunted down like the vilest criminals and like criminals plunged into the most pestilential dungeons to be stripped like slaves of our hard-won earnings and to be deprived of the most humble franchises of men claiming it all to be free to be treated with scorn and contumely and to be debarred the exercise of those common rights which like air and water belong to all i say brothers are all these scenes to be repeated during the ten years on which we have now entered as they have been witnessed during the ten years now past you speak sadly armand observed rollin not so sadly as i feel 
i have listened with attention to the recapitulation of the political events of the past ten years in france and most plainly and as sadly as plainly does the result prove that every movement in our cause has been as premature as it has been unsuccessful may we not gather wisdom which shall conduct us to success in the future from the very errors and disasters of the past remarked flocon alas despondingly replied morast what is there in our present to promise a bright future more than was in our past to promise us a bright present our great leaders of another generation have all left us one after another all have dropped into their graves the cold marble has closed over their venerable brows and they rest well yet they died and made no sign of hope on us young inexperienced and rash has devolved their task but the mantle of their power and virtue has not alas descended with that task to aid in its momentous accomplishment general lamarck's sun went down in clouds midnight deeper than egyptian darkness brooded over the delirious deathbed of lafayette armand carroll fell without hope and are we wiser than they how often oh how often have i listened to the words of wisdom that fell from those eloquent lips even as a boy reverently listens to a parent for such was armand carroll to me upon this very spot have i stood in that very chair has he sat that chair which with mingled shame and pride i reflect is now filled by me shame that it is filled in a manner so unworthy of him pride that i should have deemed fit after him to fill it at all in that very chair i say has his noble form reclined when he for hours even from night till the next day's dawn dwelt with sorrowful eloquence upon his country's present and looked forward with gloomy foreboding and prediction for the future it almost seems to me that this mighty shade is with us now and why all this despondency my dear armand remarked louis blanc mildly was it not because our noble and gifted friend was essentially a soldier not a civilian not a statesman not a revolutionist had armand carroll gone to algeria he would have died if died he had not in an unknown duel with an unknown bravo he would have died a marshal of france a bougaud a chauganier a bedeau a cavaignac a clausel a lamoricier carroll had no faith in the masses to achieve a revolution he never believed that they could even withstand a single charge of regular troops much less repel and overcome it not even with barricades asked rollin not even in defence of barricades continued louis blanc regular troops have much to learn added rollin with a significant smile they will see the day ay and we shall see it and rejoice at its coming despite all melancholy prognostications when the people of paris will dictate abdication to the king of the barricades from the top of the barricades the people's throne nor will that event tarry long i doubt it not i doubt it not ledru exclaimed louis blanc rejoiced that one of the youngest and least stable of their number appeared free from the apprehensions of one of the most influential and seemingly most reliable i accept the omen indicated by your enthusiasm but i accounted for the vacillation and distrust of our lamented friend armand carroll by reverting to the fact that he relied entirely on regular troops military skill scientific tactics and severe subordination now all of these belong to our oppressors and none of them to us and inasmuch as he could not perceive that enthusiasm passion for freedom love of country and family and the very wrath and rage of desperation itself sometimes not only supply the place of discipline arms and the knowledge requisite to use them but even enable vast masses to break down and crush beneath their heel the serried ranks of veteran troops he could only despair at the prospects apparently before him 
besides armand carroll like all military men was a man of action not reflection of execution not contrivance a soldier not a conspirator at the head of ten thousand veteran troops he would have charged on thrice their number without discipline with the confident assurance of sweeping them from his path as the chaff of the threshing floor is swept before the blast but with an undisciplined mob as he contemptuously called the masses he would have moved not a step the larger the multitude the less effective and the more impossible to manage he would have deemed it a revolution accomplished by means of the three arms of the military service artillery cavalry and infantry horse foot and dragoons he could readily conceive but a revolution conducted to a successful issue only by means of pikes axes muskets and barricades never to the hour of his death despite the victory of the three days could carroll comprehend besides said flocon it must not be forgotten that armand carroll though a most devoted friend to republicanism was never a member of the society des droits de l'homme was never as we all now are a communist a socialist a fourierist a friend to the labourer no wonder he hoped so little for the people and trusted to accomplish so little through them there can be no doubt that the social principle which republicanism is now unconsciously assuming all over france mildly remarked louis blanc is lending to the cause incalculable strength how terribly impressed with the conviction of the justice of the cause in which they perished must have been the unhappy insurgents of lyons when with this motto on their banner to live toiling or die fighting they marched firmly up to the cannon's mouth and fought and thus fighting fell yet this conviction is not peculiar to the workmen of lyons it pervades all paris all france and needs only to be roused to act with an energy which no human power can resist social republican will be the type of the next revolution in france it must be the french people have been dazzled by the mirage of liberty ever since eighty nine but it has been only a mirage on the last three days of july thirty the people of paris drove out one bourbon to enthrone another true the state is myself was not the despotic motto he assumed as did one of his successors but it was me and my family which has proved equally selfish if not so absolute and far more dangerous to freedom with lafayette and benjamin constant the citizen king they had made quarrelled as soon as on his throne and lafitte and dupont de l'eure his supporters were banished from the court casimir perrier was called to crush the liberals armand carroll assailed the act and urged a republic the national was prosecuted and insurrections followed thus was the revolution of the three days won by the people to be seized and enjoyed by the bourgeoisie the next revolution will be won by the people too but the people will enjoy it and how progresses our principles louis among the people asked marist who had listened attentively to every word that had been uttered never so gloriously as now armand never never has there been such a diffusion of information upon the subject of the rights of labour as now pognier tells me every day that volumes tracts and pamphlets on this topic disappear like magic from his shelves has not the minister a hand in this mysterious disappearance of communist literature asked rollin we all know he is quite frantic on the topic of popular education oh yes we all understand guizot's love for the people his system of education promulgated in eighteen hundred thirty three was so very beautiful that it was almost a pity it was utterly impracticable but guizot has very little to do with pognier's bookshelves or with pognier in any way except to prosecute him from time to time for publishing cormenin's withering tracts designed for the minister himself and yet it would almost seem there was a design to exhaust the market of the publications of our friends 
only the great mass of them go to the provinces and large quantities abroad my own little brochure the organization of work after having fallen stillborn from the press died a natural death and been laid out in state for a year or two on pannier shelves all at once is resurrected runs through half a dozen large editions and is translated into half a dozen languages the same is true of la martine's vision of the future and the same of cormenin's tracts and of the ten thousand brochures on this same subject of communism in all its different shades and phrases and in every variety of size form and style of writing and appearance these publications are adapted to every test and comprehension the workman is suited as well as the savant all this savours of magic even my most sanguine anticipations are surpassed by reality there will never long lack a supply for a demand be that demand what it may a demand for fourier literature has turned all the pens in paris hard at work upon it novelists essayists pamphleteers while the port st antoine the port st martin and all the minor theatres where are found the masses swarm with melodramas farces and vaudevilles on the same subject and none of you have forgotten the powerful play entitled the labourer of lions attributed to monsieur dante's recently produced with such success on the boards of the francais itself and who is this monsieur dante's asked ledru rollin if you will suffer me to interrupt decidedly the most remarkable man in the french chamber of deputies replied marist in powers of natural eloquence i never saw his rival nor is that all added louis blanc unlike most men noted as mere orators he is a sound logician as well as a polished rhetorician as a political economist he has few equals to that subject he seems to have devoted much study while his familiarity with the political history of france and of the times generally all over christendom seems boundless in debate you observe he is never at a loss for fact or argument let the discussion take what direction it may and he has celebrity also as a writer has he not asked ledru rollin the author of the labourer of lions must be a man of distinguished literary genius was the reply better than all said flocon he is devoted heart and soul to the good cause such devotedness to a cause i never witnessed said marist he puts us all to the blush with him it appears a matter of direct individual interest he is perfectly untiring he is like one impelled by his fate love or vengeance could not force onward a man to the attainment of an object more irresistibly than he seems forced and that too without the slightest apparent stain of personal interest or ambition that man appears to me a miracle a pure philanthropist he strives struggles suffers sacrifices and all with the sole object of ameliorating the condition of his race it is indeed wonderful said rollin thoughtfully do you know marist anything of his past history little if anything of himself he never speaks and i can gather nothing from others even his constituents had known nothing of him but a few months before he became their representative in the chamber his popularity with them he owes to his efforts to ameliorate their condition at his own expense he established among them a phalanstery which is now in most successful operation his rich then asked flocon seemingly not to judge from his habits of life replied marist not a man in the chamber is more republican in garb manner equipage or residence than he and yet he may be rich is he married asked rollin he has been i am told said marist but we interrupt you louis you were alluding to the unusual influences now at work for our cause i was about speaking of the newspaper press 
said louis blanc never has there been known such a revolution in favour of reform and communist journals and to none is this better known than to some of ourselves there's flocon's new journal la reforme that has leaped at once into a circulation never before achieved but by long years of toil and enterprise the old national we need but to look around us to be sure was never more prosperous than now while i am free to confess that my journal le bon sens which has been a sickly child ever since its birth has within three months tripled its number of readers or at least its payers the same is in the main true of le monde by la croix la journal du poupel by dubose le courrier francais by chatelain la commerce by bert la minerve by la main la presse by girardine and all the journals in paris which diffuse true ideas upon labour and the rights of the people be they in other respects what they may even the charivari which views the old king and his ministers as fair butts of ridicule perceives a marked increase in its patronage since it commenced that course which sudden popularity naturally excites it to increase of zeal in the same path besides all this an army of new papers aiming to aid the great cause have not only sprung up of late like mushrooms in paris but all over france and even all over europe and so far appear they from interfering with each other's prospects that the more there are the better they seem sustained and the more ably conducted a swarm of new and unknown writers for the press on this great subject seems all at once to have appeared from unseen hiding-places this is very strange louis said marist and yet it is doubtless very true i had observed what you remark myself although i have viewed the movement less hopefully for the cause of the republic than you depend upon it armand said louis blanc smiling that republicanism and socialism are identical terms as much so as communism and despotism are antagonistic terms but how do you account for this wonderful change this unprecedented fever for furrierism asked flocon i don't pretend to account for it at all the merits of the cause have perhaps begun to be properly appreciated unusual efforts have been made by our friends of late whole nations and epochs are sometimes seized with a contagious mania for peculiar species of literature as for everything else but i will hint to you a suspicion which i have recently entertained namely that after all the rapid sale and ready market for every species of fourier literature is not an unerring indication of the amount of reading of such literature or the demand that actually exists of buyers as well as readers individual ones at least as for the journalistic literature that i have learned is without doubt gratuitously distributed to a great extent among the masses but can the masses read the papers asked marist each family house neighbourhood cafe or cabaret at any rate has at least one reader said rollin and all the men women and children have ears to hear if not power to comprehend but some of these papers which i have seen come down in style to the very humblest comprehension can it be asked flocon that there is such a club as a society for the diffusion of social knowledge in paris after the form of that in london instituted by lord henry brougham and his whig coadjutors for the diffusion of general information and so opposed by the tories if there be such an association said louis blanc it has managed to elude all my vigilance thus far and that of the government too for guizot can perceive if no one else can the inevitable effect of all this and he has no idea that the dear people of france shall be educated by any one save himself but actually there seems to me to exist too much unity of purpose and action in this enterprise for it to be the work of an association i should rather suppose one powerful and philanthropic mind at the head of the movement 
were there not two things so plainly opposed to it as to forbid the idea the first being that there is no one man in europe who is rich enough to expend such immense sums upon such an enterprise if he would and the second that there is no man who has the subject sufficiently at heart to do it if he could End of section 11section twelve of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg wait and hope just then a light rap was heard at the private door which marrast immediately hastened to open as if in anticipation of the arrival of a friend a brief and rapid colloquy ensued then m dantes the deputy from marseilles was introduced he seemed acquainted with and to be held in high regard by all present his dress as usual was black with a white cravat and his manner and bearing had all that magnetism and dignity which so deeply impressed those he met i find you in private conference do i not messieurs asked he glancing around with a smile i pray you let me not interrupt i've called but for a moment to speak with monsieur marrast respecting a measure in the chamber and have consented to enter only at his solicitation you are right monsieur dantes replied marrast in supposing us engaged in a private conference and upon matters of deep import though conferences in this office can never be so private or so important as not to derive benefit from the presence and counsel of the deputy from marseilles most true observed louis blanc and so far from intrusion do we view your arrival that we can but consider it most opportune that we have the privilege of referring to you a question on which between us especially between our friend marrast and myself there seems some little diversity of sentiment it would i fear said m dantes be unpardonable arrogance in one so young as i am in the great cause of human liberty to offer counsel to you who are all veterans and most of you little less than martyrs to your enthusiasm but no good citizen will shrink from the responsibility of declaring the results of his reflections on all topics which have reference to the general weal we differ mainly in this said marrast louis blanc attributes the republican failures of the past ten years to prematurity and want of preparation in our attempts and contends that all those reverses may be retrieved by patience and prudence in future while to my mind there is nothing to indicate for the future from the same causes different results than those experienced in the past concert of action said m dantes mildly is always an indispensable requisite in the accomplishment of every enterprise which relies for its success on association or the combined efforts of individuals labouring for a common end yet with all the concert of action which can possibly be attained the best arranged and best digested scheme in the world may be ruined by premature movement of this we surely have sad proof in the history of the past ten years alluded to there is something of truth in the declaration so frequently made that the french people are not yet prepared for freedom if this be so then it is the duty of their friends to prepare them it is folly to suppose that the masses should at first intuitively know all their rights and the best mode of vindicating them this they must be taught and to this end the press should be unceasingly at work not only all over france but all over europe in diffusing correct views upon life and labour and political rights and powers there should be also concert of action among the friends of freedom and clubs should at once be instituted in every city town and village in france which should be in private and intimate correspondence with similar clubs at paris and in all the capitals of christendom 
there should likewise be unity of action introduced among the masses themselves in a city like paris and among a people like the french secret signals can easily be arranged by which at any hour of the night or of the day fifty thousand labourers in their blouses might be concentrated at any point where their presence is required and that too with arms in their hands furnished from secret arsenals and thus would those pitiable slaughters of helpless insurgents like those of sheep in the shambles we have so often witnessed be avoided if nothing besides were gained the people are ever but too ready to pour out their blood and the most difficult and delicate task in our enterprise is after all to restrain them to impress upon them the all-important maxim without which nothing great good or enduring is achieved those three words in which all human wisdom is contained wait and hope and for what are we to wait and hope for which we have not already in vain waited and hope the past ten years asked marast the true hour to strike was the firm answer and that hour when will it come it may come quickly as it will come surely soon or late it cannot be that the revolution of july should continue much longer to result in the solemn mockery it has it cannot be that its friends should much longer be withheld from those by whom it was achieved only to aggrandize one old man and his sons it cannot be that the unmitigated and disgusting selfism of louis philippe and his efforts to ally himself with every crowned head in europe not for the glory of france but for his own will much longer be overlooked or their perils masked the appanages grasped by himself the dotation and bridal outfit of the duke of orleans the dotation sought for the duke of nemours and his appointment as regent during the minority of the count of paris the governorship of algeria bestowed on the youthful and inexperienced omal to the insult of so many brave and victorious generals the naval supremacy to which has been exalted the ambitious joinville and his union to the opulent brazilian princess the effort to unite the young montpensier with the infanta of spain the environment of paris with bastilles with the avowed purpose of fortifying order by turning the ordnance which should protect into injury of destruction an immense standing army the notorious corruption of officials and the audacious dabbling of ministers in the stocks if not the king himself by means of information obtained by the government telegraph and withheld from the people or of information manufactured by the telegraph designed to effect the bourse the unprecedented number of placemen occupying seats in the chamber of deputies yet receiving exorbitant salaries as incumbents of civil offices one man being often in receipt of the salaries of several offices though performing the duties of none the fact that ministers have maintained majorities by unblushing bribery in elections that hardly one man in two hundred is an elector the profligate arts of corruption by which every able man is bought by the court the disgraceful censorship of the press and the drama the enormous appropriations for the civil list wrung out by grinding taxes from the toil and sweat of millions the absurd assumption yet the monstrous power over the press and its conductors of that conclave of hoary dotards called the chamber of peers the utter and most impious disregard of the deprivation and misery of the operative and labourer although arrayed side by side with the insolence and wealth pampered by the taxes torn from themselves the total forgetfulness of the self-evident truth of the right of all men to labour unrestricted by the baleful influences of the competition of capitalists these facts properly urged and set forth by the press from the tribune and in the clubs in connection with due enlightenment of the masses upon their rights as to labour and its reward and the duty of government thereupon could not fail to prepare the popular mind all over france and all over europe for reform for revolution unquestionably 
cried louis blanc such would be the effect and it would not only prepare the people for reform and stimulate them to obtain it but it would make them republicans true republicans american republicans the americans do not plume themselves on the title citizen but they work they dispute little about words but clear their lands they do not talk of exterminating anybody but they cover the sea with their ships they construct immense canals roads and steamers without jabbering at every stroke of the spade about the rights of man with them labor merit talent and honest opulence are honored and rewarded aristocracies such republicans would furnish france more washingtons jeffersons and madisons and fewer robespierres dantons and marats there can be no doubt remarked flossant that the paramount interest in a republic is that of those who work that the labor question is of supreme importance that the profound problem now submitted to the industrial nations of christendom demands satisfactory solution and that the long enduring and most iniquitous miseries of those who toil must cease reform revolution and government which achieve not these achieve nothing they would be worse than useless the measures suggested by our distinguished friends seem to me eminently calculated to attain the consummation we desire a good government must and always will systematically uphold the poor and ever interpose to protect the weak against the strong said louis blanc the state should be tutelary for the ignorant the poor and the suffering of every description we must have a guardian government a government that will accord the aid of that mighty engine credit not to the rich only but also to the poor it must interpose likewise in the matter of industry and exclude that antagonistical principle of competition the poison found of so much virulence violence and ruin our maxim is brothers and in this do we all concur human solidarity and our motto unity liberty equality and fraternity all men are of one family and once thoroughly sensible of this kindred discord hate and selfism will no longer be possible the views advanced said le dru rollin so far as they tend to the elevation of the masses and to popular preparation for reform republicanism or revolution have my most cordial approval but i would beg to ask how long are the people to wait and hope when is to come the hour to strike who can tell said m dantes in his low clear and musical tones at what moment the breath will come which may hurl on its errand of devastation the avalanche which the snows and suns of centuries perchance have been preparing for its awful mission in the stillness of the night-time beneath the clear blue sky of summer or amid the ravings of the midnight tempest its dread march is ordered and in resistless crushing sublimity it begins to move on to accomplish its terrible errand who may predict the precise moment when the earthquake shall rock the tornado sweep the red lightning scathe or the lava flood desolate and who shall tell the day or the hour when the people in their majesty and might shall rise to avenge their wrongs the snowflake falls fleecily on the mountain's top through many a long and silent night a land green as eden smiles over the volcano through many a calm and sunny day the electric flame gathers in the firmament at length when least expected the avalanche sweeps the volcano bursts the red bolt strikes france is the victim of many wrongs which one of them shall prove the last drop in her cup of bitterness we know not france is divided into many political sects and all but one aim at revolution which one of all shall it be to set the ball of revolution in motion the legitimists who consider the duke of bordeaux the rightful heir and louis philippe a usurper the bonapartists who think they evoke the great shade of napoleon in the person of his unworthy descendant or the republicans as for the conservatives let them with guizot at their head uphold themselves if they can and let the dynasties under barreau and tyr overthrow and succeed their factional foes their petty quarrels we care not for nor shall we the communists ever suffer ourselves to be deemed the revolutionary party but the revolution once commenced let us throw ourselves into its torrent and with our thorough perfect and secret organization we cannot fail to shape it most successfully to our own our righteous ends 
the hour when revolution may commence we cannot predict as it is not our policy to start or precipitate it but that hour may come quickly it must come on the demise of louis philippe which event cannot be long delayed and it may be precipitated before nor will france alone be convulsed as the news of that old man's death on the lightning's wing spreads over europe the electric wire will prove but a train passing through repeated mines which one after the other will explode with awful devastation berlin vienna and st petersburg the strongholds of despotism in europe each will totter all but the last will fall the press is powerless on the russian surf russia will be the tyrant's last citadel italy will throw off the austrian yoke and be free gregory the eighth will shortly die a wise far-seeing and benevolent priest named giovanni maria mastai ferretti born at sinigaglia and now a cardinal with the title of s s peter and marcellinus will succeed to the papal see and italy will be a republic genoa venice naples lombardy piedmont and sardinia will be sister yet sovereign states forming one union the constellation of freedom the favourite scheme of napoleon's better days at last achieving reality switzerland with her green hills and her field morgarten her priestly despots expelled shall also be free but i weary you messieurs by no means cried morast cordially clasping m dantes by the hand i have listened in silence to your earnest exposition of the policy you suggest and so truly do i subscribe to it that henceforth i am your disciple and adopt your motto wait and hope for my own but it is nearly two o'clock in an hour the chamber sits and meanwhile messieurs interrupted m dantes i know not that we can better employ ourselves after so protracted a seance than to repair to veille fours this talking is hungry work and listening and thinking which are by far more tedious are still more so so to veille fours the seance nationale is closed cried ladru rollin laughing as the whole company descended the gloomy stairs End of section twelve section thirteen of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg the mysterious prima donna all fashionable paris was excited over the announcement of a new prima donna whose wonderful achievements in italian opera had set even the exacting critics of italy wild with enthusiasm and delight this great artiste was no other than the renowned louise d'armilly she had never before sung in the presence of a parisian audience but her fame had preceded her and it was accepted as certain that her triumph at the academie royale would be both instantaneous and overwhelming she was to assume the role of lucrezia borgia in donizetti's brilliant opera of that name a role in which the enterprising director of the academie royale assured the expectant public that she possessed no equal for weeks every parisian journal had been sounding her praises with unremitting zeal and now her name was as familiar as a household word in all the high society salons where the ladies and their gallants could talk of nothing but the approaching operatic event while in the cafes and on the boulevards an equal degree of interest was exhibited even the masses notwithstanding the political agitation in which they were involved had caught the prevailing excitement and the leaders of the contending parties themselves paused amid their heated discussions to talk of louise d'armilly the career of this young and beautiful artiste had been remarkable her debut had been made at brussels about two years before in company with her brother m leon d'armilly and there as well as at all the theatres of italy la scala argentina and valle they had roused a perfect storm of operatic enthusiasm 
the origin of this young artiste was veiled in the deepest mystery rumour ascribed to her descent from one of the oldest and most respectable families of france and domestic trials among which was a matrimonial misadventure no less than the arrest of an italian prince whom she was about to wed on the bridal night as an escaped galley-slave were assigned as the cause which had given her splendid powers to the stage at an earlier hour than usual for parisian fashion never fills the opera house until the curtain falls on the second act the rue le pelletier was crowded with carriages la pignon with fiacres and the grand batelier and the passages to the boulevard des italiens with persons on foot all hastening toward that magnificent edifice constructed within the space of a single year by debray to replace the building in the rue de richelieu ordered to be raised by the government because of the assassination at its door of the duke of berry in eighteen twenty that magnificent structure which accommodates two thousand spectators with seats among the first in the orchestra stalls were beauchamp and debray whose attention was divided between the stage and the arrivals of splendidly attired elegants in the different loges during the overture all the elite of paris seemed on the qui vive it will be a splendid house observed debray the debutante be she whom she may should feel flattered by such an unexampled assemblage of all the ton of paris orchestra balcony galleries amphitheatres lobbies and parterre were packed every portion of the vast edifice in short was thronged except a few of the loges and banoirs into which every moment brilliant companies were entering who is that tall dark military man with the heavy moustache now making his way into the minister's box asked beauchamp after a pause that man is no less a personage than the governor of algeria eugene cavaignac marshal of camp said debray he reported himself at the war office this morning and is the lion of the house ah cried the journalist and that is the hero of constantine what a frank open countenance and what a distingue bearing and manner you would not suppose all that man's life passed in a camp would you his career has i understand been remarkable said beauchamp very his father was a conventionist of ninety-two a famous old fellow who among other terrible things laid at his door is said to have pawned an old man's life old labadier for his daughter's honour somewhat you remember as francis i spared st valliard's life for the favour of the lovely diana of poitiers his only child his aged mother is yet living a woman of strong mind though seventy and he does nothing without her advice his brother godefroy's name was notorious as that of a powerful republican leader for years before his decease at eighteen eugene entered the polytechnic school at twenty-two he was a sub-lieutenant in the engineer corps of the second regiment in twenty eight he was first lieutenant in france in twenty nine he was captain in thirty four he was in algeria and in thirty nine his cool bold decided but discreet conduct had made him chef de bataillon despite the fact that he had incurred the royal displeasure some years before by a disloyal toast at a banquet in forty he was lieutenant-colonel in forty one marshal of camp and first commander of division of telamine in forty three he was conqueror of constantine at the first siege of which i so nearly lost my own valuable head and he is now governor of algeria after service there of fourteen years and the tall and sinewy man beside him presenting such a contrast to cavaignac with his light complexion gray hair and sullen and not very intelligent expression 
oh that is general bougeaud by some deem the real conqueror of algeria but he is not at all popular with the army his manners are simple and excessively blunt he is a perfect despot with his staff tis said yet he is quite a wag when in good humour and at ministerial dinners can unbend and make himself as agreeable as need be wished his voice is as harsh as a cossack's and in perfect contrast to that of cavaignac which is the richest and most musical you ever heard yet distinct emphatic and impressive bougeaud incurred intense odium with the opposition for his unwarranted severity as jailer of the duchess of berry in thirty four and his killing Dulong in a duel because of a deserved taunt on the subject bougeaud did his duty said the secretary though a man of his nature could hardly perform such a duty with gentleness bougeaud is not a gentleman he knows it and don't try to seem one he is only a soldier but there comes his very particular foe general la mauriciere that magnificent woman on his arm is his wife and the sister of the lady who follows with her husband the ex-minister adolphe thiers what a contrast cried beauchamp the tall and elegant figure of la mauriciere in his brilliant uniform of the spahis half oriental half french with his lovely wife and the low swarthy little ex-minister in complete black with his huge round spectacles on his nose nearly twice the size of his eyes and a wife on his arm nearly double his stature why tears reminds me of a ghoul gallanting a parry and yet that same dark little ex-minister has perhaps in many respects the most powerful mind at all events the most available mind impelled as it is by his restless ambition in all france do you observe how incessantly his keen black eye flashes around the house beneath his huge glasses he seems perfectly aware that every eye in the house is directed toward his loged but is it true that his brother-in-law owes his rapid rise to his influence at court by no means replied debray if there is a man in the french army who has achieved his own fortunes that man is la mauriciere he went to algeria a lieutenant and bravely and gallantly has he attained his present brilliant position it was he who proposed the creation of a corps of native arab troops like the sepoys of british india and he was appointed colonel of the first regiment of spahis our quondam friend maximilian morel has a command in this regiment and is a protege of his illustrious exemplar the hostility between la mauriciere and bougeaud arises i suppose from the latter's detestable disposition his overbearing and dictatorial temper la mauriciere is not a man i take it to be the slave of any one rivalry in africa is thought to have originated the feud remarked debray and political differences in paris to have inflamed it bougeaud is a legitimist and le mauriciere a republican silence cried the musical connoisseurs in the orchestra the curtain rises as the curtain rose a hush of expectation reigned over the audience the hum and bustle ceased and silence most profound succeeded the appearance of the fair cantatrice was the signal for such a reception as only a parisian audience can give and the first strains that issued from her lips assured them that their applause was not misplaced and surely never was the dark duchess of ferrara more faithfully personated than by the present artiste this vraisemblance which is so seldom witnessed in the opera seemed to strike every eye her figure was tall and majestic and voluptuously developed her air and bearing were haughty dignified and queen-like her complexion was very dark but perfectly clear her forehead broad and high her brows heavy but gracefully arched her eyes large black and flashing 
her hair dark as night and arranged with great simplicity in glossy bands and her mouth large but filled with teeth of pearl-like whiteness contrasted by lips of coral wet with the spray the entire outline of her face was roman and exhibited in its contour and lineaments even more than roman sternness and decision and its effect was still more heightened by a large mole at one corner of her mouth and the velvet robes in which she was appropriately costumed the scene between the duchess and the spaniard gubetta was received with the utmost applause and the pathos of that between the son and his unknown mother which succeeded touched the audience to tears but when the maskers rushed in and her vizard was torn off and her true name proclaimed and amid her heart-rending wailings the curtain fell on the first act the shouts were perfectly thunderous with enthusiasm the role of Gennaro was performed by the brother of the cantatrice leon d'armilly a young man of twenty of delicate and graceful figure and as decidedly blonde as his sister was brunette nature seemed to have made a great mistake in sex when this brother and sister were fashioned indeed it seemed hardly possible that they could be brother and sister a remark constantly made by the audience and the kindred announced on the bills was generally viewed as one of those convenient relationships often assumed on the stage but having no more reality than those of the dramatis personae themselves a second pasta cried chateau renaud entering the stalls immediately on the descent of the curtain heard you ever such a magnificent contralto saw you ever such a magnificent bust asked beauchamp were it not for a few manifest impossibilities thoughtfully remarked debray i should swear that this same angelic louise d'armilly was no other than a certain very beautiful very eccentric and very talented young lady whom we all once knew as a star of parisian fashion and who the last time she was in this house sat in the same loge where now sit the african generals whom can you mean debray cried beauchamp a certain haughty young lady who was to have married an italian prince but on the night of the bridal in the midst of the festivities the house being thronged with guests and even while the contract was receiving the signatures the prince was arrested as an escaped galley-slave and at his trial proved to be the illegitimate son of the bride's mother and a certain high legal functionary the procureur du roi now at charenton through whose burning zeal for justice the horrible discovery transpired ha exclaimed chateau renaud you cannot mean eugenie danglars daughter of the bankrupt baron whom our unhappy friend morcerf was once to have wed the very same quietly rejoined the secretary but this lady cannot be mademoiselle danglars i say absolutely for many sufficient reasons he quickly added then as if to turn the conversation he hastily remarked ah there are monsieur dantes and monsieur lamartine as usual together monsieur dantes exclaimed the count in surprise looking around impossible and yet most true observed beauchamp in the third loge from the ministers to the right what a wonderful resemblance there is between those men the poet and the deputy one would suppose them brothers the same tall and elegant figure the same white and capacious brow the same dark blazing eye the same raven hair and above all the same most unearthly and spiritual pallor of complexion no wonder m dantes is pale said the count have you not heard of the occurrence of this evening in the chamber m dantes was in the midst of one of his powerful harangues against the government when suddenly in the middle of a sentence he stopped coughed violently several times and pressed his handkerchief to his mouth then taking a small vial from his vest pocket he placed it to his lips and instantaneously as if new life had entered him proceeded more eloquently than ever to the conclusion of his speech i heard something of this said beauchamp 
as he descended from the tribune his friends thronged around him anxious about his health he quieted their apprehensions with his peculiar smile of assurance but i observed that his white handkerchief was spotted with blood and he almost immediately left the chamber that man will kill himself in the cause he has espoused remarked debray see how ghastly he now looks but so much the better for the ministry he is a formidable foe indeed that loge contains the two most powerful opponents of the government and who are those men just entering the box asked beauchamp none other than the two rival astronomers of europe said debray and yet most intimate friends the taller and elder the one with grey hair a dark sharp bedouin countenance and that large wild black eye with a smile of mingled sarcasm and humour ever on his thin lips is emmanuel arago the other the short robust man with fair complexion sandy hair bright blue eye and vivacious expression is le verrier the most tireless star-gazer science has produced since galileo but hush the curtain is up oh it matters not said the count only genero and the spaniard appear in the second act and i have neither eyes nor ears save for the duchess to-night but who are those beauchamp where in the loge on the first tier next to the ministers and directly opposite to that of m dantes ah two officers of the spahis and two most exquisite women exclaimed debray they belong doubtless to the african party in the minister's loge your lorgnette count what a splendid woman hardly had the secretary raised the glass to his eyes before he dropped it with the exclamation a miracle a miracle what cried both of the other young men turning to the box at which debray was gazing messieurs do you remember the fair valentine de villefort whose untimely and mysterious demise all the young people of paris so much bewailed some two or three years ago and whose lovely remains we with our own eyes saw deposited in the saint meron and de villefort vault at pere lachaise one bitter cold autumn evening and there listened most patiently and piously to a whole breviary of mournful speeches declarative of the said valentine's most superlative excellence undoubtedly we remember it well was the reply then behold and never dare to doubt the reappearance of the dead again to the ocular organs of humanity valentine de villefort exclaimed the count after a careful and scrutinizing survey by all that supernatural and more exquisitely lovely than ever then it was true after all the strange story we heard said beauchamp of the young lady's resurrection and marriage to maximilian morel somewhere far away in parts unknown no doubt replied the count for if i mistake not and i'm sure i don't mistake now that i look more closely that stalwart splendid fellow with the broad forehead black eyes and moustache and the order of the legion of honour on his breast to set off his rich uniform of the spahis and on whose arm the fair apparition is leaning is no other than maximilian morel himself the identical man who saved my worthless neck from a yatagan in algeria how dark he's grown said debray no more so than all these african heroes for instance cavaignac and le mauricière but what a splendid contrast there is between the young colonel of the spahis and his lovely bride if such she be he dark as a corsican she fair as an english woman he upright as a poplar she drooping like a willow his hair and eyes black as midnight while her soft languishing orbs are as blue as the summer sky and her glossy ringlets as brown as a chestnut on my word said beauchamp the count grows poetical morel had better keep his beautiful wife out of the way but have you discovered who are the other couple in the box he added to the secretary who had his lorgnette in most vigilant requisition any more discoveries debray a sigh might have been heard as the secretary took his glass from his eye and replied simply yes and who now asked chateau renaud there seems no end to discoveries to-night 
the young man who by his decorations seems a chef de bataillon of the spahis replied debray i cannot make out but be he whom he may he is effectually disguised from his most intimate friends by his luxuriant beard and moustache as for the lady there is but one woman in the world i have ever had the good fortune to behold who could be mistaken for her and that is said beauchamp herself and who is herself lucien asked chateau renaud have you forgotten the countess de morcerf the countess de morcerf the wife of the general who was convicted by the peers of felony treason and outrage in the matter of ali tabelin pasha of yanina said beauchamp and who blew his brains out in despair added the count the same said debray she returned to marseilles with her son albert you remember albert and his strange conduct in the duel with the count of monte cristo one could hardly forget such chivalric generosity such magnificent magnanimity and such sublime self-control as were exhibited by the young man on that occasion said beauchamp it is to be hoped he was not equally forbearing toward the arabs in his african campaigns although as his name has never been seen or heard since he entered the army in all probability he was well well cried the secretary impatiently the countess retired to marseilles and there she is said to have resided in utter seclusion in company only with morel's beautiful wife devoting the vast wealth of the deceased count to philanthropic objects having received it as his widow only with the understanding it should be thus bestowed but the rumour was said beauchamp and indeed i was so assured by m de beauville himself receiver-general of the hospitals at the time that the countess gave all the count's fortune to the hospitals and that he himself registered the deed of gift oh that was only some twelve or thirteen hundred thousand francs said debray three months after her settlement at marseilles in a small house in the allee de Maillon, said to be her own by maternal inheritance a letter came to her from thompson and french of rome stating that there was a deposit in their house to the credit of the estate of the late count of the enormous sum of two millions of francs subject to her sole control and order as the count's only heir in the absence of his son two millions of francs cried the two young men in a breath even so messieurs said debray the story does sound rather oriental but i have reason to know that it is entirely true for i made diligent inquiry about it when last at marseilles and what took you to marseilles lucien asked the count significantly the ministry replied debray with evident confusion colouring deeply but why does not the countess marry again asked chateau renaud surveying her faultless form and face through his glass in the prime of life rich and despite her past troubles most exquisitely beautiful it is strange she don't make herself and some one else happy especially as no one could ever accuse her of having very desperately loved her dear first husband added the journalist why don't she marry lucien how the devil should i know replied the secretary in great confusion you don't suppose i ever asked her the question do you upon my word exclaimed the count laughing i shall begin to think you have if you take it so warmly but hissed the bell the curtain rises we mustn't lose the third act of donizetti's chef d'oeuvre with such a lucrezia for any woman living but it was very evident that much of the magnificent performance of the debutante and her companion in the thrilling scene between the duke and duchess of ferrara and the young captain gennaro was lost to the secretary do you observe beauchamp how strangely fascinated with the new cantatrice seems the young officer of the spahis who accompanies the countess he whispered do but look he sits like one transfixed and the countess seems transfixed also though not by the same object was the reply how excessively pale yet how beautiful she is that plain black dress without ornament or jewel and her raven hair parted simply on her forehead enhance her voluptuous charms infinitely more than could the most gorgeous costume 
heavens what a happy man will he be who can call her his amen said debray and the words seemed to rise from the very depths of his heart but she will never marry some early disappointment even before her union with morcerf has withered her heart and the terrible divorce which parted her from him although she never loved him will keep her single for ever her first and only love is either dead or worse married to another see si, see si, lucien cried beauchamp hurriedly at whom does she gaze so intently and yet so sadly it cannot be lamartine for there sits his lovely young english wife at his side nor can it be old arago nor young le verrier and yet some one in that box it surely is monsieur dantes cried debray impossible that man seems hardly conscious that there are such beings as women his whole soul is in affairs of state his whole soul seems somewhere else just at present exclaimed the secretary bitterly look how dreadfully pale he is said beauchamp and yet his eyes fairly blaze is it the countess he gazes at is it m dantes she gazes at at that moment amid the wild farewell of the mother to her son upon the stage the curtain came down and at the same instant m dantes hastily pressed his white handkerchief to his lips and leaning on the arms of lamartine and arago hastily left the box ha the countess faints cried debray as the door closed on m dantes do they know each other then End of section 13section 14 of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter 13 the italian lover it was early in the evening succeeding the day on which m dantes had answered giovanni massetti's letter zuleika was seated in the vast sumptuously furnished salon of the magnificent morcerf mansion now as the reader already knows the residence of the famous and mysterious deputy from marseilles she sat upon a superb green velvet-covered sofa half reclining in an indolent picturesque attitude behind the sofa and leaning over its back stood a young italian a perfect model of manly beauty his ardent black eyes were riveted on zuleika's blushing countenance with a look of the most profound and enthusiastic adoration while his hand held the young girl's with a gentle loving pressure which was returned with unmistakable warmth the apartment was dimly lighted and huge sombre patches of shadow lay everywhere zuleika and her lover were alone together for some time they seemed too full of happiness to speak but finally giovanni said in a soft flute-like whisper as if unwilling to break with loudly uttered words the delicious spell of his love dream zuleika darling zuleika so you did not once forget me during our long cruel separation never for a single instant giovanni answered the young girl the flush upon her cheek deepening as she spoke her hand tightening about her lovers and her lovely eyes filling with a soft fire but i sometimes feared you had forgotten me you were always present in my mind and in my heart replied the italian in a tone that thrilled her through and through stooping he placed his lips to her forehead and imprinted upon it a long and silent kiss then flushing in his turn he added still holding his head against hers from the very moment of our first meeting you have reigned in my bosom my own my love the queen of my destiny and my life oh giovanni giovanni murmured the young girl i am happy so happy he kissed her again this time upon her upturned lips that with a slight movement almost imperceptibly returned the kiss sending his blood tingling through his veins and causing him to tremble with delight from head to foot 
no longer able to restrain himself he hastily quitted the back of the sofa threw himself down beside her and clasping her in his arms drew her unresistingly upon his bosom once there she did not offer to stir but even nestled closer to him and pillowed her head on his broad shoulder the tumultuous beating of both their hearts was audible amid the unbroken silence that ensued with one hand the viscount tenderly smoothed her silken tresses and his arm tightened around her waist as if he had determined never to release her again your father in his letter of this morning said giovanni finally told me there was hope that you did not look upon my addresses with aversion and that i had his leave to pay court to you and ascertain your wishes from your own dear lips i hastened here this evening and m dantes himself bade me seek you in this salon i came on the wings of love and found all my fondest hopes realized that i possessed your heart as you possessed mine oh tell me zuleika that this is not all a dream for it seems too delicious to be true it is reality giovanni blessed reality answered the young girl in a low voice and do you really love me with all your soul with all my soul giovanni the ardent italian showered a flood of burning kisses upon her forehead cheeks and lips and she quivered like a leaf in his embrace then he said with a shade of anxiety in his tone and your brother esperance is he disposed to look upon me with approval you know that in rome he did not see fit to include me in the number of his friends we had a little difference you will remember and ever afterwards he was cold toward me zuleika shuddered as she recalled the fact that the little difference alluded to had been a violent quarrel that had nearly resulted in a duel between the two young men she had never known the details for both her brother and giovanni had studiously concealed them from her indeed esperance had carefully avoided all mention of the viscount's name ever since the day they had become embroiled was m dantes aware of the trouble between his son and the youthful italian she did not know but at the same time felt firmly persuaded that her father had fully investigated the doings character and family of her suitor and would not have sanctioned a renewal of his addresses to her had he not been perfectly satisfied in every respect she therefore answered i am altogether ignorant as to what esperance thinks of you and cannot say whether he still harbors resentment against you or not but whatever may be his opinion and feelings rest assured that he will never interfere to cause his sister an instant of unhappiness more especially as he knows that my father looks upon you with a favouring eye but how about the coldness existing between us does it still exist on both sides not on mine zuleika not on mine i forgave and forgot all long ago forgave and forgot then esperance must have wronged you he did zuleika and with the proverbial hot blood and headlong impulses of the roman youth i resented that wrong but i could not remain at enmity with the brother of the girl i loved so when i became cooler i sought him out and endeavoured to apologize and he accepted your apology he did not accept it but turned on his heel and left me without a word he evidently thought me a coward and attributed my efforts toward effecting a reconciliation to a desire to escape fighting him but why did you quarrel in the first place what was the cause of the difference between you the young italian hung his head and did not answer zuleika saw that he had grown deadly pale and she felt his hand tremble nervously freeing herself from his embrace the young girl sprang to her feet and faced him giovanni said she firmly tell me the whole story of this painful affair it is imperative that i should know it do you doubt me zuleika do you doubt me he asked bitterly and he buried his face in his hands do i doubt you giovanni no but if you love me tell me all the details of the trouble between my brother and yourself i cannot i cannot zuleika he cried command me to shed the last drop of blood in my veins for you and i will do it without an instant's hesitation but i cannot tell you that terrible tale of deceit treachery and bloodshed he had arisen and was walking excitedly about the salon his pallor had increased and he trembled in every limb zuleika 
stood with folded arms and gazed at him she was calm and her eyes had a look of determination the young man had never before beheld in them it filled him with dismay a few moments ago she had been all love and tenderness a yielding trusting maiden in her lover's arms now she resembled a beautiful amazon bent on achieving a victory whom nothing but unconditional surrender would satisfy the story the story she repeated tell me the story her face was as white as marble and her faultless lips seemed chiselled from stone she looked so beautiful and tempting as she stood there her surpassing loveliness enhanced by the picturesque half oriental half parisian dress she wore that the viscount felt his passion for her redoubled he flung himself at her feet and seizing the hem of her superb robe kissed it rapturously oh zuleika zuleika he cried utterly unable to restrain himself i am your slave place your tiny foot upon my neck and crush me where i lie i shall expire adoring you giovanni replied zuleika greatly moved by this display of devotion rise and be a man the italian sprang up as if he had been struck by a thunderbolt then he endeavoured to clasp her in his arms but she quietly repulsed him zuleika cried he sadly you do not love me you never loved me i have been the victim of a cruel deception if you think so answered the young girl quietly there is but one course you can pursue as a man of honour spurn the deceiver from you and never look upon her face again the young man gazed at her reproachfully what have i done to turn you thus against me he asked his tone suddenly becoming humble what have you done you refuse to reveal this mystery to me which as you yourself admit involves deceit treachery and bloodshed and which for aught i know has set an indelible stain upon your life i love you truly love you with all the passion of a woman's nature but i must know this history that i may judge whether you are worthy of my love i assure you zuleika that there is no stain upon my life that there is nothing in this history that tends in the least to dishonour me but still i cannot speak then we must separate oh zuleika zuleika do not be pitiless you will drive me mad the young girl touched a bell and ali the nubian appeared monsieur is about taking his departure said she to the faithful servant i leave him in your hands and without a word of farewell to giovanni she swept from the salon like a queen the viscount gazed after her with indescribable sadness pictured upon his handsome countenance then he followed ali put on his overcoat and hat and regretfully left the house End of section fourteen. Section 15 of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 14 The Minute Vials even to the communists with whom he had come into such close contact m dantes the deputy from marseilles remained as much of a mystery as ever marrast though now devotedly attached to him admitted that he was totally unable to fathom either his designs or his methods of accomplishing them while lamartine who was in his company a large portion of the time when questioned concerning him replied that all he knew of m dantes was that he was a firm friend of the cause and an untiring worker in the interest of the weary and oppressed masses debray though he had no tangible foundation for it could not get rid of the idea that the dangerous deputy and the count of monte cristo were one and the same individual but beauchamp with the usual incredulity of journalists scoffed at the notion and chateau renaud derided it whenever it was mentioned in his presence that m dantes had great wealth was however generally admitted though whence it was derived or in what manner it was invested no one could tell 
it was now no longer a secret that he had purchased and resided in the magnificent mansion formerly owned by the count de morcerf in the rue de helder and this circumstance while it vastly augmented the interest attaching to him did not in the least detract from the enthusiasm felt for him by the working classes it was night in a large chamber richly furnished but dimly lighted in the mansion in the rue de helder the same apartment once inhabited by the countess de morcerf motionless and seemingly lifeless with a countenance as pale as alabaster and as still lay m dantes the deputy from marseilles although in the ashy pallor of the lips and brow and the fixed serene almost stern aspect of the immovable face might be read unmistakable evidence of an exhausting and dangerous constitutional shock to the system yet none of that emaciation over which broods the shadow of the angel of death resulting from protracted illness was there to be seen the broad white forehead the raven hair sparsely sprinkled with silver the round temples the delicately pencilled brow encircling like a sable arch the large and almond-formed eye the full calm lip and the chiselled chin and nostril all these were as perfect now as when last before the reader the cheek was perhaps slightly sunken but it could not be more pallid than when last beheld and but for that nameless quietude that rapture of repose as lord byron well expresses it that placid languor which sleeps on the features which illness always creates and which spiritualizes and intellectualizes the most common features the invalid might be supposed to be enjoying the most quiet slumber excepting the invalid there was no one in that chamber save the faithful ali who moved noiselessly about from time to time or sat immovably upon the floor and gazed on his master's pallid face as the silvery tones of the chamber clock tinkled forth the third quarter after ten the door opened and a small dark thin man with large whiskers keen penetrating eyes broad bald forehead thinly covered with grey hair and apparently about fifty years of age briskly entered it was dr orfila a name somewhat known in medical science approaching the bed he placed his fingers upon the sick man's pulse and gazed earnestly on his face for some time in silence strange he at length muttered the most powerful drugs in the most unheard-of quantities are powerless who then is this man whose nature so differs from that of every one else can he so have accustomed his system to poisons that as with the king of pontus they are ineffectual to help or to harm him his constitution must be iron the vitality of a dozen men is in him or he'd have been dead a month ago well it's plain he's no worse if he's no better drugs are useless and he must be left to nature and his amazing constitution this stupor this utter death of all the faculties and senses for so long a time is wonderful fever delirium anything but this death-like trance it seems as if this man had been sleepless all his life before and that now his overwrought brain and heart were compensating themselves for the toil and wakefulness of years could i but excite the nerves for some time the physician gazed in deep thought at the pale face of the unconscious slumberer suddenly turning to the nubian he said to him ali where does your master keep the drugs he has been for years accustomed to take the nubian stared in mute amazement but moved not from his rug ali said dr orfila sternly unless i see and know those drugs this night your master dies the nubian looked anxiously into the face of the physician and then as if satisfied with the scrutiny rose and with noiseless steps left the room in a few moments he re-entered and placed in the physician's hands a small casket of ebony exquisitely worked and studded with gems 
taking it hastily to the shaded lamp upon a table at the extremity of the chamber he attempted to open it but his attempts were vain indeed to all appearances it was a solid block of ebony and its extreme heaviness compared with its dimensions seemed to favour the idea well said the doctor returning the casket after a close scrutiny to the nubian who had followed him ali took the casket and an instantly a portion of the top flew up disclosing within the centre of the cube of ebony a cavity lined with crimson velvet and a dazzling array of minute vials of crystal each filled with a fluid pink blue green and yellow in hue while the contents of several were colourless the nubian had touched a spring concealed in the carving and known only to his master and himself the physician removed the minute vials one after another from their receptacles and held them up to the light on each was a cipher and on no two was the same most of them were quite filled with the fluid contained but some were only half full while one was nearly empty dr orfila looked closely at the cipher upon each vial as he removed it from the casket he then held it to the light to determine its particular hue or shade and sometimes withdrew the crystal stopper ground into the deep mouth touching it cautiously and quickly to his nostril or the tip of his tongue morphia synconia quinia lobelia belladonna narcotina bromine arsenicum strychnos calabrina bruchia ferruginia muttered the savant as he examined one vial after another and replaced it bruchia ferruginia ha brucine i thought as much exclaimed he holding up the vial which showed by being nearly empty that its contents had been used more frequently than those of any of the others how many drops of this is the greatest number your master has ever taken asked dr orfila the nubian who it will be remembered was a mute held up both hands with the fingers outspread and then two other fingers of one of his hands twelve drops cried the astonished physician impossible ali insisted on the assertion and yet it must be so the doctor added that would explain all taking the vial and a minute crystal vessel which he found in the casket he hastily but carefully dropped into the latter thirteen drops then filling the vessel with water he approached the patient who still slumbered heavily on and placed it to his lips for an instant he seemed conscious of the wish of the physician and with an effort the mixture was swallowed then he lay as still and motionless as before returning the vials in the vessel to their places dr orfila closed the casket and gave it to the nubian he then gazed long and anxiously at the torpid slumberer standing at the bedside and watching that marble face at length the clock struck eleven dr orfila started and hastily glanced at his repeater then turning to the nubian who had carried away the casket and having noiselessly returned stood silently beside him he said ali in one hour your master will be in high fever in two hours he will probably be delirious he will then sleep soundly and toward morning will wake i hope in his right mind but terribly exhausted and profusely perspiring at daylight i shall be here you must not leave him for a single instant as you value his life the nubian clasped his hands above his head and bent his forehead almost to the floor if you think necessary however ali send for me before morning the physician gave one more look at his patient pressed his fingers on his pulse placed his palm on his forehead and then taking his hat and cane left the chamber End of section fifteen. Section sixteen of Edmond Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter fifteen The Unknown Nurse when the rumour that m dantes had been taken seriously ill was first circulated throughout paris it caused excitement 
in every quarter of the city filling the communists and workmen with dismay and greatly elating their opponents in the midst of the excitement a strange lady very plainly attired but whose language and bearing gave unmistakable evidence of refinement and aristocratic associations made her appearance one morning at the office of dr orfila and humbly asked permission to nurse his distinguished patient the physician somewhat surprised at such a request from such a woman immediately grew suspicious and demanded an explanation when the lady informed him that she had known the sick man in his youth and was still deeply interested in his welfare she refused to give her name but solemnly assured the doctor that should he grant her petition m dantes on his recovery would be ready to thank him on bended knees convinced at length that no harm was intended the physician gave his permission and the unknown lady was duly installed as nurse she discharged her duties with unflagging devotion and energy satisfying even the exacting nubian with whom she divided the watch at the bedside of the unconscious deputy dr orfila was delighted while esperance and zuleika were overjoyed on on the sleeper still slumbered on one two three four quarters after eleven tinkled in silvery numbers upon the delicate bell of the clock yet the closed eyelids and fixed lips moved not gave no sign but for the light though regular undulation of the chest life itself might seem to have fled for ever yet life was still there how strange the bond which connects vitality with consciousness the body with the soul and yet more strange is that phase of existence in which the one moves on without the other the mind sometimes is all life when the body is dead and oftener still is the body all life when the mind seems gone mind too may frequently act independently not only of the body as in dreams but also of consciousness and of the heart while the body as in somnambulism may act altogether alone on on the slumberer breathed on but he thought not felt not perceived not a revolution an earthquake might heave around him but the convulsive throes of man or of nature would have been as nothing to him the brow would have remained as calm and as cold and the cheek as pale and as still while in all human probability the faithful nubian would have sat as immovable upon his rug at the bedside of his beloved master and have gazed upon him as untiringly with his dark and sleepless eye as the last quarter after eleven sounded followed immediately by the hour of midnight a small door beside the bed noiselessly opened and a female figure in white silently entered the room but not so noiselessly was the entrance effected as to escape the ear of the vigilant ali he glanced hurriedly around then as if familiar with the apparition and anticipating its approach he rose and taking his rug to the further extremity of the chamber again laid himself down like a faithful dog though not now to watch meanwhile the lady quietly approaching the bed gazed long and mournfully at the slumberer's pale yet noble visage then kneeling she buried her face in her hands amid the coverings she was probably forty yet in the full and faultless perfection of her form in her graceful and yielding motions in her statuesque bust rounded cheek and night-black hair she would to the casual observer have indicated hardly the half of that age her figure was tall and dignified yet mobile as a willow her eyes were dark and luminous and in their profound depths slept a world of melancholy meaning her hair was simply parted on a broad forehead and was gathered in heavy masses low on the neck her lips were full and red and when parted exhibited teeth of dazzling whiteness while her complexion which was very dark was yet clear and pure as the hue of the magnolia's petal but that face was pale very pale almost as colourless as that of the quiet sleeper at its side and upon it rested an expression of love unutterable mingled with the sadness of death such was the unknown nurse the countess de morcerf as she again was an inmate of that apartment of which she had once under circumstances how different been mistress such was mercedes the catalan of marseilles again at the side of the man whom all her life she had loved with none to gainsay or forbid 
upon that pale and motionless countenance she gazed long and deeply and oh the world of memory that passed through her mind the world of thought and feeling that centred in that fixed gaze at length clasping her hands upon her forehead her eyes streaming with tears she bowed her face upon the bed from which she had just raised it and long seemed absorbed in prayer roused from this position by some movement of the slumberer she started up and watched him the shaded rays of the dim and distant lamp threw a faint glimmering of light upon the pale countenance but the quick eye of love instantaneously detected a change a slight flush was mounting the cheek and gentle perspiration was distilling upon the brow while a smile played on the mouth suddenly as she gazed those pallid lips moved astonished she listened marseilles beautiful marseilles said the sleeper home of my boyhood home of my heart i come then quickly and sternly came the order let go the anchor furl the sails mate take charge of the ship then the tones changed and a joyful light shot over the face as the lips exclaimed now for my father now for my love mercedes mercedes amazed the fair watcher retained her position and gazed and listened so silently and breathlessly that the quick and audible beatings of her heart might have been numbered mine mine at last continued the dreamer the marriage feast the marriage feast but instantly the expression of the voice and the countenance altered the light of joy was shrouded in clouds arrest arrest me was the exclamation me at my marriage feast a dungeon for me mercedes mercedes my love my wife o oh god it is the chateau d'if despair despair shocked terrified at the terrible energy of these words and the expression of unutterable woe that rested on the countenance of the sleeper the affrighted woman who comprehended but too well the fearful significance of the abrupt and disjointed syllables hastily arose as if to rouse the slumberer from his dream or to call on the nubian for aid but before she could carry the purpose into execution the aspect of the deputy's visage again had changed a dark frown settled on the brow a spirit of fixed resolve contracted the firm lip and dilated the nostril and the word vengeance vengeance in whispers scarcely audible but repeatedly and rapidly pronounced was heard a longer silence than before succeeded at length another change swept over the face and the words free free i am free burst from the lips then they murmured treasure untold wondrous wealth diamonds pearls rubies ingots of gold the mad abbe's dream was reality again the countenance darkened fourteen years in a dungeon for no crime a father dead of starvation a bride the bride of the fiend who has done all this and he a peer of france and his friends a millionaire of paris and the procureur du roi vengeance 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 there was a pause and the dreamer exultingly continued it is done the peer of france is a disgraced suicide the procureur du roi is a madman the banker is a bankrupt the dreamer again paused and his countenance once more changed alas alas man is not god vengeance is mine i will repay saith the lord the innocent suffer with the guilty to avenge a wrong has been sacrificed to life and only misery has been the recompense no more no more no more of this man and man's happiness be henceforth the aim to that be devoted wealth untold the lips ceased to move gradually the high excitement of the features passed away and was succeeded by an expression of sadness and love heyday gone gone to a better world mercedes mercedes oh does she love me yet the long-lost idol of my heart the adored angel of my life come 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 as the dreamer spoke he spread wide his arms when his eyes opened and his long slumbering senses returned mercedes his own mercedes was indeed clasped to his breast mercedes mercedes he faintly whispered ah it was no dream for you are indeed beside me and mine mine for ever thine 
thine for ever was the reply and she clasped his feeble form to her heart as she would have clasped that of a child end of section sixteen section seventeen of edmond dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by mike manalakis edmond dantes by edmund flagg chapter sixteen a notable fate on the night of monday february twenty first eighteen forty eight all paris was at the house of m gautier de rumilly in the avenue de champs elysees m gautier de rumilly was well known as one of the leaders of the extreme left though the confidential friend of M. Odillon Barrault, and the fate was perfectly understood to be a political reunion rather than a social one. All the accompaniments of the most splendid society events of the season were in requisition. Even the brilliant balls given by the opulent citizens of New York were eclipsed in luxury and splendor. There was the streaming of lamps and chandeliers, the swell of enchanting music, the whirl of the fascinating polka, ridawa, or mazurka, while throngs of richly attired and lovely women were constantly enhancing the magnificence of the scene by their arrival. The brilliancy of the occasion was also richly diversified by the presence of an unusually large number of officers of the municipal and national guards in full uniform, as well as of several belonging to the line or the regiments of Algeria. It was about ten o'clock. Within, all was light, life, and loveliness. Without, the winter wind moaned drearily through the leafless trees of the boulevard, and the drifting sleet swept along the deserted streets. It was a wild night. Throughout all Paris seemed going forth a pretentious murmur, like that mysterious moaning of the ocean, which, with mariners, is the prelude of a storm. An ominous whispering, as of many voices, seemed to sink and swell on the sweeping night blast. Then all was still. Again, in the distance, would rise a sharp shout, or the stern, brief word of military command. At intervals, also, one might imagine he heard a deep rumbling, as of heavy ordnance and its tumbrils over the pavements, accompanied by the measured tread of armed men and the clattering hoofs of cavalry horses. Then these sounds died away, and along the narrow streets of Paris again the night wind only swept. The bitter blast howled, and the ominous whispering, as of spirits, rose and fell. It was a strange and stormy night, murky and chilly, while at intervals the cold rain dashed down in cutting blasts. But within the magnificent mansion of Gautier de Rumilly, all was light and loveliness, as has been said. The splendid salons were already thronged, yet crowds of richly attired guests were constantly arriving. "'Ah, Beauchamp, just come?' cried Chateau Renault to his friend as he entered." "'By the grace of God, yes,' said the journalist. "'What a night!' "'What a throng of men and women, say rather,' was the reply. "'Very true. Who's here?' "'Ask who's not here, and your question may be easily answered. "'All Paris is here. "'Women of every age and station, "'and men of all political creeds, "'conservatives, dynastics, legitimists, "'republicans, and communists.' Indeed, this soiree seems to me, and I shouldn't wonder if it were designed so to be, a general reunion of the leaders of all the great parties in France, to compare notes and learn the news. And there is news enough to learn, it would seem. Is M. Dantes here? He is, or was, and his beautiful wife, too, the most magnificent woman in Paris. Morel also is here with his fair bride. And who is that dark, dignified man in the Turkish costume, "'around whom the ladies have clustered so inquisitively?' asked the deputy. "'Why, that's the emir of Algeria, the famous captive of the Duc d'Aumal, was the reply. "'What? Abd el Kadir? How comes he here? "'Oh, as a special favor, I suppose. He has a respite from his sad prison. "'What a splendid beard, and what keen black eyes!' No, his eyes are decidedly gray, but so shaded by his extraordinary lashes that they seem black. They say that he was more distinguished as a scholar in Algeria than as a soldier, statesman, or priest. 
In fact, he is as erudite as an Arab can be, and his library, which is contained in two leathern trunks, accompanied him in all his wanderings prior to his submission. And what think you really induced him to surrender himself? Policy of the deepest character, and worthy of Talleyrand, Metternich, or Nesselrode, if we are to rely on the eloquent speech of Le Morsier in the chamber the other day. I remember Bougot spoke first, and Le Morsier followed. He thought that the Arab courteous leaped into the gulf because, by so doing, he was convinced he could injure French interests more than by his freedom. Well, perhaps he was right. He bids fair to be a hard bone of contention between the opposition and the ministry. If I mistake not, Le Morsier disclaimed all responsibility for accepting the surrender and placed it on the governor-general, the young duke, for whom the ministry is liable. Yes, and Guizot announced that he would send the emir back to Alexandria, could security be given against his return to Algeria. As to the emir's surrender, at which you wonder, the real cause is said to have been not policy, but the universal passion, love. He is an Antony, then, instead of a courteous. So it seems. At the moment when, with incredible efforts, he had effected the passage of the Moorish camp and was off like an ostrich for the desert, the firing of the French, who had reached his daira, struck his ear. Back he flew like a lamio. Twice his horse fell under him dead, twice he was surrounded and seized, and twice, by his wonderful agility, he regained his freedom. At last, perceiving that all was lost, he turned his face again toward the desert and for two days and nights continued his flight but his heart was behind him. Certain of escape himself, he preferred hopeless captivity with her he loved, and he returned. Quite poetical, on my word. Worthy of Saadi, the Arab Petrarch himself, said Chateau Renaud. He is decidedly a great man, that Abd el Kadir. They say he bears his misfortunes like a philosopher, or better, a Turk, unalterably mild and dignified, while his wives and his mother wail at his feet. Every morning he reads the Koran to them, and during the orisons all the windows are open, and a large fire blazes in the center of the room. He is a decided godsend to the quidnooks of Paris. So would be a Hottentot or a North American savage, replied Beauchamp. Rather a different affair this from the ministerial soiree a week ago, I fancy, remarked the editor. Rather. I will confess to you, Beauchamp, I attended that soiree from curiosity to see whether M. Guizot retained his habitual placidity of manner amid the clouds every day thickening around him. And what was the result? Why this? He was as polite and courteous as ever, and the same cold, imperturbable smile was on his thin lip, but he looked careworn, and upon his countenance was an expression of solicitude when it was closely watched, which I never saw there before. Ah, Beauchamp! I envy not the premier. And the guests? asked the journalist. Of guests there were but few, and the spacious salons of the Hôtel d'Affaires Etrangères looked dismal and deserted. The lovely Countess Levin? Even she was absent. And the Countess of Dino? Absent too. The soiree must have been indeed dull without those charming queens of intrigue, as Louis Blanc courteously calls them. But tell me, Count, is the minister really the husband of the beautiful Levin, or is she only his paramour? No one knows. It is certain, however, that the great man devotes to the enchantress every moment he can steal from the state, though to look at him one would hardly suppose him a lover, in any meaning of the term. But who knows? To read his writings, can one imagine a purer man? But then the affairs of Guisquet, Cubieres, Test, and last and worst, Pettit, whose case was before the chamber, do they not betray deplorable lack of firmness or morality? But no more of this. Who is that dark, splendid woman to whom young Joliet seems so devoted? I have seen them together before. Why, you surely have not forgotten Louise d'Armely, the charming cantatrice. She has recently left the boards to the irreparable loss of the opera, having come into possession of an immense inheritance, some millions, it is said, left by her father, who was once a banker of Paris. She is asserted to be very accomplished and very ambitious, and as the young African paladin is thoroughly bewitched by her, and she by him, they will doubtless be matched as well as paired. 
"'Has Lucien been here?' asked the deputy after a pause, during which the young men surveyed the brilliant throngs that passed before them, and returned the salutations of their acquaintances. "'I think not. We have not met, at least,' replied the journalist. "'He can hardly be spared tonight, I fancy. The Ministry have had a stormy day, and are, doubtless, preparing for one still more stormy tomorrow.' "'There was a perfect tempest in the chamber this evening, I understand.' "'Call it rather a hurricane, a tornado. "'Ah, give me the particulars. "'Here, come with me into this corner. "'Unfortunately, I was not present. "'I was busy on the general committee "'for the banquet of the 12th arrondissement, "'tomorrow, at Chalot. "'To avoid all possibility of collusion with the police, "'we resolved, you know, "'not to have the banquet within the walls of Paris. "'And so there is to be a procession "'to the Barrière de l'Etoile.' I have been there since morning, and reached the city only in time to come here. So you see, I am edifyingly ignorant of the latest news. Then I have to inform you that there is to be no banquet after all. No banquet! Why, I thought it was compromised between Guizot and Barreau that the banquet should be allowed to proceed under protest, in order that the question might be brought before the Supreme Court. Such was the purpose, but a manifesto of the banquet committee— drawn up by Marast, it is said, and at all events issued in Le National this morning, declaring the design not only of a banquet, but of a procession, changed everything. The address sets forth that all invited to the banquet would assemble at the Place de la Madeleine tomorrow at about noon, and thence, escorted by the National Guard and accompanied by the students of the universities, should proceed by the Place de Concord to the Arc de Triomphe, at the extremity of the Avenue de champs elysees and thence to the immense pavilion on the grounds of General Chien. Only one toast, reform and the right to assemble, was announced to be drunk, and then a commissary of police could enter a formal protest against the whole proceeding on the spot on which to base a legal prosecution, and the multitude would disperse. A very sensible mode of procedure, quietly remarked the journalist and one eminently calculated to relieve your friend Guizot and my friend Barreau from the awkward dilemma of a direct issue. But so thought not, my friend Guizot. Like his oracle, the sage Montesquieu, he, he thought, who assembles the people causes them to revolt. He took fright at the manifesto, as he was pleased to dignify the simple program in this morning's national, and so early in the sitting it was announced that the reform banquet was utterly prohibited by Monsieur de Lesser, prefect of police, on the express injunction and responsibility of, of Monsieur Duchatel, Minister of the Interior, by and with the advice of Monsieur Hébert, Minister of Justice. Ha! And what said Odilon Barreau? cried the journalist. He, why, he said nothing at all, but immediately retired at the head of the opposition from the chamber. To consult? Of course. An hour after, they returned in a body two hundred and fifty strong, with Barreau at their head, who had once mounted the tribune and denounced the despotism of the ministry in forbidding the peaceful assembling of the citizens, without tumult or arms, to discuss their political rights. Duchatel replied under great excitement. Shall reform committees dare to call out the National Guard at their pleasure? he asked. Will you dare to call out the National Guard? retorted de Corte fiercely. Only try it. The government of France will never yield, rejoined the minister, pale with fury. Speak in your own name, monsieur, shouted Flocon. I shall never speak in yours, was the answer. You play the game of menace, cried Lesseps. The government will never yield, again vociferated Duchatel. Those were the very words of Charles X, observed monsieur Dantes, sternly. The entire left responded in a terrific roar. There is blood in those words, shouted Ledru Rollin. The government will never yield, the Minister of the Interior for the third time vehemently exclaimed, and the right gathered around him. This is worse than Polignan or Baronnet, vociferated Adion Barreau, his trumpet tones rising above all others like a clarion in a tempest. Those hated names were greeted by a yell of abhorrence, perfectly savage from the left. Then all was uproar, a dozen voices simultaneously shouting at their loudest, denunciation, menace, defiance, retort, clenched hands, extended arms, furious gesticulations, everyone on tiptoe, fiery eyes, stamping feet, shouts of order, 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 
and amid all the incessant tinkling of old Sauzet's little silver bell, which was just about as effective in restoring peace as it would be to quiet the tempest now howling through the streets of Paris. At length, in utter consternation and dismay, the old president put on his hat, and, pronouncing the seance ended, rushed from his chair amid a hurricane of uproarious shouts. And Odilon Barreau? Odilon Barreau led the opposition members immediately from the chamber to his own house, where they have been ever since in deliberation. It was six o'clock when the sitting closed, and they must be in consultation now, or Barreau would surely be here, if but for a moment, out of respect to his bosom friend, our host. Ah, there he is, just entering, surrounded by a perfect army of Republicans. De Corte, Marast, Lesseps, Duvergier, Flacon, Lamartine, Dupont, and a whole host besides. How excited they look, exclaimed the journalist. Ah, Tears approaches them from the other end of the salon. Monsieur Tears, like the worldly wise and selfish man he is, has held himself aloof from the banquet, and even declined the invitation accepted by a hundred of his party. Today he was absent from the chamber, and tonight from the conclave, all with the aspiring yet vain hope that the king will send for him to form a ministry. And yet, in the chamber, a few days ago, he said that he was of the party of the revolution in Europe. True, but he added that he wished the revolution carried on by its moderate supporters, and that he should do all he could to keep it in the hands of the moderate party. But if it should pass into the hands of a party not moderate, continued the crafty ex-minister, I shall not abandon the cause of the revolution. I shall be always of the party of the revolution." But see, he singles out Marast, of all the others. And his old colleague of Le National seems to give him no very cordial reception, added the deputy. But let us move up and hear the determination of the opposition relative to the banquet. That's the very question the little historian has just propounded to the great journalist. Now for the answer. The opposition decide, monsieur, to abandon the banquet, was the angry reply of the editor to the ex-minister. Indeed, was the bland rejoinder, and has a manifesto of this decision been issued to the people? It has, and it instantly called forth a counter-manifesto from the electoral committee of the 12th arrondissement, expressing very natural astonishment that, at the same time, the opposition abandoned the banquet, that they had not abandoned their seats in the chamber, and inviting them so to do at once. And the ministry? anxiously asked M. Thiers. Will tomorrow be impeached, monsieur? Ah, indeed, indeed, cried the smart little aspirant, gleefully rubbing his hands. At that moment, General Morsier, the brother-in-law of Thiers, who owed so much to the house of Orléans, hastily approached. I come straight from the Tuileries, he said with considerable excitement. General Jacquemino has just issued an order of the day as commander-in-chief of the National Guard, appealing to them as the constitutional protectors of the throne to take no part in the banquet. Orders have also been issued for the rappel to be beaten at dawn. In the Quartier Saint-Honoré, the scene of the contemplated procession. But it's all folly to rely on the National Guard. They are of the people. Only the Municipal Guard and the troops of the line can be relied on in the civil conflict, which is sure to come tomorrow. And the ministers, what do they? asked Thiers. Oh, they are not idle, replied the soldier. The Bastilles are armed, and those of Montrouge and Aubervilles are provisioned. The horse artillery at Vincennes are ready on the instant to gallop into the capital. Seventy additional pieces of ordnance are now entering the barrières. The municipal guard are supplied with ball cartridges. The troops concentrated at sunrise tomorrow will not be less than one hundred thousand strong. With these men in the forts and faithful, the city can be starved in three days, National Guard and all, if rebellious. Now is the crisis in which to test the remarkable admission of Monsieur du Châtel in May, 45, that the Bastilles of Paris were designed to fortify order. We shall see, we shall see. And the Marshal Duke of Islay, where is he? quietly asked Marast, with a significant shrug and smile. At this mention of his bitter foe, a frown lowered on the fine face of Mercier as he briefly and sternly replied, With the king, monsieur. General Bougot is with the king, but they mistake, monsieur. Eugène Cavigny is the man for this emergency. Bougot is a soldier, a mere soldier. Cavigny is a statesman, a Napoleon. 
Paris will discriminate between the two one day, and that shortly. And with an abrupt military salute, the conqueror of Algeria walked away, followed by his little brother-in-law, who seemed yet shorter and more insignificant at the side of his towering and graceful form. At the same moment, Ledru Roland entered in great agitation, and having glanced hastily around, as if in search of someone in the assemblage, advanced straight to the journalist and grasped his hand. "'By the heavens, Armand, I think the hour has arrived!' "'Whence do you come?' was the quick question. "'From the boulevards where I left Flocon, Louis Blanc, and Monsieur Dantes, with the people. "'I tell you, Armand, the people are ripe, ripe! "'The ministerial ordinances prohibiting the banquet have kindled a flame wherever they have gone. "'The pitiful manifesto of the opposition and the counter-manifesto of the twelfth arrondissement "'have only served to fan this flame into fury.' It has been our care to restrain and direct, not to excite. It is dark and cold without, Armand. The winter wind howls dismally along the streets. The sleet freezes as it falls, and the furious blast almost extinguishes the torches, by which, at the corners and at the cafés, the different manifestos of the day are being read to the eager throngs, on whose faces, in the flare of the blood-red light, can be perceived the fury of their hearts. The people, at length, are ripe. Tomorrow... All Paris will be in arms. While they drew Roland was thus speaking, Louis Blanc entered and quietly approached, courteously saluting his acquaintances on his way, and stopping to exchange a few words with Madame Dantes, who inquired with considerable anxiety for her husband. I have this moment left him, Madame, said Louis Blanc. Be assured, he is safe and well. Ah, how glorious to be an object of solicitude to one like you, he added with a smile. The lady smiled also, and offered an appropriate jest in reply to the gallantry of the distinguished author, as he moved on to join his friends. End of section 17 Section 18 of Edmund Dantes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. The ministry provokes its fate, he said in a low tone as he approached. Whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. These men suffered 70 reform banquets all over France. The 71st one they prohibit and that, too, by the exhumation of an old despotic edict of 1790. This is exactly what we would have. It was the first, not the last, banquet they should have suppressed. Barreau was right today, in the chamber, when he said that had this manifestation been suffered, the people would have become tranquil. Tranquil, indeed, cried Ledru Rollon. That's exactly what we have apprehended. No, no, it is too late. This reform banquet was, at first, but an insignificant thing. In it we now recognize the commencement of a revolution. The various announcements and postponements of this banquet have caused an agitation among the masses favorable to our wishes, and the threats and obstinacy of the ministry have completed the work. The hopes, fears, doubts, and disappointments attending this affair have put the mind of all Paris in a ferment, and excited passions of which we may take immediate advantage." Ay, cried Louis Blanc, now may we do what I have always wished and counseled. We, the communists, may now take advantage of a movement, in the origin or inception of which we had no hand. True, most true, observed Marrast. This is the work of the dynastics. Thiers, Barreau, and the rest. The commencement of a reform under the law which we design to make a revolution paramount to all law. They begin to fear already that they have gone too far, those discreet men, said Louis Blanc, smiling bitterly. Did you observe how they shuffled tonight at Monsieur Barreau's and finally resolved to abandon the banquet, but, as a sop to the people, pledged themselves to impeach the ministry? Ah, ha, ha, laughed Ledru Roland. Just as if their abandonment of the banquet is to keep the people away from it tomorrow— any more than the ministerial ordinances. Why, not one man in ten thousand knows of the existence of these manifestos. 
but the Faubourgs have been promised a holiday for a fortnight past, and they don't intend to be put off again. Whether the dynastics designed or wished to be compromised in this affair, remarked Marrast, they certainly are committed now, and it is too late for them to get out of the movement. Indeed, I view it as nothing less than a union of all the oppositions against the crown, I against the crown, and for a republic. We comprehend this. They don't. They have not, like us, waited seventeen years for a signal for revolution. And now, before God, I believe the hour is at hand. This is no accidental insurrection of the 5th and 6th of June, 32. No outbreak at a funeral. No riot of operatives. No unmeaning revolt as in 39. It is a reform, with the first names in France as its advocates and supporters, which we will make a revolution if we can secure the National Guard. The National Guard is secured already, said Louis Blanc. Are they not of the people? At least 20,000 of the National Guard are Republicans. Of the remaining 40,000, nearly all are well-disposed or neutral in feeling. Have I studied the National Guard for 20 years in vain, and of all the measures of the Communists to secure them, when the crisis came on, proved utterly ineffectual? On the National Guard we may rely. The Municipal Guard are picked men and well paid to support the throne. They will fight even better than the line. With the line and the National Guard, the people must seek to fraternize from the beginning. With the other troops, they have solely to fight. But after all, general facts and principles only can be laid down. Circumstances utterly beyond human control must direct and govern, and vary and determine results when the period of action arrives, and arrive it may at any hour of the day or night. At this moment, Paris sleeps on a volcano, the fires of which have long been gathering through many a fair and sunny day. God only knows when the volcano will burst, but when the hour comes, let the people be prepared. As these enthusiastic words were uttered, the dark eye of the speaker flashed and his lip quivered. The silver clock on the mantel, besides which the conspirators stood, struck the first quarter after two. The night was waning, but the festivity seemed rather to increase than diminish within the salons of the magnificent mansion, while the storm howled even more drearily without, and the rain, at intervals, in heavy blasts, beat even more fiercely against the northern casements. As Louis Blanc ceased speaking, M. Flocon entered the salon, and, as if by some preconcerted arrangement, at once sought his political friends. "'What of the night, watchman?' cried Ledru Roland, as the editor of La Réforme approached. The latest news, for that's of an hour's age, doth hiss the speaker, as the English Shakespeare says. The news, good or bad. As I entered, said Flocon, the house trembled with the jar of a train of heavy ordnance, attended by tumbrils and artillery caissons, and escorted by a regiment of horse, which rolled along the pavement of the Champs-Élysées. Good! answered Marast, with enthusiasm. All night, continued Flocon eagerly, through darkness and storm, whole regiments of infantry have thronged the line of boulevards which stretch from the Tuileries to Vincennes, and each soldier bears upon his knapsack, in addition to all his arms, an axe to demolish barricades. The garrisons of the arrondissements of Paris are already 70,000 strong, and the troops of the line are concentrating around the Palais Bourbon and the Chamber of Deputies. Excellent, most excellent, joyfully exclaimed Louis Blanc. The affront will not be wanting. But where is Monsieur Dantes? He is still with the chiefs of the Faubourgs and the committees of the Freemasons and workmen in the Rue Le Pelletier, issuing his last instructions for the morrow. Messieurs, that man is a magician. His zeal in the good cause puts the boldest of us all to the blush. By the most indefatigable energy and indomitable perseverance, he has brought about a systematic, almost scientific organization and fraternity through various modes of rapid intercommunication between the innumerable classes of operatives of every description throughout the whole capital and its faubourgs, so that, within six hours, he can have in military array an armed mass of 100,000 blouses upon the boulevards. The workshops alone, he tells me, can furnish 50,000. The rapidity with which he conveys intelligence 
through this immense army and their utter subservience to his will and subordination to his orders are all so wonderful that it is impossible to determine which is most so to control a parisian populace has hitherto been deemed a chimera with monsieur dantes it is an existing reality not an army in europe is so obedient or so prompt as his army of workmen the secret is this they know him to be their friend all over paris are to be seen his workshops savings banks hospitals and houses of industry and reform and in the suburbs his phalansteries and his model farms that he has the command of boundless wealth is certain but whose it is or whence it comes no one can divine and never did man make use of boundless wealth to attain his ends more wisely than he does why, I am told that the pens of half the literateurs and fouetinists of Paris have for years past been guided by his will and compensated from his purse to accomplish his purposes. The mysteries of Paris and the wandering Jew are but two of the triumphs of his policy, and his system of philanthropy seems not bounded by France, but to embrace all Europe. The Swiss Protestant and the Italian Patriot have each felt his effective sympathy as well as the french workmen and in the same manner as with the operatives so has he obtained influence and weight with the national guard and to such an extent that of the sixty thousand one half would obey his orders with greater alacrity than those of jacqueminot himself i tell you messieurs he is a magician hush hush cried morast he is entering now he pauses and looks around him said louis blanc he looks for us i will go to him remarked flocon he looks for his wife replied louis blanc there he catches her eye see how eagerly she flies to him that is the finest pair in paris remarked the journalist and the most devoted added le Rollon. they have been man and wife for some time it is said and any one would take them for lovers at this moment have they children asked flocon no but monsieur dantes has by a former wife a son and daughter who rival in good looks the celebrated children of our friend victor hugo returned louis blanc i met arago lamartine Sue, chateaubriand and some other celebrities at his mansion in the rue de helder one night recently continued barrast and i thought i never saw a house arranged with such perfect taste the salons, a library, picture gallery, cabinet of natural history, conservatory, and laboratory were superb. Everything, in short, was exquisite. And then one is always sure to meet at Madame Dante's soirees, added Louis Blanc, exactly the persons who, of all others, he wishes to see, and whom he would meet nowhere else, the poets, painters, authors, orators, statesmen, and artists of every description. In fine, every man or woman whether native or foreigner, distinguished for anything, is certain to be met with at Monsieur Dante's house. I once met there, said Flocon, Rachel, the actress, and Van Hamburg, the Lion King. Monsieur Dante's is a perfect messiness and encouraging merit, as everyone knows, remarked Marrast, and he manifests a special solicitude to show that he appreciates worth more highly than wealth, genius than station poverty and ability are sure recommendations to him madame dantes is i am told as devoted to the good cause as her husband remarked flocon she is a second madame roland exclaimed louis blanc france will owe much to such women as she and her friend madame Tudevant. she differs greatly from madame george sand in some respects i fancy said marrast but if she at all rivals that wonderful woman in devotedness to the cause of human rights whether of her own sex or ours she deserves well of france in her charities it is notorious she has no rival half the mendicants of the capital bless her name and she is at the head of a dozen associations and enterprises for the amelioration of the condition of the destitute suffering and abandoned of her sex upon my word messieurs cried ledru Rollon, your praises of monsieur dantes and madame his beautiful wife are perfectly enthusiastic so much so that in your zeal you utterly forgot another matter quite as momentous i am so unfortunate as to know monsieur dantes only as one of the great pillars of our noble cause and a man who for nearly six years has proven himself an apostle of man's rights 
and ready, if need be, to become a martyr. That's enough for me to know of him. But who really are Monsieur Dantes and his wife? asked Flocon. Who really are any of us? laughingly rejoined Louis Blanc. Who really is anyone in Paris? continued Marrast, the blood royal always and alone excepted. Of Monsieur Dantes, this only is known, said Louis Blanc, that for five or six years past he has been a deputy from Marseille, Lyons, and other southern cities, all of which have been eager to honor themselves by returning him as their representative, as one of the boldest and most eloquent republicans in all France. As for Madame Dantes, we know her to have once been the Countess de Morcerf, but now the wife of our friend, and one of the noblest and most lovely matrons in Paris. What need have we to know more? But our friend comes. While this conversation was proceeding, Dantes and Mercedes had joined each other and their hands were quietly clasped. Is all well, Edmond? was the anxious inquiry of the fond wife, in low, soft, musical tones, as she fixed upon his pale face her dark eyes, beaming with a tender solicitude. All is well, love, replied the husband. You will pardon my protracted absence when I tell you it has been unavoidable. Will you not, Mercedes? Will I not? What a question! But I have been so anxious for your safety, knowing the perilous business in which you are engaged, and the night is so tempestuous. You forget that I have a constitution of iron, dear, replied Dantes. You forget that I was a sailor once, and the storms were my playthings. But you will go home with me now, Edmund, will you not? She anxiously asked, placing her little white hand on his arm and gazing beseechingly into his eyes. Have I ever passed one night from your arms, my Mercedes, since we were wed? was the whispered response. Ah, love, any pillow but thy soft bosom would be to me a thorny one. You have spoiled me forever, he added, smiling. And shall we go now, Edmund? eagerly asked the delighted woman. Oh, I'm so weary of this fate. I must exchange a few words with our friend Louis Blanc, whom I see yonder, with others of our party, and then, dear, we will to our pillow. We are both weary. Au revoir. Edmond, Edmond, cried the lady as her husband was going. Do you see Juliette and Louise in the Redoba yonder? Dantes looked, and with a well-pleased smile, nodded assent. A more brilliant and well-matched pair could hardly have been found. Joliet in the splendid uniform of an officer of the Spahis, and she in her own magnificent beauty, fitly garbed. Monsieur Dantes was received with marked respect by the not republicans as he approached. I am delighted to meet you all, and to meet you tonight, or rather this morning, said Dantes warmly, in order that I may render you an account of my stewardship for the past six hours. They have been hours big with fate, and the first day of Republican France has already commenced. Messieurs, we can no longer remain blind to the fact that the long-looked-for, hoped-for, expected hour has come, the hour to strike, strike home for liberty and for France. Tomorrow the streets of Paris will swarm with blouses. The Marseillaise will be heard. Barricades rise. The ministry be impeached. Next day, the National Guards will fraternize with the people. Blood will flow. The ministry resign. On the third, the king abdicates. The Tuileries are surrendered. A regency is refused. A republic is declared. And this day, two weeks hence, liberty will be shouted in the streets of Vienna and Berlin, and every throne in Europe will tremble. The honors of prophecy are easily won, continued the speaker with a significant smile that lighted up his features, pale with enthusiasm and exhaustion, when the problem of seventeen years approaches solution with mathematical certainty. Are our plans all complete? asked Louis Blanc. So far as human forethought or power could render them so, our efforts have, I trust, been effectual, was the reply. Yet the events of every hour will induce changes and render indispensable policy now undreamed of. Ah, Messieurs, we must none of us sleep now. Not a moment must escape our vigilance. Not an advantage must be sacrificed. We can afford to lose nothing. Without leaders, the people are blind. Not for an instant must they be abandoned. 
Tomorrow, let the masses gather at different points. Next day, let barricades choke the boulevards, and if the conflict come not, be it precipitated, provoked. Thursday, a hundred thousand men must invest the Tuileries, and a provisional government be declared in the Chamber of Deputies. The Bourbons will then be in full flight, and France will be free. And now, messieurs, will you permit me to suggest the propriety of our separation? Yonder ministerial secretary has had his eye upon us ever since he entered. The expediency of the suggestion of Monsieur Dantes was at once perceived. The conspirators parted, and one after the other, by different routes, shortly disappeared. As for Monsieur Dantes, he threw himself carelessly in the way of the ministerial secretary to whom he had alluded, who was no other than our friend Lucien de Bray, and saluted him with most marked and winning courtesy. Will the ministerial secretary suffer me to compliment him upon his indefatigable industry and exertions tonight to fortify order in Paris and sustain the administration? Debray bowed somewhat confusedly at this remark, and having returned a diplomatic reply, from which neither himself nor anyone else could have elicited an idea, M. Dantes continued the conversation. Let me see. It is now nearly three o'clock, he said, consulting his repeater. At half-past two you received an order, signed by the Duke of Montpensier, and directed to the War Ministry, commanding that seventy-two additional pieces of artillery be transported from Vincennes to Paris before dawn. That order was issued, and the ordinance is now on the boulevard. How? exclaimed the astonished secretary. At Vincennes, the horses of the flying artillery stand harnessed in their stalls. All night infantry have been pouring into Paris, and, obedient to midnight orders, every railway will disgorge at dawn additional troops. "'Are you a magician?' asked the astonished secretary. "'Shall I reveal to you the ministerial tactics for the morrow's apprehended insurrection?' coolly asked Dantes with a smile. "'The salons of the Tuileries have not been deserted tonight.' "'Can you quell an insurrection, General?' asked the king of the Marshal Duke of Islay. I can kill thirty thousand men, was the humane answer. And I, sire, can preserve order in Paris without killing a score, said Marshal Gerard, the hero of Antwerp, if I can rely on my men. What is your plan, Marshal? asked the king. Shall I give you the Marshal's reply, my friend? You are present. You know all, exclaimed Dubray. Not quite all, thought Dantes, but I shall before we part. Well, continued he, aloud, uh, the marshal's strategy was this, exceedingly simple and exceedingly efficacious, too, provided, to use the marshal's own words, he can rely on his men. It is this, occupy the Tuileries, the Hôtel de Ville, the Halles, the Louvre, and other prominent points with a heavy reserve of infantry and artillery, and sweep the boulevards and the rues Saint-Honoré, de Rivoli, Saint-Martin, Saint-Denis, Montmartre and Richelieu with cavalry. A simple plan, is it not? Almost as simple as that of the insurrectionists themselves. A barricade on every street, and one hundred thousand men in the Place de Carrousel. The government will not yield, monsieur, said Debray firmly. The minister is unshaken. To crush an unarmed mob cannot severely tax the most skillful generals in Europe. True, they are unarmed, returned Dantes, with apparent seriousness. Their leader should have thought of that. Arms are so easily provided. But then they can rely on their men. We have yet to see that, replied Debray, with some asperity. True, we have yet to see it. It is only a matter of belief now, then it will be a matter of knowledge. Seeing is knowing, added Monsieur Dantes, with his peculiar smile. But pray, assure me, Monsieur de Bray, are the ministry and their advisers indeed sanguine of the issue tomorrow? They are certain, replied the secretary with energy. Then, feeling he had perhaps made a dangerous revelation, he quickly added, I have the honor, Monsieur, to wish you a very good night. It is late. I say rather, it is early, Monsieur, replied Dantes. I have the honor to wish you a very good morning. The secretary returned the courtesy, turned away, and, after exchanging a few words with M. Thiers, disappeared. "'They are certain, then,' soliloquized M. Dantes, 
as Debray quitted the salon. I was sure I should know all before he left. Then, rejoining Mercedes, who was patiently awaiting him, they stepped into their carriage as the drowsy tones of the watchman rose in the misty air. Past four o'clock, and all is well. End of eighteen. Section nineteen of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. A LibriVox recordings on the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter seventeen. The revolution begins. Tuesday, the twenty-second of February, the birthday of the immortal Washington, and the first of the three days of the French Revolution of eighteen forty-eight broke darkly and gloomily on paris the night had been tempestuous and the wind still drove the sleet through the leafless trees of the champs elysees and howled drearily along the cheerless boulevards the streets were dismal desolate and deserted here and there however through the gray light of the winter dawn could be caught the semblance of a figure closely muffled whether for concealment disguise or protection from the biting blast was doubtful stealing along these figures often met and exchanged ominous signs of recognition. Is a procession still to take place? asked one of another of these persons, pausing for an instant as they hurried along. Yes, was the empathetic answer. Dupont, Lamartine, and sixteen others who are faithful are resolute. And the rendezvous? Is the Place de la Concorde. And the hour? Twelve. Whereupon the conspirators parted. Gradually, the number of persons in the streets increased as the morning advanced. Chiefly, these were artisans, lads, blousons, and workmen. Whither so early this disagreeable morning? cried a peaceable-looking shopman of the Rue de Rivoli, who was taking down his shutters for the day, to a friend who was hurrying by. I don't exactly know where I'm going, was the reply. We were all roused at daybreak in the Cartier saint Honoré by the rappel, and so I happened to be awake. And are the National Guard turning out in good numbers? No, they don't turn out at all. The drummers are followed by a crowd of gamin in blouses, who shout, Vive la Reform, and sing the Marseillaise. The National Guard don't turn out, cried the alarmed shopman. Then I'll not take down my shutters. And as his friend moved on to the Madeleine, he took the precautionary measure he had spoken of. At nine o'clock, Troops were in motion all over Paris, and the roll of the drum was heard in every street. At ten o'clock, ten thousand men were assembled at the Madeleine. Is there to be a banquet? asked one of another as they met on the Rue Royale. No, it is a procession. The people are to march to the Chamber of Deputies and sing the Marseillaise. All the avenues to the Palais Bourbon and the part of the place around the Madeleine were now occupied by the 21st Regiment of the Line and mounted municipal guards. Before the chamber deputies was marshalled, a squad of dragoons and a battalion of the 69th Regiment of Cursiers stood ready to charge on the throng. At eleven o'clock, two thousand students in blouses from the Parthenon were joined by an immense column of workmen from the Faubourg, and having fraternized in the Place de la Concorde, advanced in perfect order in procession, led by National Guards, shouting the Marseillaise in the hymn of the Girondin. Slowly and solemnly, moved the vast mass up the Rue Royale to the Pont de la Concorde, leading to the place of the Chamber of Deputies. At twelve o'clock, the vast arena between the Chamber of Deputies and the Madeleine contained thirty thousand people. Along the railing of the church was drawn up a regiment of horse. A man in a tricolored sash three times read the summons and ordered the crowd disperse. The order is disregarded. The charge is sounded. The dragoons rush with sheathed sabers on the mass. Again and again they charge, but they cut down none. All at once a heavy cart with a powerful horse is discovered. The people seize it. The horse is lashed into fury. He rushes on the double line of dragoons and the chassiers. A breach is made. The crowd dash through. Some rush up the steps of the chamber of deputies. They force the gates. They even enter the hall. Then, suddenly, panic-stricken, at their own audacity, they rush back. At this moment, along the Quai d'Orsay, gallops up a strong detachment of the mounted municipal guard, led by General Perronet Traverse Sebastiani, 
brother of the marshal and uncle of the unhappy duchess of praslin a charge was ordered the crowd was driven over the bridge and the municipal guard a company of dragoons and the squadron of hussar took up position at the foot of the obelisk of luxor long live the dragoons shouted the people down with the municipal guard accompanied by hootings groans shouts and showers of stones the troops with sheathed sabres charged one of the immense fountains afforded the gunmen a place of shelter suddenly the flood of water was let on and they fled thus began the revolution one o'clock tolled from the tower of the madeleine the area was clear cavalry patrolled the boulevards infantry bearing besides their usual arms implements for demolishing barricades axes adzes and hatchets each soldier one upon his knapsack followed at two o'clock at the hotel de affaires étrangers at the corner of the rue capucine and the boulevard an immense mass of men ebbed and flowed like tides of the sea and a tempest of shouts groans and choruses to national songs arose a commissary of police in colored clothes and with a tricolored sash led a body of municipal guard into the court deliberately they charged their muskets with ball in the name of the law shouted the commissary vive la ligne responded the people as they slowly retired away cried a trooper to a blouse in the place de la concorde at the corner near the turkish embassy away or i'll cut you down will you coward replied the artisan calmly with folded arms at that moment a body of the people rushed on the municipal guards and drove them for safety into their barracks then they fled themselves to avoid the fusillade of the enraged troops on the pont de la concorde the people stopped the carriage of a ministerial deputy and saluted him with groans the next moment armand morast of the national approached and was most rapturously cheered the money changers those seers of napoleon scented not yet the revolution on friday the three per cents were seventy-five francs eighty-five centimes on tuesday they opened at seventy-three francs ninety centimes and closed at seventy-four francs the day advanced the republican and communist power augments in a systemized order paris swarms with insurgents bakers and gunsmiths shops are plundered barricades are thrown up a column rushes down the champs elysees and having been repulsed an escalade of the railings of the chamber of deputies retires shouting the marseillaise and a chorus from the new opera of the girondin morier pour la patrie at dusk a deputation of students at the office of le national presents a petition for the impeachment of the ministry that impeachment had already taken place what news shouted a student to a workman as he hurried along there has been fighting in the faubourg st marceau half a dozen municipal guards have been carried wounded to the hospital of val de grace and a captain was killed and is it true that the guard has been disarmed on the rue geoffrey in langevin in a gunmaker's shop near the port st martin broken into and rifled i hadn't heard of that was the hurried reply but i hear this that the guard houses in the champs elysees have been taken and the troops driven off and that lamps and windows have been torn down at that moment another workman rushed along the news shouted the student and the first workman the railing of the church of the assumption has been torn away by the people to supply arms two women of the people have been crushed by a charge of the municipal guard the shop of the page the armorer and the rue richelieu has been entered by means of the pole of an omnibus and used as a battering ram and barricades rise on the rue st honore at three o'clock a column of people dash down the boulevards smashing lamps and breaking shop windows in the rue st honore and the rue de rivoli an omnibus and two carriages were seized to aid in erecting a barricade a guard house in the champs elysees was burned the troops at the ministry of foreign affairs were increased no one was suffered to pass a municipal guard was dismounted and nearly killed by the people the crowd in the rue royale had become so dense that it was impossible to pass to the place de la concorde the troops charged the people gave way some were wounded badly but still rose to the shouts vive la ligne down with the municipal guard in the place vendome stood a regiment of the line there was the hotel of monsieur hubert the minister of justice and monsieur hubert was hated by the people 
Down with Herbert, the inventor of moral complicity, yelled the populace, but they made no attack. It was ten o'clock at night. Many of the shops were closed, but the cafes and restaurants were thronged. From time to time the shouts, Down with Gazot and Vive la Reform, were heard, and also the roll of drums as a body of troops passed along. Knots of individuals gathered around the doors of baker shops, and while they eagerly ate their bread and sausage, as eagerly denounced Gazot and the ministry. But all was comparative order in Paris. End of section 19. Section 20 of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 18 The Midnight Conclave. It was twelve o'clock at night on the 22nd of February, 1848. Lights still gleamed in the vast edifice of the National Printing Office, and in the editorial chamber were assembled the chiefs of the revolution. All goes well, said Louis Blanc. The blow is struck, let it only be followed up, and the efforts of the past ten years will not prove vain. How true was the opinion of Monsieur Dantes respecting the National Guard, said Morast. How true also respecting the workmen, said Albert. How true respecting the ministry, said the Jerolin. But where is Monsieur Dantes? Why is he not here? At that moment, the private door opened, and Monsieur Dantes, Flocon, and Lamartine entered. The news from the chambers, cried Morast, as they approached. Three impeachments of the ministry have been proposed, said Lamartine. By whom? By whom? asked Louis Blanc. By whom presented? One by Odilon Barreau, one by Duvenier de Haran, and one by Monsieur Gnaud, deputy from Toulouse. And what said Guzot? asked Morast. Nothing. He only laughed when the papers were handed him by old President Susi. Ah, cried the Jurolin. Few deputies were there, continued Foucon. The opposition benches were vacant. Guzot was there early, pale and troubled, but stern and unbending. All the ministers followed him. What was discussed? asked Marast. The Bordeaux bank bill. Ah, cried the Jurolin again. Yes, continued Foucon. Until five o'clock that bill was discussed, Barreau then ascended the tribune and deposited a general proposition to impeach the ministry. And what was done with it? asked Louis Blanc. The president raised a sitting without reading it, but announced that the bureau should have it for the examination on Thursday. Infamous, cried Le Rolin. It is all as it should be, said Monsieur Dantes calmly. And the peers, what of them? The Marquis de Boissy made an effort to get a hearing on the state of Paris, but, of course, it was in vain. Is it true, asked Flocon, that the repel has been beaten today? It was beaten in the Cartier saint Honoré at dawn, said Louis Blanc, and this evening, at about five o'clock, in several of the Aerodismal, but no reliance need be placed on the National Guard. They are with us. They are of the people. They shout, Vive la Reform. But the Municipal Guard in the line? I am told that an immense body of them was this evening, at about eight o'clock, reviewed by the king and the dukes of Numoc and Montpassier in the Place du Carousel, said Flocon. That's true, said Le Rolin. I witnessed it myself in passing, and I could not help saying it is the last. Six thousand troops of the line are on the boulevards, from the Madeleine to the Porte Saint Martin, said Monsieur Dantes. The Hotel de Ville, the Place de la Bastille, de la Concorde, and du Carousel, and the quay frown with artillery. Tomorrow will be a warm day. It has been rather warm today in some parts of Paris, said Louis Blanc, smiling. Was there ever a grander spectacle than that in the Place de la Concorde at noon? At least one hundred thousand men were assembled. Rushing across the bridge, they gathered around the Chamber of Deputies, then from the southern gate of the Tuileries, issued two bodies of troops, one of mounted municipal guards, and the other infantry of the line, and, pressing on the dense mass, they drove them over the bridge. Only a few old fruit women were crushed beneath the horses' hoofs, and a few of the troops were wounded by pebbles, however. At the same time, said Flocon, all the chains in the Champs-Élysées were in requisition for a barricade, as well as all the public carriages, 
and the people sang the Marseillaise, the Parisian, and the Hymn of the Garandin. A guardhouse was also consumed. Have you heard Bijot's remark at noon, when looking upon Palais de la Concorde? asked Marast. We have been too busy today to hear anything, said the Jurolin. Ah, we shall have a day of it, said the bloodthirsty old hero. I care not for the day, said the pale Guzot, but the night. The people made quite a demonstration about Guzot, I hear, said Faucon. They assailed him with a shower of groans, it is said, and some of the gamin flung pebbles at his gates. The most significant shout before the Office of Foreign Affairs was this, said the Jurolin. Countess of Levin, where is the minister? In the very moment this was occurring, said Faucon, I understand that Monsieur Tizers, on his return from the chamber, is passing through the Champs-Élysées, nearly escaped a most unwelcome ovation from the people. The two rivals were duly and simultaneously honored, it seems. Thus much for today, said Marast. What of tonight? Barricades rise all over Paris, said Monsieur Dantes, but we can do no more. Let us each retire to his home. Tomorrow the National Guard will fraternize with the people, and the Ministry will resign. A few words of parting, salutation passed, and all departed. Monsieur Dantes and Lamartine left the office in company. What say you, Edmond? asked Lamartine. Will your wife spare you long enough from her pillow to make with me a brief tour of the town? Mercedes is rather exacting, said Dantes, with a laugh. But if your fair lady will suffer your absence, mine must do the same, I fear. Well, then, let us first to the Hôtel de Ville, that grand centre of Paris and all that is revolutionary. As the two friends passed along, conversing on the events of the day, the anticipations of the morrow, they were met, from time to time, by knots of men at the corners, eagerly recounting the incidents of the hour. The roll of drums was heard in the distance, heavy and measured tread of infantry, the clatter of cavalry, and the lumbering of artillery as they passed on their way. All the shops and cafes were closed. Many of the lamps were demolished, and others were not lighted, the gas being shut off. A fearful gloom brooded over the city. The winter wind swept sharply and cuttingly along the deserted streets, and rain which froze as it fell at intervals dashed down. The Hôtel de Ville was encompassed by troops as the friends approached it. Is that a cannon? asked Lamartine, pointing to a dark object that protruded from an embrasure of the edifice. It is, replied Dantes. Then, the revolution has indeed begun. Artillery in the streets of Paris. Behind each column of the portico of the Chamber of Deputies this day frowned a concealed cannon, was the significant response. The friends turned off from the Hôtel de Ville, and crossing the right branch of the Seine, were under the deep shadows of Notre Dame. But all was tranquil and still. Only the howlings of the wintry blast were heard through the towers and architectural ornaments of the old pile. Up the Rue Saint-Jacques, in the Cartier Latin, they then proceeded, but the students and the grisettes seemed to be fast asleep. Turning back, they passed the fish market, and here a large body of cavalry had bivouacked. Patrols marched to and fro, Officers in huge dark cloaks smoked, laughed, and chatted, regardless of the morrow. The friends went on. All was dark in the Faubourg, which succeeded. Not a light gleamed, save in some lofty casement, in the fainting candle of the worn-out needlewoman, or the overtasked student. Ah, exclaimed Lamartine, as they passed one of these flickering lights. Who knows what plodding head and ready hand may beside that candle? Who knows of the weapon burnished, the cartridge filled? and their sabre sharpened by that light for tomorrow. The morrow, exclaimed Monsieur Dantes, that morrow decides the fate of France. And the friends parted. End of section 20this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 19. The Second Day. The 23rd of February dawned on Paris as a city under arms. Artillery frowned in all the public places. The barricades of the preceding night had been thrown down as fast as erected. National guards thronged the thoroughfares. The people swarmed along the boulevards. In the neighborhood of the Port Saint-Denis and the Port Saint-Martin, barricades rose as if by magic, but were as if by magic, 
swept away cavalry bivouacked in the streets and ordnance was levelled along their entire extent the avenues were closely invested and even old men and women were arrested on their way to their own thresholds from time to time single shots or volleys of musketry were heard in the distance and wounded men were carried past to the hospitals the government had ordered all public carriages to be cleared from the stands that material for new barricades might not exist when the old ones were demolished but the people were busy too for the iron railings at the hotel of the minister of marine in the place de la concorde and at the churches of the assumption and st roche had been torn away to supply weapons of attack or defence or implements with which to tear up the huge square paving stones of paris for barricades at eleven o'clock the national guard of the second arrondissement gathered at the opera house in the rue le pelletier and near the office of le national vive la réforme vive la garde nationale long live the real defenders of the country these were the shouts intermingled with the choruses of national songs that now rose from the people and the national guard at twelve o'clock the second legion of the national guard was at the tuileries to make a demonstration for reform its colonel monsieur bagnere declared to the duke of nemours that he could not answer for his men at one o'clock accompanied by an immense multitude with whom they fraternized they were again on the rue le pelletier a squadron of cuirassiers and one of chasseurs advanced to dislodge them who are these men cried the chef d'escadron the people of paris replied the officer of the national guard and who are you an officer of the second legion of the national guard the people must disperse they will not i will compel them the national guard will defend them vive la réforme shouted the people the national guard and the cuirassier united the officer chagrined turned back to his men and vociferated in tones of thunder wheel forward and the whole body resumed its march down the boulevard an hour afterwards a still larger body of troops municipal guards mounted and on foot cuirassier and infantry of the line came down the boulevard and made a half movement on the rue le pelletier but seeing the hostile attitude of the national guard continued their march amid shouts of vive la réforme vive la garde nationale vive la ligne twice within an hour afterwards the same thing occurred it was plain that the national guard fraternized with the people the third legion deputed their colonel m besson to demand of the king reform and a change of ministry the colonel presented the memorial to general jacques minot who promised to place it in the royal hands the fourth legion marched to the chamber of deputies and presented a petition for reform colonel le mercier of the tenth arrested a man for shouting vive la réforme the man was liberated by his own troops with shouts of vive la réforme the colonel withdrew the cavalry legion the thirteenth in like manner repudiated colonel montalivier the municipal guard was ordered to disarm the third legion both advanced bayonets were crossed blood was about to flow at that moment colonel textoris of the national guard rushed up and exclaimed brothers will you slay brothers the effect was electrical the muskets were instantly shouldered and the combatants separated all over paris the same scenes took place with a few exceptions vive la république cried le Drain rollin to albert who was hurrying down the rue le pelletier at about noon vive la république was the hearty response what of the national guard the guard fraternizes with the people replied le Drou rollin what of the blouses and the barricades last night the barricades of yesterday were swept from the streets and even the material of which to build them also 
the pavements only excepted yet at dawn this morning the whole space between the quartier saint martin des champs the mont de piete and the temple and all the smaller streets were choked with barricades and they were at once assailed by the troops of the line the municipal guard and the chasseurs of vincennes who were repulsed with most obstinate bravery at the rue rambuteau the sixty ninth regiment was three times driven back also at the corner of the rue saint denis and the rue de tracy and the rue philippeau a ball passed through the face of a soldier of the twenty first of the line infantry and then through the head of a voltigure behind him sixteen soldiers fell in the attack on the barricade of the rue rambuteau a blouse pointed a pistol at an officer of the municipal guard the pistol hung fire and the officer passed his sword through his assailant's body from this you can infer that we have had close fighting i have heard that an assault was made on the armory of our friends the lepage brothers for weapons is it so there was an assault at about ten o'clock but the windows were too strong to be carried there has been fighting in the rue de petit carrel and the neighbourhood of the place royale i learn ashme pasha son of mehemet ali is fighting for us with the most wonderful intrepidity a chef de bataillon of the thirty fourth was slain by a shot from a window and some offices of the octroi have been burned three men were killed at the bactignol and their bodies were accompanied by an immense throng to the morgue have you heard that the fifth regiment as in eighteen thirty has joined the people and that on their way to the prefecture of police to liberate some of the people who had been arrested they stopped at the office of la reforme and were eloquently addressed by our friend louis blanc what did he say to them he told them the fight was not yet over that there must still be a banquet and that this time there must be no mistake the workmen must have the freedom they won vive louis blanc cried albert and in a higher state of excitement than he had ever before been known to exhibit he hurried off i am for the tuileries said le Drou rollin as they parted and i for the palais royal said albert we meet to-night at the office of le national without fail at midnight it was on the square at the south end of the palais royal that most blood was spilled between the people and the troops the chateau d'eau was furiously assailed and obstinately defended assailed by the people and defended by six thousand picked troops the people triumphed of the troops at least a thousand perished and the remnant fled at three o'clock m rambuteau prefect of the seine waited on the king and informed him that the national guard demanded reform and the municipal guard a change of ministry the king in dismay convened the ministry can the ministry maintain itself asked louis philippe that question brings its own answer to your majesty replied guizot if you doubt the stability of your ministry who can trust them i have thought of the count mole observed the king he is an able man sire replied guizot and his political connections with m barot and m thiers may aid him to form a ministry but sire not an instant is to be lost your faithful ministers will do all they can but a ministerial crisis cannot be delayed and if your majesty will permit the suggestion the emergency demands that to marshal bugaud be given the command of paris you will proceed to the chamber to announce that m mole is entrusted with the formation of a new cabinet said the king and the council closed at four an officer of the staff passed along the boulevards announcing the fall of the ministry instantly with the speed of the telegraph the intelligence flew to the obscurest parts of paris its effect was at first most cheering barricades were deserted and arms thrown down faces brightened hands almost stained with each other's blood were clasped troops and people unwillingly fighting embraced all was triumph joy and congratulations all now is over all is right at last was the exclamation of one man of the people to another guizot has fallen but the king has sent for count mole 
replied a third with a dissatisfied air no matter cried the first speaker the system is overturned what care we who is minister it is too late replied the other guizot has been forced away by the people mole may be forced away too so may the king no more tricks the people now know their power there shall be no mistake this time and the insurrectionists parted as the day closed barricades rose in the quartier du temple and there was fighting between the people and the municipal guard but the national guard came to the rescue and the latter surrendered at nine o'clock paris was illuminated white red blue yellow orange green these were the tricolours of the lamps that poured their rich effulgence from every window on the gloomy scene without the streets were thronged and the cafes crowded men of all nations and parisians of all classes were in the streets the rattle of musketry had ceased the troops were in their barracks and the people at their homes at the corner of the boulevard in the rue de capucine flocon and louis blanc met guizot has fallen cried the first and the most intimate friend of the king has succeeded him what have we to hope for from the change what are we to do asked flocon in one hour the people will sing the marseillaise before the hotel des affaires étrangères the fourteenth regiment of the line is there replied flocon so much the better blood will flow the revolution will not stop and the conspirators separated at ten o'clock before the official residence of m guizot himself then absent and probably in full flight for the coast an immense crowd of the people with torches was assembled their purpose was to sing the marseillaise the fourteenth regiment barred the way the street was dimly lighted the single row of lamps along the courtyard wall was all the illumination a double line of troops was the defence let me pass cried the officer of the national guard who led the people to the officer impossible in the name of the people i demand to pass in the name of the law you shall not the people command forward cried the national guard present fire shouted the officer there was a roll of musketry a shrill shriek rang along the boulevard the vast mass recoiled the smoke floated off sixty-three of the people of paris lay weltering in their gore the blow is struck at last cried m dantes rushing across the boulevard pale and excited to arms people of paris to arms to arms to arms vengeance for our brothers was now the terrible cry that burst from the infuriated populace the congratulation the illumination all was lost in the wild wish for vengeance at eleven o'clock that night an immense multitude composed chiefly of workmen from the faubourgs was coming down the boulevard des capucines it was the largest and most regular throng yet seen in front marched a platoon of men bearing torches and waving tricolour flags immediately behind walked an officer in the full uniform of the national guard with a drawn sword in his hand whose slightest command was implicitly observed next came a tumbrel bearing the naked corpses of the slain whose faces mutilated by their wounds and disfigured by blood glared horribly up with open eyes in the red torchlight that flared in the night blast around behind this awful display marched a dense mass of national guards succeeded by a countless mass of the people armed with guns swords clubs and bars of iron chanting forth in full chorus not the inspiring marseillaise or the parisienne but in awful concert sending upon the night air the deep and dreadful notes of the death hymn of the girondin mourir pour la patrie intermingled with yells for vengeance down the boulevards approach the multitude more distinct becomes the dirge more redly glare the torches and amid all more deeply rumble the wheels of the death-cart on the pavement 
the funeral column reaches the corner of the boulevard and the rue le pelletier the death hymn rises to a yell of fury the officer of the national guard turns the head of the column to the right before it is an edifice conspicuous by its illumination of huge and blood-red lamps it is the office of le national the crowd halts one long loud shriek of vengeance goes up it is succeeded by the thrilling notes of the marseillaise from ten thousand lips and marast marast is the shout that follows the windows of the front office were thrown up and the editor surrounded by friends appeared his speech was brief but fervid he exhorted the people to be firm to secure their rights beyond recall and promised them ample retribution for past wrongs and security for future rights m garnier page who stood at the side of marast next addressed the people in the same strain amid thunders of applause making a detour to the office of la reforme the multitude were addressed by m flocon its editor then proceeding to the place de la bastille the corpses were deposited at the foot of the column of july and the crowd dispersed the night that succeeded was an awful one the streets which an hour before blazed with the illumination were dark barricades rose in every direction at every corner shopmen workmen women clerks and children were at work the crash of falling trees the clank of the lever and the pickaxe the rattle of paving stones these were the significant sounds that broke the stillness every tree on the whole line of the boulevard was felled and every lamp-post overthrown a barricade of immense strength rose at the end of the rue richelieu the troops offered no resistance they piled their arms lighted their fires and bivouacked close beside the barricades at the hotel de ville the troops of the line and the chasseurs d'afrique quietly ate their suppers smoked their pipes and laid themselves down to sleep on the boulevard des italiens appeared three regiments of the line a battalion of national guards a regiment of cuirassiers and three field pieces with their caissons of ammunition the horses were unharnessed by the people the caissons opened the ammunition distributed and the guns dragged off the troops guards and cuirassiers fraternized End of section twenty one Section 22 of Edmond Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 20 Another Midnight Conclave again it was midnight again the chiefs of the revolution of forty eight assembled in conclave the second of the three days had passed but the streets of paris were all alive with excitement every leader of the reform was there ledru rollin and flocon excited and fiery louis blanc exhausted and agitated albert stern and collected lamartine pale and troubled Maras, sanguine and confident all of them more or less disturbed but m dantes as for him the same calm smile was on his lips the same mild light in his eye and the same unchanging resolution upon his countenance who attended the chamber of deputies to-day asked marast did you lamartine i did was the reply and witnessed a somewhat stormy sitting at three o'clock as usual old sauze took the chair our friends were there in large numbers the ministerial benches were also filled immediately after m guizot entered he had been saluted with groans by the tenth legion stationed on guard without and with cries of down with guizot calm undisturbed stony in aspect though strangely pallid he entered and took his seat m vavin deputy for the seine instantly mounted the tribune as deputy of paris he had he said a solemn duty to fulfil for twenty-four hours paris had been in insurrection why was this he called on the minister of the interior to explain 
and what said guizot asked louis blanc eagerly he said he thought the public interest did not demand nor was it proper for the chamber at that time to enter into debate on the subject the king had called m le comte mole to form a new cabinet and then the left cheered exclaimed flocon most emphatically was the reply and what said guizot then asked ledru rollin he calmly said that no such demonstrations could induce him to add to or withhold a single syllable of what he designed to say or to pretermit a single act he had designed to do as long as his ministry remained in office he should cause public order to be respected according to his best judgment and as he had always done he should consider himself answerable for all that might happen and should in all things act as conscience might dictate for the best interests of the country a noble answer exclaimed m dantes with enthusiasm le Rollin and louis blanc assented and what next pursued flocon after considerable confusion continued lamartine m odillon barreau rose and demanded in consequence of the situation of the cabinet a postponement of the proposition for its impeachment fixed for to-morrow ah and what said the chamber asked flocon the demand was so loudly reprobated that m barreau immediately said he made the proposal in entire submission to the majority and what said dupin asked ledru rollin eagerly dupin said the first thing necessary for the capital was order anarchy must cease the ministry could not at the same time occupy themselves in re-establishing order and in caring for their own safety he demanded the adjournment of the impeachment and of all business and what did barreau reply to that asked louis blanc m barreau was silent the minister of foreign affairs at once rose and said with much energy that as long as his cabinet remained entrusted with the public interest which would probably be for some hours it would cause the laws to be respected the cabinet saw no reason for the suspension of the labours of the chamber the crown was at that moment exercising its prerogative and it must be respected so long as his cabinet was on those benches the chamber need not suspend its labours what was the vote on the question to postpone consideration of the impeachment asked flocon some of the opposition supported the motion but the whole centre opposed it and it was lost the chamber immediately rose in great agitation and m guizot disappeared it seems to me that the position of m odillon barreau is a somewhat peculiar one at this moment observed louis blanc he is neither with the crown nor with the people and yet both seem to confide in him as i passed his house this evening at about eight o'clock said flocon a large multitude were in his courtyard shouting long live odillon barreau a deputation of the people penetrated i understand even to his private apartment where he was in consultation with thiers and dupin barreau then urged them to be moderate in their triumph and to retire m garnier page who chanced to be there urged them to do the same and they went off shouting louder than ever at that moment one of the reporters of le national hastily entered and handed marrast a note whence do you come monsieur asked the editor from the tuileries monsieur was the reply and the reporter left the editor opened the note and read aloud one o'clock count mole unable to form a cabinet has this moment resigned and the king has sent for m guizot m thiers and marshal bougeot half past one o'clock marshal bougeot's commission as commander-in-chief of the national guard and of the troops of the line in place of generals jacques minot and peronet tibrours sabastiani has just been signed by m guizot and his colleagues the ministers of war and the interior and will appear in the moniteur of this morning bugeot's plan is this instant attack with an overwhelming force of artillery cavalry and infantry of the line which he asserts he has now already in position in anticipation of this event and well disposed to act on all the barricades he promises to sweep away every obstruction from the streets before dawn though at the cost of fifty thousand lives ha exclaimed all the conspirators instantly springing to their feet this indeed is resistance 
said monsieur dantes but bougeaud can concentrate no more troops upon us every avenue to paris will be effectually closed before morning and even the telegraph stopped if this be true we have not an instant to lose said louis blanc i had a hint of this began m dantes stay stay messieurs cried marrast as the whole company was rushing to the door here is another and later dispatch two o'clock marshal bougeot has gone to complete his arrangements for instant attack m thiers has arrived and with odillon barreau de vergier de haran and de remusat has formed a cabinet general le Morassiere supersedes marshal bougeot the latter is recalled and forbidden to fire on the people he protests with violence and sheathes his sword in despair to be sure he does the old cut-throat cried ledru rollin the idea of being let loose with his mastiffs on the people of paris like sheep pent up in a fold was to him a source of rapturous anticipation and his rage at the disappointment is proportional messieurs cried m dantes this last step of the government was all that we required to ensure our success thiers and barreau mistake if they think there is sufficient magic in their names to quell a revolution in fact neither of them are trusted by the people it is too late yesterday this might have been done but now the demand is not reform but a republic not down with the ministry but down with the dynasty the conspirators looked at each other and then at m dantes in amazement and doubt it was apparent they were as yet unprepared for language so plain m dantes is right cried flocon to-morrow night when we meet we shall all admit it it was now nearly three o'clock and the republicans repaired to their homes for a few hours sleep before the exciting scenes anticipated for the morrow as louis blanc and m albert passed up the rue le pelletier and came opposite the hotel of the minister of foreign affairs which but a few hours before had been the scene of so much confusion and bloodshed they paused and looked around the pavement was still dark and wet with the gore of the slaughtered citizens but the whole street was deserted and silent here and there a solitary light might be detected in the attic windows of the immense hotel but no other sign of life or human occupation was to be perceived true there was an ominous sound of rising barricades in the boulevard beyond the crash of trees the click of steel on stone the lumbering of wheels and at intervals a distant shout but this excepted all was as quiet in paris as if the old city had never known of insurrection this spot will be noted in the future history of france said louis blanc do you know the exact facts of the case monsieur albert there are so many rumours that we can with difficulty get near the truth i was not present when the fourteenth delivered their fire was the reply but i learned from m de courte who hastened to the spot that the colonel of the regiment now in prison asserts that at the moment of the arrival of the crowd a ball from a musket which accidentally went off broke the leg of his horse and he thinking this the signal for an attack at once gave orders to fire another story is that one of our young blouses blew out an officer's brains with a pistol many of the troops must have fired in the air said louis blanc looking around him for there were two hundred of them in line i understand and their discharge was delivered across the whole breadth of the boulevard swarming with people it was unfortunate for m guizot rejoined m albert with a sardonic smile that his hotel should have witnessed such a scene but fortunate for the cause nevertheless replied louis blanc this last movement is called the movement of the journalists i understand if suspicions are always as correct said m albert there will be fewer false ones i fancy louis blanc made no reply and the friends walked on up the boulevard reconnoitring every spot at the rue du faubourg montmartre they were stopped by a barricade which was rapidly rising under the united and vigorous exertions of several hundred men steadily sternly and silently all that night they toiled and when the barricade was completed the tree-colour flag was planted on its summit and a citizen soldier stood beside its staff to defend it on the other side of the boulevard in the rue montmartre arose another barricade entirely finished these men are resolved said louis blanc 
desperate rather replied albert they have counted the cost and prepared to go on with the attempt they have begun at all hazards it is better to fight than starve they think but do you observe how few of them are armed asked louis blanc we have provided for that deficiency you will see arms enough for all to-morrow replied albert barricades first arms afterwards and indeed while he was yet speaking a tumbrel loaded with arms of every description drove silently up and each man supplied himself with a weapon that suited his fancy in some instances the taste exhibited was ludicrous in the extreme there were swords without scabbards and bayonets without guns a towering helmet on the head of one man and broad white leather cross-belts on the shoulders of another daggers and knives sabres and pikes mingled in grotesque confusion but each individual was armed with something and to crown all a small piece of ordnance borne on the shoulders of four stout men who staggered beneath its weight was now brought up and placed in battery from such men what may we not hope exclaimed louis blanc but it is near morning let us proceed i stop here quietly said albert what pass the night here exclaimed his companion the night is nearly past now replied albert with a smile i will sleep a few hours with my men of the barricades and be ready to help them defend their work in the morning you are devoted to the cause albert said louis blanc warmly grasping his hand oh no more than yourself was the reply we are all devoted to it but each in his own way you are an author i am a workman it is a light thing for me to pass a night with only only the sky for a canopy it is a light thing for you to pass the night in your study a change of positions would possibly kill us both the friends grasped each other warmly by the hand and parted the author going to his study and the workman to his barricade end of section twenty two Section twenty three of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter twenty one. The third day. The next morning, the following placard attracted general attention citizens of paris orders have been given to cease firing everywhere we have just been charged by the king to form a new ministry the chamber will be dissolved and an appeal made to the country general la mauriciere has been appointed commandant of the national guard liberty order union reform odillon barreau thiers such was the placard which appeared at every corner in paris on the morning of thursday february twenty fourth at three o'clock it had been hastily struck at the offices of la presse and le constitutionnel and given into the hands of the bill posters at daylight it was read by the early passers and as soon as read indignantly torn down with the significant murmur it is too late at eight o'clock a proclamation to the national guard signed by la mauriciere and countersigned by odillon barreau was similarly received at nine o'clock the forty fifth regiment of the line fraternized with the national guard the thirtieth resigned its arms to the people and the five companies of compierre yielded their quarters with all their arms and ammunition at the first summons at ten o'clock a proclamation was posted up at the bourse signed by odillon barreau and thiers ordering the troops not only to cease firing but to retire to their quarters immediately the trumpets sounded a retreat and the most important positions hitherto held by the line were yielded to the people the men of the barricades could now concentrate and advance magic there was none in the names of barreau and thiers to restrain them both were viewed as deserters from their cause the latter was openly insulted by the populace wherever he appeared and the former though at first respectfully listened to was at length assailed with murmurs of disapprobation on his way to the tuileries 
in his editorial sanctum sat our friend beauchamp of whom for some time we have lost sight but who has meanwhile been most industriously at work in his paper le charivari in concert with le national and other larger sheets in forwarding the cause of reform and finally of revolution the door opened and chateau renaud appeared farewell beauchamp he exclaimed i have not a moment to lose a post-chaise is at the door farewell off cried the journalist in astonishment and whither and why yes off for england italy america anywhere but france exclaimed the young noble and why why cried the indignant deputy look around you and then ask what there is left in france for me beauchamp continued the young man hurriedly and in low tones france will have no king at this hour to-morrow mark the prophecy the national guard fraternizes with the populace the line fraternizes with the guard the government is of course paralyzed all is over six hours hence the tuileries will be ransacked by a drunken mob farewell one moment why do you leave in this way why do you not go to bologna by the cars and do you not know you a journalist that for three leagues around in every direction every railway radiating from paris has been torn up do you not know that every public conveyance even to the mail diligences has been stopped and that all the telegraph stations have been dismantled all to prevent the further concentration of troops in paris by the government i did hear of this indeed said beauchamp at dawn i was at the railway depot having late last night with extreme difficulty procured a passport and whom think you among crowds of others i encountered there you would never guess and i haven't time for you to try lucien de bray and with him but that's impossible for you to divine she who was madame danglars wife of the rich banker years ago well the banker is dead and she is immensely rich and i suppose lucien's spouse into the bargain and where go they oh to england of course that grand reservoir of all emigrant royalists that asylum for all who love kings but farewell farewell if i am not off soon i may have to go without my head and if you are not massacred by your detestable party i hope to hear of you yet as a cabinet minister despite your abominable principles you have my best wishes farewell and with a hearty shake of beauchamp's hand the young noble was off for an atmosphere more congenial to monarchists than was that of paris nor was he alone thousands fled from paris in like manner that same day and the only cry that followed them was this let them go let them go the streets of paris were now choked with barricades not the mere temporary breastworks of the first and second days which a single charge of heavy dragoons would sweep away but regular systematic scientific structures erected apparently under the direction of military engineers and calculated upon every principle of art to ensure resistance some of them were of immense size that for example at the corner of the rue richelieu some had portholes from which protruded the mouths of ordnance in battery all were surmounted by a flag tricolor or red and all were defended by desperate men some other thoroughfares were crossed by many barricades the rue de saint martin for instance by thirty or forty the troops assailing these structures were mowed down throughout the day in a manner which even their opponents deemed most merciless instances of individual bravery on both sides were frequent in the rue mauconcier a young man exposed himself on the top of the barricade time after time firing with fatal aim and every time a shower of balls from the troops assailing whistled around him but he stood untouched and at length the officer ordering the troops to fire at him no more he retired at once behind the breastwork a boy in the rue de saint honore mounted the barricade enveloped in a tricolor flag and dared the troops to fire on their colors he descended unharmed an officer of the line was summoned to yield his sword he did so but first broke it in twain across his knee 
the same demand was made to a lieutenant of the municipal guard with a musket at his breast he was bidden also to shout vive la république but he only cried vive le roi as the weapon was wrenched from his grasp yet he was spared arms were demanded from every householder and when given the gift was endorsed on the door in these words here we were given arms one man received a sword splendidly decorated with gems upon its scabbard and hilt i want only the blade he said tearing it away from its ornaments and grasping the naked steel at ten o'clock m odillon barreau general la Mauricière, and horace vernet the great marine artist proceeded on horseback to the barricades to induce the people to disperse but all their eloquent entreaties were received only with insults no truce no tricks no mistake this time were the decisive shouts with which they were greeted a second time in the rue richelieu general la Mauricière, accompanied by moline saint gru bearing a palm branch was equally unsuccessful it is too late was the terrible response from the heart of the barricades followed by a shower of stones one of which wounded general le Mauricier on the hand a third time in the rue rohan general gourgaud who even promised the abdication of the king met with the same utter defeat and hastily fled from the fury of the monster now thoroughly roused at twelve o'clock the rumour sped with lightning rapidity through the streets of paris that the troops who had ostensibly been ordered to their quarters were in fact concentrated around the palace instantly rose the shout to the tuileries to the tuileries and a hundred thousand men from all sections of the city marched toward the palais bourbon and the tuileries the rumour of the concentration at the palace was true the place de carrousel was crowded with troops of every arm including several squadrons of cuirassiers and six pieces of ordnance were in position with their ammunition caissons and their provisions and baggage wagons as if for a siege the king attended by his staff and accompanied by the dukes of namur and montpensier now descended into the court to pass the troops in review the line shouted vive le roi as the king rode along the national guards with tones and looks of menace and defiance cried reform the king replied yes my friends you shall have reform and sad and dispirited turned away to his apartments as he retired the bitter murmur was heard from his aged lips like charles dix a deputation of the people had been admitted within the limits of the place du carrousel to announce the terms they would accept but after a brief parley had retired dissatisfied the men of the barricades now invested the tuileries and the palais royal on every side such was the scene without within all was confusion and dismay the salon were thronged by deputies peers generals and marshals Bougot, la Mauricière, du pain thiers de l'asterie and many others were there together with all of the royal family then in the capital whether male or female meanwhile the rattle of musketry broken by the occasional roar of ordnance in the direction of the palais royal indicated the severe struggle then going on between the people and the troops from time to time the furious shout of to the guillotine with louis philippe reached the ear does your majesty hear that asked the duke of nemours coldly of his dismayed father alas the old man was no longer the hero of july third i do my son was the trembling reply do you advise abdication is there any other course left asked the duke of montpensier any other course cried the queen indignantly oh are you my son are you a son of orleans and can you talk thus of degradation are you a soldier and do you fear mount mount charge on the rebels cut them to the earth drench the pavement with their blood perish but yield not ignominiously thus madame said m thiers solemnly it is too late there must be an abdication in favour of the count of paris and the appointment of the duchess of orleans as regent or all is lost 
then if this must be let it be done with dignity becoming a monarch said the noble queen let us all retire to st cloud there may be dictated terms of honourable capitulation there at that instant in rushed a man breathless bearing a sheet of paper in his hand and exclaiming sire sire your troops are delivering their arms to the people in a moment they will stand where you now stand sign this paper or your life and the lives of all your family will be sacrificed that man was emile de girardin the editor of la presse and the murderer of armand carrel and that paper was an act of abdication ah this is a bitter cup said the old king as he placed his signature to the sheet and doubly bitter presented by such a hand like charles dix at one o'clock at the bourse and at the corners of all the principal streets was posted this proclamation citizens of paris the king has abdicated in favour of the count of paris with the duchess of orleans as regent a general amnesty dissolution of the chamber appeal to the country but the people were now in the midst of the assault on the palais royal and to check them was impossible the palais royal consisted of two portions the chateau d'eau or palace and the other part which though the property of the orleans family was yet rented by private persons and was occupied for cafes shops dwellings and places of entertainment adorned by colonnades and arcades and by trees statues and fountains in the magnificent quadrangle the property of the citizens was respected that of the king only was assailed for two hours did the fourteenth regiment pour forth its fire from the numerous windows of that edifice and from the court below at length a band of bold republicans headed by the chivalric etienne arago musket in hand charged from the side of the cafe de la regence followed by a detachment of the national guard and driving the troops into the building surrounded it with straw which they set on fire the vast edifice was instantly filled with smoke and flame the defence ceased the soldiers rushed out and were instantly slain the commander of the detachment was pierced by a bayonet the multitude rushed in and the building was sacked the richest and most costly furniture and decorations were at once torn down dashed to pieces and thrown from the windows by the infuriated populace within the palace of the tuileries is a subterranean passage constructed for the infant king of rome and his nurses which plunging beneath the pavements and passing along the whole length of the gardens under the terrace beside the river bank suddenly emerges at the gate of the place du carrousel in front of the obelisk into this passage in wild panic descended the king and queen of france with all their children and grandchildren immediately upon the signing of the abdication and just as the doors were about to be forced emerging from the passage the king leaning on the arm of his faithful wife marie amelie and followed by the royal party crossed the place de la concorde as far as the asphalt pavement the royal party now consisted of the king and queen the duchess of nemours and her children the princess clementine and her husband the duke of augustus of saxe coburg and the duke of montpensier with his young and lovely spanish bride now enceinte and far advanced ignorant of the language only sixteen years of age a stranger to the customs and people of the country and in her delicate situation the position of this young creature was peculiarly trying at one moment she clung with terror to her young husband's arm which she refused for an instant to resign and the next laughed at her own terror saying that one who in her infancy had twice in madrid been saved by being carried off in a sack ought not now to fear when she had feet to carry herself away and was suffered to use them it is said that the fair signora was forgotten in the hurry of the flight and almost left behind as soon as the royal party were perceived they were surrounded by a troop of national guards as an escort and a large number of officers of the line in various uniforms the king leaned on the queen as if for support while she boldly advanced with a firm step and stern look both were in deepest mourning for the recent death of the beloved sister of the king the princess adelaide 
upon this melancholy procession the people gazed with mingled curiosity amusement gratification and regret they are going to the chamber of deputies to complete the abdication cries one vive la réforme shouts another vive la france shouts a second vive la Ra! in suppressed tones falters a third see the poor young duchess cried a woman who was availing herself of her peculiar rotundity as a battering ram to force her way through the crowds she had better have remained at home sneered a dynastic bitterly the poor little children exclaimed a young woman more remarkable for prettiness than neatness and more remarkable still for the scantiness of her attire nearly all of which had been torn from her rounded shoulders in the throng the spirit which pervaded the mass was evidently by no means unfriendly to the royal family and it was as evidently misunderstood by them for suddenly as if by fatality on the very spot where louis the sixteenth was beheaded just beyond the pont tournant on the pavement of the obelisk of luxor the whole party with no apparent necessity came to a dead and complete halt instantly the multitude was crowded upon them and this augmented their terror the king dropped the queen's arm and hastily raising his hat cried vive la réforme all was in a moment uproar and confusion the queen in terror at finding her husband's arm was gone turned hurriedly on every side fear not madame said a mild voice beside her the people will do you no harm this was m maurice editor of la courrier des spectacles leave me leave me monsieur she exclaimed in great excitement evidently mistaking the words then regaining her husband she again grasped his arm and the mass at the same time opening its ranks the two hastened on to a couple of those little black one-horse vehicles chancing there to stand which run to st cloud in one of these already sat the duchesses of montpensier and nemours with two of the children in the other stood the two remaining children into the latter hurriedly stepped the royal pair the door was instantly closed and the vehicle drove off at a furious rate surrounded by an escort of dragoons cuirassiers and national guards two hundred in number taking the water side towards st cloud the other carriage similarly escorted followed at a like rapid pace the children standing at the windows their faces pressed to the glass gazing eagerly with the innocent curiosity of infancy on a scene from which their future fate would take shape he is gone shouted a stentorian voice breaking the momentary stillness as the carriages surrounded by their escort swept from the view let him go let him go was the stern and significant response we are not regicides to the tuileries to the tuileries was now the tremendous shout which rose from the multitude as they rushed toward the deserted palace but the tuileries had already fallen it was no longer the dwelling-place of kings even before the royal abdication was declared even before it was signed the troops of the line in the courtyard of the palace infantry artillery dragoons to the number at least of twenty-five thousand were summoned to surrender their posts while the fraternal shout vive la ligne elicited from the lips of many of the soldiers the answering cry of vive la réforme in vain was it that marshal bougeot the veteran of a hundred battles menaced and blasphemed in vain did his old protege and subaltern but now bitter foe general la Mauricière, dashing from one end of the line to the other on his white horse entreat and persuade with his eloquent tongue the people insisted the national guard fraternized the line wavered and yet most imminent at that moment was their own peril the first second third fourth sixth and tenth legions of the national guard invested the tuileries and others were on the march accompanied by countless masses of the people within the courtyard were twenty five thousand of the best troops in the world of every arm and a park of ordnance charged to the muzzle frowned upon the dense masses which swarmed the place du carrousel 
the watchful artilleryman stood at his cannon's breech with the lighted linstock in his hand which he kept alive by constant motion he awaited but a word from the pale firm lips of general la Mauricière, and that vast and magnificent space now swarming with life would have been swept as if by destruction's besom death in all its most horrid forms would have been there that pavement would have run with gore the facades of those splendid edifices would have been polluted with shreds and fragments of human flesh and spattered with human blood yet dreadful would have been the sure retribution indiscriminate massacre of all unfortunate souls within that royal palace would have been inevitable and instantaneous yet such a catastrophe might be precipitated by a single word the avalanche might be started by a single breath and blood once shed paris would be deluged in the name of the people i demand to speak with the commandant of the tuileries shouted a young man in the uniform of an officer of the national guard advancing to the iron railing of the court near the rue de rivoli it was lieutenant aubert roche the commandant was sent for and immediately arrived monsieur you are lost cried the young man you are surrounded by sixty thousand men of the national guard and one hundred thousand of the people of paris what is demanded was the trembling response that you evacuate the tuileries resign it to the national guard the troops shall be withdrawn monsieur orders for their retirement to the palace shall be issued instantly that will not do the palace must be evacuated insisted the lieutenant or the people will raise it to the ground come with me monsieur said the commandant the gate was immediately opened and lieutenant roche accompanied by monsieur le sieur chef de bataillon bearing a flag of truce followed the commandant to the pavillon de l'horloge where stood the duke of nemours pale with excitement surrounded by generals monseigneur said the commandant suffer me to present a deputation from the people monsieur what do the people demand asked the duke in trembling tones the evacuation this instant of this palace and its delivery to the national guard and if we do not comply asked marshal bougeot calmly then monsieur you are all lost was the bold answer this palace is surrounded by one hundred and sixty thousand men the combat once begun must be exterminating must be a massacre the fifth legion of the national guard to which i belong is at this moment sacking the palais royal it may be here before we part the troops shall retire monsieur said the duke and on the instant orders for the retreat were issued the artillery went by the railing of the palace and the staff and the duke of nemours by the pavillon de l'horloge their well-trained horses descending the flight of steps the cavalry followed succeeded by the infantry the national guards were then introduced by lieutenant roche and entered the court of the tuileries by the gate of the rue de rivoli their muskets shouldered with the stock in the air at the same moment the abdication of the king was declared general le Mauricier had resigned the ministry was dissolved there was a tremendous shout and the conquerors of the palais royal rushed in to take possession of the tuileries End of section twenty three